Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. My name is Camel, and more importantly, welcome back to the Curating Curious Curiosities series. In this video today, I will be curating to you the curious curiosities that can be found within a plane of oblivion known as Apocrypha, added with the Dragonborn DLC. Now before we get cracking, timestamps for each of the curiosities in this video can be found down in the description and in the comments. Down there are also links to my other Curating Curious Curiosities videos, my social media links, and my brand new merch store which is launching with this video's release. I have personally created designs for four weeks and have enlisted the skills of talented artists to bring you a wide range of cool and most importantly, at least to me, creative items that any Elder Scrolls fan will love. So please feel free to check that out. There is currently a selection of over 100 items, so there are plenty of genuinely curious and interesting pieces to choose from. It ain't no random level loot, but you'll see all that for yourself when you follow the link down in the description. Speaking of random level loot, Apocrypha. It is a strange, unfamiliar, and fantastically nightmarish place, and extraordinarily unique in its own arcanely alien way. But to understand Apocrypha, we must understand its ruler, the Daedric Prince of Knowledge and Memory, the scryer of the tides of fate, both future, past, and present, as read in the stars and heavens most commonly known on Nern as Hermaeus Mora, although throughout the ages he has been given many other titles by the various cultures and peoples of Mundus. Designations such as Hoermius, Hormaeus, Hermora, Herma Mora, the Woodland Man, the Gardener of Men, the Demon of Knowledge, the Master of the Tides of Fate, the Lord of Secrets, the Keeper of Forbidden Knowledge, the Golden Eye, Erdaedra, the Prince of Fate, the Abyssal Cephaliarch, the Old Antecedent, the Scryer, the Inevitable Knower, the Guardian of the Unseen, and the Knower of the Unknown, among other ancient epithets which we shall not dare murmur, as they are too abstractly esoteric for mortal minds to muster and mortal mouths to mimic. Now, Hermaeus Mora is commonly considered the wisest of the Daedric Princes. Not being known as good or evil, he is neither protagonistic nor antagonistic, simply keeping and providing both constructive and destructive knowledge. He describes himself as the riddle unsolvable, the door unopenable, the book unreadable, the question unanswerable. A description that feels unfulfilling at face value, yet seems apt for an entity who is holder, herald and harbinger of unknown and unknowable knowledge. When encountered, Hermaeus Mora most commonly takes the physical form if you could even call it that, of an abyssally wretched and writhing eldritch horror, forged of midnight slime smog, dotted with innumerable and eerily ephemeral eyes that blink and stare as they fade in and out of reality, timelessly and effervescently floating on a bed of dancing tentacles and a shifting pool of ebon shade that stinks of a nameless abaddon. The demon of knowledge, Hermaeus Mora, is a truly unfamiliar, unsettling, and an ununderstandable entity, to be sure. So now with a general appreciation of Apocrypha's ruler, the Lord of Secrets, Hermaeus Mora, we can now begin to understand the rotten recherche that is this plane of oblivion. Now, in real life, the word Apocrypha is a plural for Apocryphon, which are ancient and secret writings. So, Apocrypha sure is a fitting name for a realm of occult knowledge. It can be accessed by reading some of Hermaeus Mora's artifacts, known as Black Books, which are found scattered throughout the island of Solstheim. There are seven Black Books in total within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, granting us access to seven unique areas of Apocrypha, which we shall explore in great 
and curious detail. But firstly, an overview of Apocrypha is required for one to truly understand and appreciate this otherworldly plane of oblivion. Apocrypha serves as an infinite and ever-growing library, housing and hoarding all forbidden knowledge. Mighty stacks of books and scrolls alike form labyrinths of spiraling and swaying pillars reaching into the vividly vivacious vert sky above. Carved ruins of an indecisively intricate nature nestle amongst the endlessly expanding archaic archive. It is said that the realm is haunted by the ghosts of mortals, forever hunting for knowledge, although no such ghosts are ever encountered. Most mortals that do enter Apocrypha are driven to insanity by means of unending and occult revelations, such as Morian Zenas, the founding member and professor of transliminal studies at the Arcane University who vanished within Apocrypha during his voyage as he traversed and documented the many planes of oblivion. No doubt falling prey like so many others to the pursuit of knowing all. Which is unsurprising, as even the soundscape alone is enough to drive the most fortified of mental fortitudes to the brink of schizophrenic psychosis. As the air here is ripe with abandoned sounds, whispering and muttering eternally to an earless expanse, lost papers and pages blow and dance on the zealous zephyrs that fumble through the realm. Peculiar metallic rattles quiver as outlandishly chimed notes warp in pitch and ring too long for any mortal comforts, all the while the pitter patter of dust and detritus pop in and out of earshot. But most unsettlingly of all, the very foundations of our anima is frequently shaken by an unnaturally subsonic and colossal frequency. The tectonic howlings and moans of an ancient god, Hermaeus Mora, older than time itself, antediluvian beyond calculable reasoning, roaring with ubiquitous cacophonic vocal calls to match such an entity, the keeper of secrets, Hermaeus Mora. The air here sits heavy and is plagued thickly with a sickly green grey haze that could be fog or even perhaps mould and must produced from the endless and eons old anthenium of knowledge, the labyrinthine library we find ourselves in. Now, geographically, Apocrypha is simple yet strange, as there are two variations in setting. Firstly, and most commonly, is this infinite sea, seeming to undulate with lazy turgidity, like a pit of endlessly lengthy serpents moving through each other, swollen and plump from feasting on forbidden knowledge, formed of an ungodly and sticky yet slick liquid. Shining like natural oil, yet moving like magma and mucidity have met in the middle. This sea bears a coloration which one instinctively dislikes. Both a diseased black and a putrescent chartreuse, seeming to mimic an accursed inkwell from the boundless scribblings of the secret studies. Which, while captivating to some extent, is also far from inviting in any sense of the word. And our instincts prevail in this case, as if we are unfortunate enough to fall into this heinous liquid, we will be killed within seconds, swallowed whole by the corrosive and poisonous grips of the Black Sea. From this mucific ooze ocean, bulging tentacles wave and slither in abnormal profusion, for what purpose is unknown. Although occasionally, if an unwelcome explorer, like ourselves, gets too close to the water's edge, a tentacle will burst from the cohesive surface, delivering punishing whips, smacks and slaps onto the player, causing devastating damage. So these tentacles are to be feared and avoided at all costs. Unless you're into that, of course. Also, occasionally appearing to observe the realm with literal utter omniscience are huge sluggishly blinking eyes that emerge from the darkened diabolical depths, kraken-like in appearance, exactly matching the central inquisitorial eye of the abyssal Cephaliac himself, Old Ermamora. 
Because of this, both the tentacles and eyes are thought to be infinite extensions of the scryer, Hermaeus Mora himself, forever observing, learning, absorbing, prying, groping and watching. He's always watching. Now if we turn our gaze upward, we'll see the sky in this oceanic, onirodinic, infinity ripples with a venomous green energy, blinding whites in some areas of higher concentration. This is thought to be pure knowledge coursing through the very fabric of this reality, spreading its learned teachings throughout this plane of oblivion. Both antidotes and toxins of the metaphysical, existential, and philosophical alike. Some segments of the wretched welkin above are voided with night smog portals, from which huge inquisitive tentacles writhe forth in search of any and all knowledge that they can grasp. These pose no immediate threat other than the constant reminder that we are but helpless ants within an alien reality lorded by the Gardener of Men, Hermaeus Mora. Now, the second geographical setting which we are able to experience in Apocrypha is slightly less welcoming, and much more abysm and conceptually hollow, in fact literally hollow. It can only be described as an infinite abyss and endless void, tarnished pewter in shade, the location of which is unknown. All we do know is that it is somewhere within the plane of Oblivion Apocrypha. Structures do exist here and will be explored in due course, but the space within which they exist is simply an ashy darkness, with no observable edges in any direction. Tentacles sway in the distance and the only light to pierce the lambentless space are produced by artificial sources, which do actually serve as a lifeline in such an area, as traversing this dusky depth can be deadly, because the darkness will quite actually kill you. Standing in an area non-illuminated will rapidly and grievously damage the player. This seems to be some shaded sanguine simulacrum of a metaphor of knowledge equaling purpose. As without light you cannot read, and without reading you cannot learn, and without learning there is no knowledge. And with no knowledge there is no purpose because we are within a realm that is pure knowledge. So, no light, no knowledge, no purpose, no life, no meaning. Just removal through death delivered by a deleting darkness. And now that we know the forbidding domain we'll be experiencing, what can we expect to find harboured within it? Well, normally I'd explain away the wide array of colourful fauna and flora that call the region we are exploring home. However, Apocrypha is rather non-Euclidean in this sense, as flora, fauna, and other notable things, entities, animated objects, inanimate objects, and other curious cases. Well, we'll cover it all right now, as determining which is which and what is what is much simpler on Nern, as things here in Apocrypha don't seem to so easily fall into traditional definitive categories. Now of course, with Apocrypha being his realm, Hermaeus Mora can be encountered several times and has sovereignty over his kingdom. Pushing his prying tentacles into every crevice and his watchful eyes, peering into every movement in every moment. Imprisoned in servitude here is also Mirak, the first dragonborn, an ancient dragon priest whom Hermaeus Mora taught the forbidden knowledge of bending the wills of dragons in the form of a shout. During the Dragon War of the Mythic Era, Mirak led a personal rebellion against his dragon masters, which led to his temple being razed by the Dover overlords, and to Mirak's defeat by another dragon priest named Valok, who bound Mirak to Solstheim. But before Valok was able to kill the first dragonborn of Mirak, it is said that Hermaeus Mora transported Mirak to Apocrypha, where he has remained for thousands of years, gaining power and knowledge as the champion of old Hermamora. Now, aiding Mirak in this realm is also a serpentine dragon named Sarota, which translates to Mighty Slave from Dovazul, the Dragon Tongue. Now, along with these mighty additions to the bestiary of Apocrypha, 
we also have the more simply defined fauna, or in this case, Daedra. There are two main species of Daedra, with uh, subcategories of course, that serve Daddy Er Daedra Hermaeus Mora in his realm. Seekers, High Seekers and Seeker Aspirants are the most common to be found. Horrifying beings with squiddish faces, tattered robes, older than one cares to consider, levitating about the place on languidly swaying tentacles. They primarily serve as protectors of the forbidden tomes, using a dangerous array of telekinetic psychic magics to protect their eldritch additions. Also utilizing invisibility to mask their location. Although this cloaking is often betrayed by a ghastly haze being emitted from their wretched bodies. And the rarer and more dangerous danger here are lurkers along with their variants, lurker guardians, lurker sentinels and lurker vindicators. Towering beasts serving as brutish deterrents and guardians of the hallowed halls of Apocrypha, standing many heads higher than any average Nord. An eyesore to gaze upon with their deep sea ichthyic faces and shiny squamous hides, shielded by their murky toned and jagged chitin armor. They employ an arsenal of taboo assault tactics, stomping with their indecorous feet, slashing with their witchish nails and spewing squirming beams of writhing tentacles to smear and smother the poor dragonborn. Along with the seekers and lurkers are of course the previously discussed tentacles and ancient eyes throughout this plane, believed to be infinite extensions of the old master Hermaeus Mora. There are also hovering spider-like objects with brilliant golden orbs at their centers. These are light bearers and provide a splendid and welcomingly warm effulgence, illuminating areas beneath them, lending their light to any who may require it, which comes in oh so handy in those dark depths that we will be exploring. Whether these are animals, plants, fungus, daedra or animated objects is unknown. They are organic in appearance and float around seemingly independent of a puppeteer, but they do not register as neither alive nor dead. All I can confirm is that these light bearers are present and are a friendly sight to behold in this dim kingdom of darkest secrets. Now moving in a similar fashion to these light bearers are clusters of dirty diaries and mustering novels, flying and placidly flapping through the heavy dank air. Interestingly, the books in these groups that are open are not a rotten black like the other open books that we find within Apocrypha. Instead, they are blazon and busy with unknown texts, much like what we find within the pages of the black books themselves. These strange terms are constantly shuffling and reorganizing over and over again, seemingly all on their own. They are neither alive nor dead and it is not known who controls them, if anyone that is appearing to us as sentient drone tomes going about their ceaseless categorization and sorting, like a flock of birds fluttering between their fleeting roosts. Now dotting pathways and shadowed corners we will frequently stumble upon what is most easily described as a lamp post or lamp posts. Their poles seem stalk-like and pulsate with a golden luminescence. The tops bear a hooded, leaf-shaped tip, much like those found at the end of a cephalopod's feeding tentacle, at the center of which is a glowing orb, black-based and primarily covered in ethereal blue circles, which throw a large amount of light. I am unsure if these lampposts are organic or inorganic, as the bases are certainly sculpted stone, yet the stems and bulbs appear to be naturistic. Nevertheless, and with attempts at biological definitions aside, these flower lights or street lamps or whatever pleases you to call them, are one of the few objects to provide comfort within Apocrypha, and are always a welcome sight to the plain walking explorer like ourselves. Now offering a similar confusion of organic or inorganic are these obscure tentacle totems that we will run across on rare occasion. 
I am unsure if they are like the rest of the tentacles in part of Hermaeus Mora, or if they are structural, as after all, they do appear to be static. Or perhaps they're some kind of special plant. Who knows? They are always accompanied by a sickly green haze, as if they are emitting some form of energy. Regardless, while I cannot say what they are, along with the lampposts, these tentacle totems appear to be the closest thing to vegetation that I can point out with an apocrypha. But moving on to something much more definable are these loose papers that litter the ground, torn and lost from origin, now lying on the floor, flapping in the wind. These same pages fade in and out of reality, swirling in whirlwinds, like brilliant and tranquil tempests of text. Interestingly, these singular pages are covered in writing, and given we're in a Daedric Prince's realm, you would expect the writing to be Daedric, using the Daedric alphabet of course. However, this text on these pages is not written in Daedric. And while it does appear very similar to the Elder Script, the alphabet of the Elder Scrolls, well, despite it looking just like that, these writings are also not written in Elder Script. They are actually written in a much rarer language. It does not have an official in-law name, but has been donned the name The Divine Script by fans. It only appears in three places within the Elder Scrolls. Firstly, on these pages that we are talking about now. Secondly, within the Black Books themselves. And thirdly, get this, on the Eye of Magnus. Hmm, a titillating lore connection to be sure, but a discussion for another day. For here and now though, this is very curious and adds to the ever-polished conceptual firmament of Hermaeus Mora and his secrets. Now along the way on our travels, we will also oft find before us fonts of both magicka and stamina. Activating one will replenish the appropriate resource. These are most commonly found as a strange angler fishish statue, seeming to mimic the face of a lurker sculpted of a foreign and rather dirty golden metal, or perhaps stone. Within the mouths of these graven images, a glowing orb is held, which provides us with lights, a valuable commodity within Apocrypha, but are also telltale of the resource within. Naturally, a font of stamina will have a green orb, and a font of magicka will have a blue orb. And reminding us further of the Plains Overlord, the Abyssal Cephalia, Kermaeus Mora. Banners flap in the humid breeze, embroidered with an enchanting sigil of old Terma Mora, pulsing brilliantly with a cursed cerulean gleam. Sharing the depiction emblazoned on the worn covers of the artifactitious and previously mentioned black books. Now, with organics, possible organics, and curious objects aside, let's touch on the fantastical structural offerings and foundations that we will be exploring and witnessing throughout Apocrypha. Most familiarly is an ancient and weathered dark grey stone, often brushed with a blue-green hue, chromatically kin to the verdigris that forms as a patina on copper, brass and bronze. This stone is used primarily as flooring and to form the magnificent and more domestic skeletal architectural landscape designed with a handsome dollop of simplified yet abstract gothic motifs. A heavy church-like atmosphere is cast onto the observer, with archways and spies being constant, reminding us of cathedrals and other ostentatious structures that represent something beyond the everyday and grander than ourselves. Lattice platforms and walkways form barriers, walls and bridges, appearing to be made of a greasy metal, although also flexible at times, as we will see later on. But the most confronting and awe-filling ingredient in Apocrypha's structural recipe is of course the library itself. Infinite towers and walls, whole buildings in fact, are formed from the very texts that the realm is here to protect. Books are bundled and bunched into bulging bulwarks, codices congregated and crammed to construct cryptically catalogued chaotic castles, essays erratically arranged to erect eerie edifices, manuscripts are merged making malevolent megalithic and mustering minarets, 
plundered papers are packed into piles to patch and pave puzzling palisades. Terms are tactically twisted in tumbled twilight and twined into tortured towers. Sacred and sinful scrolls stuffed and spellcrafted into swaying sable cyclopean spires. The forbidden knowledge of Hermaeus Morris keepsake is quite literally the very foundation of the realm itself. Apocrypha seems to be crafted from a vision birthed of Dr. Zeus and HP Lovecraft sharing a hallucinogenic nightmare, fueled and fed on eldritch kabolics, spawned only from the deepest dimethyl tryptominic depths, a realm dangerously dollsome to us curious mortals, oftentimes magically monotonous and unlike any region we have explored before. But Apocrypha does have one similarity to the Forgotten Veil, Blackreach, and the Soul Can, as Apocrypha has no map, no map markers, no merchants, and no place to rest, which makes exploring it difficult and intimidating. This paired with the wondrous dangers and lack of respite leads most players to not fully seek and witness its secrets and occult occurrences. This is a most grandiloquent quest, filled with flocks in Norse in the hillopilificatious fragments and fictions, sesquipedalian sentences, pretentious polysyllabalic paragraphs, circumloquacious sayings, and in truth will be a challenging journey for any who suffer from hippopotomonstrosis quipedaliophobia, and if that's you, well good luck. But curious adventurer, if you do dare wish to learn, experience, and absorb the forbidden knowledge held within this abstract and arcane Abaddon, then come, stay close, and allow me to curate to you the curious curiosities of Hermaeus Mora's Plane of Oblivion, Apocrypha. Our journey begins within the sunken Dwemer city of Nochardok, where we will find the Black Book Epistolary Acumen. Upon touching the book, we will be transported to a section of Apocrypha with the same name, epistolary acumen. But before we take our first steps, however, if we look at the Black Book epistolary acumen within our inventory, we'll learn that this was written by someone simply referred to as the Transparent One. Hmm, it was written by a window. Sadly, this contains only one readable page of text, but this is the case with all Black Books. Now the passage accessible reads, Bring you forth the love-struck mute who prays with vigor on his love, and set the sky alight with all who dare to struggle against our move. For we are they who own the night, and all who dwell without us fall. We drink the mind grapes formed of thought, and wail a tumult on the wall, to sweep at which point we can read no further. Now this book is actually mentioned in another, called The Library of Dusk, Rare Books and is said to contain forbidden invocations of very destructive Daedra, who are suspected enemies of Moloch Baal. And as interesting as that is, what forbidden knowledge does this Black Book's apocryphal realm have to teach? Well, let us find out. Once we arrive here within Epistolary Acumen, Chapter 1, the area as a whole appears to be contained within a large cathedral-like room but the ceiling has been stripped, allowing us to gaze up above at the deathly dancing heavens. Or perhaps, so something up above can gaze down upon us. Now at the center of this lanky chamber is a hallway that bends and wriggles like a cut snake of colossal proportions, crowned by an arch of books and two swaying toned towers. The stone walls are high and foreboding, at the back of the room, there are two lattice traceries with a central hollow arch above, from which spills the deathly ancient night smog of Hermaeus Mora, as do the fondling and ever-searching juniper green tentacles of old Hermamora, prying and prodding through space and time, seeking to hoard all knowledge. Now, where we will first appear, is a moderately sized circular stone island fenced with shallow stone arches with two fonts of magicka that surely we will not require just yet. We'll notice there is a strange device in front of a strip of curled up lattice pathing. This device is a scryer and they are used to activate certain traversal obstacles throughout Apocrypha, such as walkways and gates among other curious feats of Daedric engineering 
found within the realm. Activating this scryer will unravel the lattice petal, allowing us to walk over the Black Sea, but more importantly, get us close enough so that we may leap forward and into the undulating hallway as it swings from left to right, passing through such a hideous floundering passageway may induce an insipid case of motion sickness. Now once the furthest exit of the Book Serpent has stretched as far as it will to the right, we can safely hop out and onto a small spit of stone, above which is a font of magicka. Here also is another scryer. Operating this will trigger the distant lattice petal to unravel, just as before. Now we can step back into the swaying serpentine hallway of scripts and wait for it to make half of its full movements, upon which time we can step off and onto the newly flattened lattice, where we will find ourselves on an island almost mimicking that of which we started on. But this one sits at the base of an ever damning wall, surmounted upon which is the void arch we spoke of just a few paragraphs ago. Now at the center of this atoll is a podium that rests at the base of a font of stamina, pride open and presented, spinning texts of chaotic and chthonic scriptures is a book that will lead us to chapter 2 of Epistolary Acumen. Once we are transported to Chapter 2, we will find ourselves within a hypnotic tunnel forged of furled lattice petals, filled with turbulently tumbling texts, pages swirl in vortexes, sliding in and out of visible reality, flapping and fluttering before our very eyes with texts not meant for mortal sight. At the end of this dazzling display of dancing forbidden writings, will notice there are two golden ichthyic head busts with a scryer between them. Activating this scryer will bestow us with quite a sight, as the turbulent tube of lattice unfurls like a flower during the day to greet and welcome the apricity of Magnus's rays. Magnus being the sun, of course. The pages locked within spin in wild pirouettes upwards with great gusts as they are released like pollen to fertilize and fray far off minds in search of such knowledge. But do not be bedazzled for a moment too long, as this area bears immediate dangers such as the two seekers that stand in wait, anxious to annihilate intruders with their equivocal kinetic magics. Along with them, however, is a much more foreboding force, the Lurker. He stands guard and is prepared to eject us from his master's realm. But once these threats are subdued, we may inspect the area. Most bodaciously is the Illuminated Gate, the first of many that we shall run across throughout Apocrypha. Standing with its tortured lattice pattern and the great central octopic seal bearing a resemblance to a nightmarish entity that would inject its spawn into a host's body via the mouth. An ideogram typifying a creature that one spontaneously shudders at. And if that's you, don't watch the alien movies. Beyond this gate is a great area of interest that we shall return to in due course. Also populating this latticely flawed hall is an altar found in the dim southwestern corner, atop which are a scattering of ruined books and two soul gems. Firstly, we have a petty soul gem that remains unfilled, and a lesser soul gem that is filled with the anima of some poor fool. In the southeastern corner, we will spy a pedestal. At its crest is a new encounter for us, but one that will soon become very familiar and potentially fatiguing. But then again, Apocrypha is only fit for those with the most fortified of minds. This is a pod, the chest equivalent of this realm. Inside this one, we can find a copy of the book titled Amongst the Drogo, authored by Bernadette Bantian, a Breton mage and scholar of the College of Winterholds. A book that details the behavior of Drogo, drawn from several months spent observing them, their hostility, language, and worship of the venerated dragon priests. In here we will also find 16 gold, not much use but better than no coin to be sure. We also have a potion of minor healing, 
which might just find some use given there are no fonts of health to be found within Apocrypha. There is also an unfilled petty soul gem, below which is a copy of the book titled The Poison Song Volume 1, authored by Briston Zell. This is part one in a series of seven books which are a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. Along with this, there is also a copy of the book titled The Poison Song Volume 4, authored by Briston Zell. This is of course part 4 of the very same aforementioned epic saga, which you will soon learn their namesake as they poison our venture through Apocrypha by constantly appearing. But now that we have plundered the accessible bounty in the arena, we must turn our attention to unlocking that blasted gate that bars our further investigation. So in the mid of the eastern wall, no doubt due to its luminescence, we've noticed a small raised area with two lampposts and a fish-like bust shining ever so brightly, underneath which sits a scryer. One guess as to what this does. Activating it will open the gate that has stunted our progression so. While entering through, we'll naturally be drawn upward to the enticing dais of diabolical decoration. But firstly, we must search in darker places, as in the right-hand corner of this cell, there is another pod, tucked away in shadows for none to find much like my tax return receipts. Inside this pod, we will discover 18 gold, along with a potion of minor healing, and a copy of the book titled The Poison Song Volume 2, authored by our already good friend Briston Zell. This is part two in a series of seven of an epic and historically inaccurate saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. This is paired with a copy of, oh, the Poison Song Volume 6, which has the same author and content of the same nature as the previous volume, as you may have imagined. There is also a copy of the book titled The Third Era Timeline. Fully titled, it is The Third Era, an abbreviated timeline, the last year of the Third Era, and it is authored by one Jespus Ignatius, no doubt an imperial judging by the name. Now this book, as the title so novicely gave away, details and dates notable events that occurred during the Third Era. But now that we have delved into the pod like Meme Lords of 2018, Tide Pods, we may ascend to the ever alluring presentation of the next stage in our travels, as the open black book spellbinds us with its dancing language and esoteric enchantments. Touching this will lead us to Chapter 3 of Epistolary Acumen. Once we arrive here in Chapter 3 of Epistolary Acumen, we'll find ourselves standing amidst of the miasome basin of a jungle of jumbled journals. Vast and mammothian vines of verses twist like warped helixes, bearing a constitution that seems to imply that they are macro DNA of this realm. A webbing of lattice comprised of uncommon designs joins small islands and cascading cobalt and cold stone steps to form a wild space for us to explore. Eerily tall pillars rise, decorated with banners of a weathered and faded emerald fabric, photonically thumping cerulean stitched in marks of Hermaeus Mora. As we take our first steps, we must resist temptation to climb the waterfall of soapy stone stairs and instead veer to the left, where we'll glimpse a pool radiating a sickly pale blue miasma. At its nucleus is a stunted and sunken font of magicka, but more preternaturally, we'll witness a seeker hovering above the virid pond of shimmering ooze. What is rather striking and awe-filling is the fact that this seeker appears to be reading a book, absorbing forbidden knowledge from the Library of Apocrypha. With its hands outstretched and palms facing the hellscape above, telekinetically levitating the open tome primed for study. Even more curiously is the state and make of this codex, as while its pages are visible, they seem uh, tainted beyond any condition fit for mortal eyes. 
Instead of smooth paper and runes, each page is hideously harsh and harrowingly gangrenous in texture, like the bark of a tree too ancient for mathematical determination. These volumes that fill Apocrypha would appear to be so archaic and so forbidden that one can quite literally not read them. This suggests that the knowledge contained within them is transferred from Stygian lexicon to inquisitive intellect via a much more mystical means compared to the typical and simple reading of words that us mortals are used to. But this seeker is clearly studying for some great test, so let us leave it be as our journey through chapter 3 is just beginning. For now we shall begin our Mounts of the Spilling Steps. But before we do, at the base of the first flight stands a large totem, at the base of which are twin monuments of that golden and foul fish-like motif, which guard the central column, atop which is a gawking jawed font of stamina, which is curious as it's not actually accessible to the player, which is odd in concept but not an uncommon sight throughout this plane. Worth a mention once, but will pass on such menial theatrics as our epic quest continues. Now, finally, we may wind our panting way up the many steps of primal masonry, passing book pile after book pile, until we summit, where before us will be a lake of ladders, a wonderful display of misshapen tome towers, scripts and scrolls bent into angular form spires that litter the horizon and foreground both. Landscaped puddles of ooze rest as traps containing those wicked whipping tentacles of which some of us thoroughly enjoy. But if we make our way forward, we'll be faced once again with a serpentine hallway, swinging back and forth like the spaghettied throat of a colossally lumbering and comestibly curious long-necked turtle. As before, we're going to step into the swaying passage and then jump back out at the middle of its rotation, where we will be met by a lurker, standing guard and ready to crush any who infiltrate its territory. Behind it is a circular stone island. The central pillar displays a ghoulishly geometric arrangement of golden ichthyic figures, snarling slack-jawed. Beyond this is a large courtyard forged of the now familiar blue and texturally butyraceous lattice alloy. This anidorous patio is peppered with pale piles of papers, sorted and ordered in a fashion that seems to lack any terrestrial logic. Rather like the current state of my room, actually. But as I'm sure you have observed, and as I am sure has piqued your most persistent curiosity, is the peculiar and sizable lattice hull that stands as the central and most illustrious frill of the yard. Inside this retracted capsule of cold casted gosma is a pod, sitting centrally like a fertile pollinium at the heart of a bowl ready to burst. But how oh how do we get our greedy hands on that booty? Well. As soon as we drop down to the lattice courtyard, the nictinastically hibernating shuck will unfurl in the most brilliant of manners, like a floral demigod flaring out, preparing to release spawn for planetary pollination. The large lattice petals allow us to trot on up to the pod we've so eagerly been deliberating about. Inside we will find no doubt the result of random level loot, as we have a dwarven bow, hardly worth its weight in gold, along with septums, literally worth their weight in gold. We also have a copy of the book titled The Dragon War, authored by one Toril Bjorik. This is a religious text which describes the primordial war between men and dragons during the Morethic era. Oh, and look who showed up. We've got a copy of the book titled The Poison Song Volume 3, authored by old mate Briston Zell. This is of course Volume 3 of a seven part series that is an epic and historically inaccurate saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. We will also find a copy of the book titled The Song of Pelinal Volume 1, fully titled The Song of Pelinal Volume 1 on his name, 
which has no known author. This codex describes the pondered origins of Pelinor Whitestrake's name. Well, all I have to say is Reman! And finally, we also have a copy of the book titled The War of the First Council, authored by one Agrippa Fundilius, who is an imperial scholar and probably a lot of fun. This text is a brief account shedding light on the first era religious conflict based on various imperial and Dunma sources although written for a Western Tamrielic audience. Now that we have reaped the loot from the pod, we will want to walk over, around and behind this skyscraping mound of manuscripts, where quite near a font of magicka, we will see a scryer perched on the edge of the Lattice Lake courtyard. Activating it will unravel a lattice petal from beneath the mire, like the licking tongue of a gargantuan gecko. Now this new route will allow us to trace back to the platform at the top of the cascading steps we struggled up earlier. From here we want to move forward once more and leap back into the swaying hallway, but this time we're going to wait until it reaches its apex of rotation, upon which we will exit the passage and onto this lovelit fenced island, with a large pool of the fetid viridian ooze that shimmers so toxically so from which a sickly, vivid, virid, gaseous haze is excreted. Beyond this pond of poison is a short walkway, granting us access to a petite stone room, within which is quite a sight to behold indeed, as between two altars of varying items, before two banners of old Hermamora, next to twin fonts of Magicka, and in front of a plinth are two seekers, levitating all lackadaisical like, both bear before them hovering handbooks that brandish the black mark with rotten and unreadable pages. But most delightfully, this pair of Daedra appear to be holding hands. Whether this is for an attentive or arcane purpose is currently unknown, but most likely it is some physical requirement for shared absorption of esoteric understandings, a communal conduit to unlock the lessons from within the time-worn terms. Regardless of reasoning, the act and aesthetic itself is one that one naturally enjoys, as it is quite pleasing and sweet to witness within such a brutally bewildering realm. But now we'll move on from the two lovebirds, and onto the spoils of this ritualistic room. Firstly, the altar on the western wall. It is sprinkled with seemingly thoroughly ruined books. It also presents three soul gems. One is a filled lesser soul gem. We also have a filled black soul gem and an unfilled greater soul gem. Together, the three will bring quite a pretty penny at market. And on the other side of the symbolically soft seekers is of course the second cracked altar of interest. Resting in a semi-neat stack are three books, at the top of which is a copy of the one-handed skill book titled Fire and Darkness, or fully titled Fire and Darkness, The Brotherhoods of Death, authored by one Yunir Gorming. This tells the history of the Morag Tong Assassin Guild, and of course will increase your one-handed skill by one level upon opening its pages, provided you have not read it before. It is also worth 50 gold, which ain't too shabby for a bunch of musty paper. The written work in the middle of the stack is a copy of the heavy armor skill book titled Orsinium and the Orcs, or fully titled Orsinium and the Orcs, how Orsinium passed to the Orcs. Authored by one Menya Gesolst, this tells the story of how Gortwog Gro Nagorm, better known as King of the Orcs and Warlord of the Subterranean Realms, how he won the land to the north of Wayrest in Daggerfall, both in-game and in province. It will also, of course, increase your heavy armor skill by one level upon prying open its pages, provided, of course, that you have not read this before. It's also worth noting that it's worth a healthy 70 gold pieces. And on the bottom of the pile, we can find a copy of the block skill book titled The Death Blow of Abananit, or fully titled the death blow of Abananit, with explanations by the sage Geocrates Varnas, who is actually not the author as the writer of this poem is unknown. Now it is a poem about the battle of Abananit, 
one of House Dagoth's strongholds. And, of course, naturally, reading this will increase your block skill by one level, provided you have not read it before. It's also worth 50 septums. Now, it's also important to note that if your character's conjuration skill is level 40 or higher, unlike my character, then a copy of the spell tome Conjure Seeker will also be found here. Using this will teach you the appropriate spell, which will allow you to summon a seeker to fight for you for 60 seconds. It's also important to note that this spell is not affected by the Twin Salt's perk. Nonetheless, it will be a welcome addition to your magical arsenal. And now that we have bolstered several of our skills, with knowledge very graciously provided by those skill books we just read, we may turn our attention to the pod centrally presented at the back wall of the Bijou Rotunda. Within it, we can find an amethyst, which has a value of 120 gold, not bad for a little rock. We can also find a sum of 24 gold pieces. There is also a copy of the book titled Ramanda, scribed by an unknown author. This is a fragmented and mythical recount of the alleged conception of Riemann and the return of the Kim El Abadal with the people of Tamriel. In this pod, we also have an unfilled lesser soul gem, as well as a filled lesser soul gem. And what pod would be complete without one of these, as we have a copy of The Poison Song, Volume 6, written by the ever-familiar Bristin Zell. This is, of course, Volume 6 of 7, in an epic and historically inaccurate saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth just as I'd imagine you'd suspect. But now that we have fully plundered the petite stone circle of its knowledge, random leveled loot, and lovely sights of seekers holding hands, we may leave after I ask one simple thing. Why do you think these two seekers are holding hands? I'm curious as to your thoughts on that one. So while you ponder, let us continue on with the deepest and darkest dive into the depths of Apocrypha, as things are only going to get more and more strange. From here, we are going to cautiously jump back into the bending passageway and make our way into the unexplored hall. Keep sure feet as it bends and twists, wouldn't want you falling over and hurting your ankles or something. Now soon in, we'll brush aside a dust devil of papers to reveal what obscure obstacle lies before us. A confusing crossroads with two gates and four gateways. And as I'm sure you've noticed, the scryer sitting on the floor begging to be activated. Touching this will open the two gates, but they will form two new ones on the two other gateways that were open previously. A problem to be solved shortly. Now, perhaps like me at first, you questioned your eyes after the gates opened, as through the passageway ahead presenting itself to be explored, the back wall actually magically morphs from a flat wall to a long and acrid alley. Fittingly, a confusing illusion and a conjurer's trick to inflict self-doubt onto the sturdiest of mortal minds, redoubling the impending insanity that grows with every minute that we adventurers spend in this accursed plane. Once the visual and physical transmogrification has been completed, a seeker will be spotted waiting in patience to greet us with a barrage of telekinetic sorcery. Attempting to stop us in our simply yet deadly quest for curation. Once we've passed this annoyance, the path turns left, but as we trot forward, a jolt will test our agility as the hall bends to the left, catching us off guard. As we collect ourselves, a lattice petal unfurls, providing a passage, but also presenting us with a new and greater hurdle to hop. A lurker, it towers before us, ready to make combat in a one-on-one -on -one duel to the death. A task I'm sure that a seasoned explorer like yourself can achieve dutifully. Be sure to keep equipped your best boots with a good grip enchantment, as progressing past the lurker will divulge yet another jarring and altering shift of the previously perceived average hallway. Once this sea-sickening turn is complete, will be planted in front of something that gets very upset by the letter S. A s cryer. Abaft, it is the gate that was recently open, but has since been closed due to our interaction with the last scryer. 
Now activating this new scryer alongside us will of course open these gates sealing the backwards trail we used to get here, but that is of no concern as our mission lies forwards through the now unbarred primeval portcullis awaits a short antechamber with a font of stamina at its acute corner. Ahead of this turn to the left is our next curiosity, the reading room. As we squeeze ourselves through the narrow arched slit of an excuse for a doorway, presented will be a domed and moderately sized atrium built of rough cold stone from floor to wall, roofed with a sheet of lattice allowing the natural lights, if you could even call it that, to spill in and provide adequate lighting to the chamber. Be wary though friends, as the gooey green plash at the center hides the dominating tentacles that will swiftly slap one into submission. Sprouting from the upper heights of the dome are four golden ichthyic heads, gargoyle-like in ghastly glare, piercingly peering upon the room and any who stand within it. You may have spotted the six podiums that stand evenly spaced along the furthest edges of the floor three on each side. This decisively determined angle and height paired with the intentionally illuminated room suggests their predominant purpose is to secure open books ready for reading. This could simply be a study hall or diabolically designed to house and host much more infernal goings ons. Given the inaccessible state of most of the books within Apocrypha, Perhaps the latter ceiling isn't to allow for light, but to allow for knowledge to be sapped from the tortured tomes and beamed upwards to Hermaeus Mora himself. As curious as we are, I do not believe sticking around to learn of the reading room's reason to be a wise choice. So let's push on. Push on through the back door and into the corridor of concentration. Stomach-like, rounded and winding, rough curved wall ceilings crafted of crusty chronicles. They conjure mighty manifestations of a huge and molded ribcage. The jagged book corners symbolically suggested as emancipating enzymes in weight to masticate neophytic minds from their prolificacy. The air swills heavy with blue and green ghost gases, bile-like to this intestine of insight, dissolving, absorbing, and cataloging new entries that pass through its entrails. The digestive workings of a god, hmm, might just find Trinimac in here. Fonts of magicka and stamina chromatically cast enchanted hues through sections of the sinuous tunnel. Less metaphorically, the corridor of concentration is occupied by seekers, who, true to their name, seek and repetitiously rend wisdom from archived essays, lingering in stationary flight, their hands supinated and open, palms skyward, meditatively holding pride volumes free of physical touch, telekinetically transcribing formaturgically encrypted tomes. It's certain that these seekers would be brimming with acrimony to any who would disrupt their Orphic concentration. So we shall move past them and finalize our stroll through this here corridor, dodging seekers and parties of flittering novels that float by our heads. Soon we'll spy a rather well-lit dead end, where in the middle against the back wall, between two golden busts, rests an open book. Chaotically animated runes kaleidoscopically course across the weathered parchment. This will lead us to chapter four of the epistolary acumen, the ultimate sector of this black book. Once we arrive here at chapter four, we'll find ourselves on a circular and stone arch rimmed tower top, standing high above areas we have previously explored which now lie down below. A grand and most illustrious illumination brings this place to a stunning brightness, although the source of such light is not visible. Now at the back of this apex terrace is the book that will return us to chapter three if one so chooses to return, which we will not be doing. Anyway, next to this book is an altar 
common as ever, it is topped with a smattering of ruined books and soul gems. We have one unfilled petty soul gem, one unfilled lesser soul gem, and one filled black soul gem, which is an item with great potential in both the arcane arts and mercantile trades. But at the opposite end of the ooze pool is something we have not yet seen with an apocrypha, but we will be seeing more of. This is a container known as a vessel. Vessels are essentially the equivalent of boss level loot chests, the likes of which one would primarily find at the end of a dungeon. Hoarding better than average quantities and qualities of random level loots, although this particular vessel is no accurate reflection of that characteristic. As within it, we can find a copy of the book titled Azura and the Box, or fully titled Azura and the Box Ancient Tales of the Dwemer Part 11, authored by one Marabasul. As the previous number mentioned might have spoilt, this is Part 11 in a series of fictional stories about the Dwemer. In here, we can also find 60 gold pieces and a copy of the book titled Ramanda, described by an unknown author as we learnt earlier. This is a fragmented and mythical recount of the alleged conception of Remen and the return of the Chim El Abadal with the people of Tamriel, which is something you might have known. There is also an unfilled petty soul gem in here and an unfilled lesser soul gem. And finally, in an ever so fitting manner, we can find the book, The Poison Song Volume 2, written by Briston Zell. A series which is becoming poisonous in its own right, and still tells the epic tale and historically inaccurate saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and Hastegoth. But to provide an aesthetic antidote to this toxic book series is a scryer that rests opposite the vessel. Activating it will trigger the crown cage hanging in the center like the garden girdled Babylon to unlock in the most brilliant display of interlocking engineering. A lattice tongue will sweep up from below granting us access to this now open chamber. Like an otherworldly imagining of the rare and putrid Rafflesia flower blossoming into deathly curiosity as it rests high above the lower arcades as an artwork for all to admire. At the heart of this cage is a book, a dangerous yet intriguing book, impossible to resist. This is the Black Book, epistolary acumen the very black book whose apocryphal realm we are within. Opening this swollen tome will summon the Daedric Prince of Forbidden Knowledge himself, the Gardener of Men, Hermaeus Mora. This is of course quest related and takes some time as he speaks in a glacial fashion and with all Daedric Princes has unskippable dialogue. But once he has finished unhurriedly rumbling at us, he will vanish, and from the open pages of the Black Book, three orbs of green light will spawn. These are three spheres of pure knowledge, a choice gifted to us by old Hermamora, the Abyssal Cephaliarch. There are three options, and we must decide on one great power. On the left is Dragonborn Force whose description reads, Your unrelenting force shout does more damage and may disintegrate enemies. A good choice for the ferocious Dovakin wishing to bolster their bare brutality. In the middle is Dragonborn Flame, whose description reads, When your fire breath shout kills an enemy, a fireworm emerges from their corpse to fight for you for 60 seconds. Seemingly a good choice for the Dovakin more inclined in the magical arts, specifically Conjuration. Although it is worth noting, if multiple enemies are killed using this ability, individual fireworms will spawn from all of their corpses. But some enemies such as skeletons and Dwemer constructs will not spawn a fireworm at all. And finally on the right is Dragonborn Frost. His description reads, your frost breath shout encases foes in ice. Now, unlike the ice form shout, this power allows the dragonborn to use the frost breath shout to encase foes in an ice tomb that will not break after a single strike, naturally making it more useful. 
a good choice for the Dovakin more inclined in the defensive or subduing arts of combat. So now Dragonborn, you must choose, and once your choice is made, activating any of these orbs of forbidden knowledge will transport the Dragonborn back to Solstheim. So with that, we have completed the exploration and curation of our first of seven Pockets of Apocrypha, the Black Book Epistolary Acumen, the first of the seven Black Books. Our next curious and cautious steps on this journey begin within the ancient Nordic tomb of Kolbjorn Barrow, where in its buried baths we will find the Black Book Filament and Filigree. Upon touching the book, we will be transported to a section of Apocrypha with the same name, Filament and Filigree. But before we take our first wandering gazes, however, if we look at the Black Book Filament and Filigree within our inventory, we'll learn that this was written by someone called Jelkatheris, who has not been known to author any other transcripts. Contained within is only one readable page of text, as with all black books. The passage accessible reads, I stared at my reflection in the metal, wondering if my face had hardened to match my inner mood. I had been working the piece for days, and the forger's sweltering was taking its toll. I always came to the metal shop when the dark swam over me, and today was no exception. In the midst of, at which point we can read no further sadly. But what forbidden knowledge does this black book's apocryphal realm have to teach? Well, let us find out. Uh, may light guide us, friend, as this pocket of the Forbidden Realm is in an unknowably dark and deepest depth. For all that knowledge brightens, it casts long umbral shadows, as is entirely apparent here on the Shadow Path. A strip of cobbled stone and cyclopean codex columns warp and linger in a lifeless onyx void. The darkness here is far more foreboding than a night veil that excites our cruelest imagination into torturing ourselves into sleepless and haunted nights. The lightless twilight abaddon here will kill us. Light is the key to the barred door of survival within these hollows, so we must tread carefully and calculably, lest we become an astute apparatif for the infinitely insatiable appetite of the chaotic chasm that hungers for all knowledge and those who hold it. With our primary objective at the forefront of our minds, that being life and more specifically keeping ours, let us vigilantly slink on and into the shadow path. Upon our arrival, we'll find ourselves on a cluttered bastion, dotted rather helpfully with lamp posts and fonts of magicka that swirl bewitchingly with gyrating gusts of misplaced pages. Light bearers float methodically through the hall, creating a barrier of brightness to protect mortals from the silently snarling shadows. Towards the back of this location is a steep set of carved steps that lead onwards and upwards to a sealed gateway, fixed tight with the octopal crest that we naturally find discomforting to look upon. To the right of this ascent is a slab stone altar sitting flirtatiously in the waning edges of light, providing a temptation both delectable and dangerous. Placed upon it is the usual scattering of ruined books, accompanied by two soul gems. Firstly is an unfilled common soul gem. Secondly is a filled petty soul gem. Must have the soul of Nazim. At the center lies a much more handsome leather-bound tome. This is a copy of the sneak skill book titled Three Thieves, whose author remains anonymous. This tells the tale of some thieves within Morrowinds who plan a heist. Speaking of which, be sure to nab this novel as it has a value of 75 and could fetch a pretty penny at market or at a fence. Now that our pockets are a little heavier with a petite perquisite of Apocrypha, we'll now face our next challenge. Climbing the shadowed stairs that rise before us, wading through a curtain of indigo fog, doing our also very best to remain protected by the light bearers and their lifeline of illumination remembering that a brush with shade could be deadly. Once at the crest of the staircase, we will find a locked gate with a scryer resting to its right. 
but before we activate it, over to the left, we can find our first pod of this apocryphal pocket, and sitting on the ground next to it is a not-so-invisible scroll of invisibility. Rather than invisibility, it is within visibility. And like a ruby red bushel of berries, it's ripe for the picking, so be sure to gather this up, as it has a value of 500, well worth its weight in gold. One problem though, you might not be able to find it within your bag. Now of course, using this scroll will make the caster invisible for 30 seconds. Naturally, activating an object or attacking will break the spell, as with all invisibility effects. Now to the pod. Inside we can find a copy of the book titled A Dance in Fire, Volume 5, authored by one Walken Yarth, a notable Breton writer having 25 publications under his belt. That must be uncomfortable. Now this entry in particular retells a cloak's adventures through Valenwood, home of the Bosma, the Wood Elves. Now along with this we can also find a copy of the book titled Confessions of a Dunma Skooma Eater. With no declared author in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, however in the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind it is known to be authored by one Tilsi Sendis. This is a narrative recount of a cured skooma addict. We can also find in here a copy of the book titled The Five Songs of King Wolfhearth, which has no known author. This is a summary of five epic songs of King Wolfhearth plus an additional and rather fittingly apocryphal song of the Tribunal, Dagothur and Indoral Nerevar. Following this, we have a copy of the book titled Ghosts in the Storm, written by one Adonato Leonatelli, an imperial author, who can actually be found in Candlehearth Hall within Windhelm, if you ever feel so inclined to say hello. Now this text is a detailed description of the author's encounter with a Falmer. The modern Falmer that is, not the elegant and now extinct Snow Elves of old. In here we can also find a sum of 11 gold, woo hoo, and finally a scroll of hysteria which has much more value in gold than it will ever have in use, as actually using it will force creatures and people up to level 12 to flee from combat for 60 seconds. So as you'd expect, this will become useless fairly on into the game. But now that we've planted the pod and collected our not so invisible scroll of invisibility, we can make our way to the scryer. Naturally, activating it will unlock the great gates blocking our way as now we may begin our cautious push through the gauntlet of gloom, a narrow nave of dim lambency. Luckily for us, a number of lampposts have been planted edgeside to provide a somewhat lit path for mortals such as ourselves. However, we must not journey with haste, instead our movements shall be planned and precise. As while the warmth of the honey milk rays cast by the lamps is naturally magnetic to our land-loving selves, the sodden ponds of the accursed vile Viridian shimmer sludge hide writhing tentacles, itching to slam any oblivious outsider who traces a track too friendly with their precarious perimeter. While we progress further along this aisle that is the gauntlet of doom and gloom, actively evading darkness and cruel octopian mistresses, we should also be mindful of Daedra, as just up ahead at the half mark of the passage is a seeker. While a force to be feared no doubt, it's almost wholesomely refreshing to encounter a tangible danger that can be dealt with via conventional means, such as a sword, arrow and spell. It feels nice and grounded to face an obstacle we can approach and overcome with steel, but as comforting as this simpler peril may be, our toes must be kept upon, as in the permanent void ahead, skulking in the sable umbrage, is yet another seeker and a lurker who lives up to its name, given, you know, that it's lurking. Not even the light bearers are brave enough or kind enough to pass over this ebon-aired section. Two foes that could prove challenging normally, but now even more so than usual, as they're dipped darkly in their deathly dusky haunts, like ghastly silhouettes in a fever dream but one we shan't be waking from. Instead, we must face this nightmare head-on with sightless adroitness. Or, you know, just bring a torch. That makes things a lot easier. The final stretch beyond this pair of infernal creatures 
is a circumspect clamber, foot followed by foot, up two sets of ever narrowing stairs, broken midway by a lean landing. Our focus too narrows with the architecture, as an altar of unknown allurement acutely angles our attention as we are drawn approximately to the highest stage of the shadow's sepulchre. Now here we detect a strange smell as the proudly standing tentacle totem emits a torrent of foul, olive-tinted energy upward, ionizing the already stuffy air in some unspeakable crime against known physics. Two lamp posts emanate clear focused sinister for our poor and tortured mortal eyes, allowing us to finally see something clearly within this wretched abyss. Adding to this illumination is a dutiful light bearer swaying back and forth above the area like some poor daedric excuse of a betting edge, although it is greatly appreciated in this moment. To the right side of Shadow's Sepulchre Summit is a stone altar bearing a moderate assortment of rather quotidian offerings. A small careless stack of ruined books sprinkle the slab. Three soul gems dot iridescent colours across the surface, specifically an unfilled lesser soul gem, a filled common soul gem, and an unfilled black soul gem that proved to be so evil even the footage of it I got corrupted, but I got it again so you can see it now. Along with these ruined writings there is also a scroll of mass paralysis, perhaps not something that will come in immediate use, but the handsome gold value of 500 will come in use for all adventurers. If you do use it, all targets in the area that fail to resist it will be paralysed for 10 seconds. And placed thoughtlessly open and face down in the centre of the altar is a copy of the spell tome Healing Hands, which is quite handy. Haha, <laughs> get it? Healing Hands handy? But it is a handy restorative spell to be equipped within this chasm of damaging dimness. Anyway, the spell itself heals the target for 10 points per second, but of course not undead, atronarchs or machines. Now it is also important to note that if your character's conjuration skill is level 40 or higher, unlike my character, a copy of the spell tome Conjure Seeker will also be found here. Using this will teach you the appropriate spell, which will allow you to summon a seeker to fight for you for 60 seconds. It's also important to note that this spell is not affected by the twin souls perk. Nonetheless, a welcome addition to your magical arsenal. Now, on the opposite side, as I'm sure you've noticed, with your ever perceptive eyes, is the thumping black book begging to be unlatched and released. However, before we get our greedy hands on that knowledge bomb, we have some more rambunctious ransacking to do. As to the left of the forbidden plinth is a vessel. Inside, we have a platter of what I suspect to be random level loot. In here we can find a copy of the book titled Dwarves Volume 2, or fully titled Dwarves The Lost Race of Tamriel Volume 2 Weapons, Armour and Machines. Authored by Calcemo, Scholar of Markov, a character we in fact can go visit. Now this manuscript is a detailed work on the war, equipment and machinery of the Dwemer. Following genre, the next book is a copy of Dwemer History and Culture, or fully titled Dwemer History and Culture Collected Essays on Dwemer History and Culture Chapter 1, Mara Bar Sul and the Trivialization of the Dwemer in Popular Culture, by Hasfat Antibolus, an Imperial Drillmaster of the Fighters Guild, who can actually be encountered within the Elder Scrolls III Morrowinds who hopefully has gone to the doctor, as if he has a fat antibolus, he should seek medical assistance to reduce swelling. Anyway, this text is a review of the Dwemer essays written by Marabar Sul, who wrote their own manuscript titled Ancient Tales of the Dwemer. And making a break in the pages, we have here a flawless sapphire, with its mighty value of 500 gold and measly weight of 0.1 like stealth and archery, the perfect combination. Next, we can find a copy of the book titled Forge, Hammer and Anvil, authored by Adolphus Eritius, who found notes near Old Hroldan, thought to be written by an infamous Nordsmith named Thorbald of the late Second Era. This work is a transcribing of the poorly written notes he left behind. Below this, we can find a very healthy sum of 237 gold pieces. 
Then, of course, would we even be within a pocket of Apocrypha if the Poison Song Volume 4 and 5 didn't appear? These are, of course, both authored by our new foe, I mean friend, Bristin Zell. And yes, it still tells of the epic and historically inaccurate saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. Penultimately, there is a pair of iron boots, which is odd. I've ironed my shirts before, but never my shoes. And ultimately, we have a circlet of alteration, potentially handy, and at the very least, a metal band we can easily vend back on Mundus for a financially favorable figure. And now that we have drained that chitinous trough of miscellaneous treasures we can turn to the true treasure here. The Black Book, Filament and Filigree. The very Black Book whose apocryphal realm we are within. Upon touching the taboo tome, the covers will part ways and the pages will open, from which three acrid turquoise orbs will slither forth. These here spheres thrice are of pure forbidden knowledge, a choice gifted to us by the master of the tides of fate, Hermaeus Mora. Three options, and we must decide on one of these great powers. On the left is the Secret of Strength, whose description reads, Power attacks cost no stamina for 30 seconds. A decent pick for the Dragonborn who is known for unruly and rage-filled melee mashings. In the middle is the Secret of Magicka, whose description reads, Spells cost no magicka for 30 seconds. A lovely option for the arcanely inclined dragonborn who wishes to unleash a limitless abracadabra assault. And finally on the right we have the Secret of Protection, whose description reads, Reduces damage by half for 30 seconds which I believe to be the weakest of the three options. While no doubt it has its uses, the other two seem much more powerful. Which is of course what we're after, no? We're here for knowledge, and knowledge is power. And if you disagree, well, don't tell Hermes more. Now once your choice is made, activating any of these orbs of forbidden knowledge will transport the Dragonborn back to Solstheim. So with that, we have completed the exploration and curation of our second pocket of Apocrypha, the Black Book, Filament and Filigree, the second of seven Black Books. Our next curious and cautious steps on this journey begin within the ash-ridden Telvanni Mushroom Tower of Telmithrin, home to Master Nelov, wherein we can find locked away the Black Book, the Hidden Twilight. Upon touching the book, we will be transported to a section of Apocrypha with the same name, the Hidden Twilight. But before we take our first wandering gazes, if we look at the Black Book, The Hidden Twilight within our inventory, we will learn that this was written by someone called Carilius Melthus, who has not been known to author any other transcriptions. Contained within is only one readable page of text, as with all Black Books. The passage accessible reads as follows. The city of ink seeds rose from the desert, shining and decadent. Somehow, it still stood. I crossed through the gate, and the beast knew exactly where to take me, the way worn by beggars and poets, the only place a man of my appetites can find satisfaction. I'm not proud, but then nobody ever is. At which point we can read no further, sadly. But what forbidden knowledge does this Black Book's apocryphal realm have to teach? Well, let us find out. This segment of Apocrypha is a massive archipelago of archaic islands, like a fogged forest of cryptic cities and puzzlingly portaled promenades. Lock, key and latch are the simplest tasks here, as the true enigmatic depths of knowledge that surrounds us are occult and esoteric beyond description, innumerable. Only first-hand experience may pave and paint a clear picture of the palatial palisades and secret ciphers this malevolent and monstrous metropolis conceals. Now, when we first arrive, we'll be imprisoned within an airy chamber, certainly bigger than any purpose it currently carries out. As while it may seem intriguing at first, as to what could be around the corner or hiding behind a pillar, this area provides naught 
other than two fonts of magicka. But as septums throw away, there is a grim gateway, fixed closed with the ever too familiar, impiously insidious insignia of Octopusian make. Before this barred ferrous filigree stands a scryer. Activating this strange device will release the single obstacle between us and progress, the gate. Passing through the steep archway, a latticework ramp will funnel us towards an open black book that will teleport us to chapter 2 of The Hidden Twilight. But before we follow the sheep's path, we must carve our own curious one. As if we jump down off the back of the raised platform, we will find our first sneaky little stash. A pod that rests in the obscure and plagued peacock mists that roll lowly. Inside of this pod, we can find a copy of the book titled 16 Accords of Madness, Volume 6, which has no known author. This is apparently Volume 6 in a series of potentially 15 or 16 books that retell the meetings of Sheol Gorath and the other Daedric Princes, Volume 6 being Hercene's tale. Now I say apparently 16, as only 3 are known to exist, this one, Volume 6, Volume 9 and Volume 12, but given there's 16 Daedric Princes, there should be 16 volumes, however Sheol Gorath is one of those Daedric Princes, and he can't exactly meet himself. You know what? If there's anyone who could meet themselves, it would be Shia Gorath. So again, could be 1516, who knows. Now below this, we can find the <laughs> pretty low sum of 20 gold pieces, as well as a copy of the book known as the Legendary Scourge. Although it has no noted author in Skyrim, but due to it being present in previous games, we know it to be written by Marabar Sul, an accomplished writer, especially on the subject of the Dwemer. This novel, however, is a short story and poem about Scourge, the artifact mace of Malakath, Daedric Prince of Curses. Every time you hear that guy speak, it's just bleep this and bleep that. He just cannot stop cursing. Now, in here, we could also find a copy of The Wolf Queen, Volume 6, written by renowned author Wagen Yath, a Breton writer primarily known for historical works. This particular text is Volume 6 in an eight-part series recounting the life of Queen Potamus Septim of Solitude, better known as the Wolf Queen. And finally, we will find a Master Robes of Restoration, which golly gosh god darn, it has a smirk-inducing large price tag that will fetch a cart of coin back in Skyrim. And now that we have snatched up these goodies, we can walk back up to the open book of Chapter 2 and press on with our epic expedition. Now where we materialize is within busy halls built of bygone books. A peaking turn left, then a cautious turn right, then left again at the font of Magica, and we'll find ourselves peering through the scantily clad screen of Lattice into the barren bookyard. A few more twists and turns following the only available path and we'll emerge to, well, exactly what I said before, a barren bookyard, offering little more than boredom and disappointment. It's a rather large area with alluring stacked columns, bearing nooks and crannies that seem to have been forgotten. As much like our place of origin in this pocket of Apocrypha, there is simply nothing of note. Well, little of note to be more precise. As when we emerge to our left is a stunted gate, which seemingly has no means of opening, but upon a closer inspection on the other side, there sits a scryer. Well, we'll get back to this later on. As for now, we will explore further into this excitement-less area of drabness. Soon we'll spot two seekers who will swiftly be alerted to our presence and begin conjuring telekinetic bursts pushed hurriedly in our direction. This is naturally an unpleasant and potentially fatal series of events, so deal with them as you see fit and do it quickly. And ah, but what's this? A font of magicka that radiates with a blazing ball of blue light, behind which sits an altar. A meager one to be sure, but better than the barren bookyard that it is found within. On the slab top are several ruined books and a single lonely soul gem. This is a filled common soul gem. Kind of ironic that this thing here is literally the life of the party within this squalid square. But across from this is a small raised landing with itty bitty spilling steps clinging to its perimeter, beyond which is a font of stamina glued to the wall, spewing a rich vert tone. 
acting as a guiding light to the mouth of a steep passageway that leads to higher interests. Now shimmying through a narrow squeeze of piled parchments and penciled prattlings, we'll notice an opening on our right, a scryer planted on the sinistral side of the arched aperture, delivering a vistal view of unorthodox platforms. Two great pillars impetrate our attention and analysis, with lattice ledges sprouting from them. Like the flat polypore fungi one would find in a damp wood, sporing rigidly from the soggy rotten trunks of fallen oak and pine, similar to that which we stumble upon within Skyrim, the common mushroom Mora tapinella. Now these peculiar, flourished flower steps are clearly in some way related to the traversal progression that we must polish, but how? There is no clear or earthly convention offered for observation. And while the problematical height of these platforms is likely not fatal, a swift or even stunted fall from such an awkward elevation would be leg snapping to be sure. Now if we are so hapless to slip off and twist our ankle with journey jarring ebullition, all is not lost. As if we turn around and sprawklingly shamble back under the platform from whence we slipped, we will find ourselves on the other side of the rather stunted gateway that we inspected only a few minutes ago. But this time we can access the scryer, which will prompt the squeaking hinges to let go and let us through so we may retrace our steps and attempt to best this platforming puzzle once again. So. Given the head-scratching position we find ourselves, what better option than to place our hand upon and pull the scryer? While not knowing what it will result in, there isn't much other to do. But oh, just look at this. In front of us and on the furthest side, two lattice bridges unfurl to their apex point of erection, before curling back down to their resting position, where after they will repeat their slurping cycle, Massaging the mephitic chasm like two monstrous mosquito proboscises, sardonically searching for a sanguinous snack. Now, with our wits about us, we must wait for the walkway to rise up, at which time we can quickly dash across it, landing in respite on the first lattice ledge, then jumping cautiously to the second, ensuring to do so with the most certain of footing as not to fall. Then with a well-timed hop and bolt, we will pass between two lamp posts, like a finishing line at a meddlesome marathon. Ah yes, now in our forevision is a glassless window, teasing an area we will later tread. For now though, we are at the twin downs as ramps descend on either side of us. Firstly, we'll head to the left to a sunken pocket that leads nowhere cramped with rubble and detritus, but it does house a few items of interest and potential pelf. Resting on the cracked stone slabs before a sporadically stacked accumulation of hardbacks is a pod, within which we may find a copy of the book titled An Explorer's Guide to Skyrim, authored by one Marcius Carvain, who is or was the Viscount of Brumar. As the title may have heavily implied, this is a brief guide for adventurers and tourists alike who wish to travel to Skyrim. We also have a copy of the book titled Boethius Proving, with no known author. This is an ancient text dating back to at least the second era, retelling the events of a fatal summoning of Boethia, the Daedric Prince of Plots. Reading this book within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim will also initiate the quest Boethius Calling providing you have not already started or completed it. In here we can also find 15 gold pieces, along with a potion of extreme magicka, which in my opinion is the only way to have magicka extremely. And lastly, there is a copy of the book titled The Rising Threat, Volume 4, written by Lathenel of Sunhold, an Ultima refugee who fled Somerset due to, and I quote, the darkening shadow of the Thalmor upon my beloved homeland. And if you too hate the Thalmor, I do have a Thalmor Tears mug in my store, link below. This is the fourth and final volume in a tetralogy describing the rising threat posed by the Thalmor. But now that we're done rummaging through the poor little pod, we can turn our attention to the altar against the back wall. 
And as predictably as a stealth archer playthrough, we can find scattered scantily across the surface of the slab are some ruined books and two soul gems. We have a filled petty soul gem and an unfilled greater soul gem, an item I'm sure we can fill while we journey here. Also important to note that if your character's conjuration skill is level 40 or higher, unlike my character, a copy of the spell term Conjure Seeker will also be found here. Using this will teach you the appropriate spell which will allow you to summon a seeker to fight for 60 seconds. It's also important to note that this spell is not affected by the Twin Souls perk. Nonetheless, a welcoming addition to your magical arsenal. Now with our pockets clinking, and our conjuration spells bolstered, we may retake the ramp upwards to the crest and then trot merrily down the other side. Drawn to the bright light like a moth priest to an Elder Scroll, where in a small room lit brilliantly by a font of magicka brimming with preternatural potency and a willy-willy of rustling pages eddies animatedly, there is an ornate display stand upon which rests opened and with dancing diction a book that will transport us to chapter 3 of this apocryphal realm, Hidden Twilight. Ah, now the narthex of chapter 3 is a busy entryway with tilting tome towers tempted to topple at any moment as they sway strangely. Papers blend in unordered squalls and the musty air smells of an unknown yet familiar musk. Here we find ourselves in a library of layers, lean passages of leaning rickles cobbled variably to shape vertiginous vestibules. As we mourned through the first few twists and turns, a large opening will bear itself before us. But before we push forth, we must turn to the left at the font of stamina, as nestled snugly into a nocturnal nook is a pod hiding from unattentive eyes, within which we can find a sum of 18 gold pieces, along with a lesser soul gem, which is currently unfilled. Oh, and look, an old friend. A copy of the book titled The Poison Song Volume 2, written by none other than Bristin Zell. This is part 2 of 7 in a series that is an epic and historically inaccurate saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. Oh, and it looks like the postman really cocked up, as we also have the Windhelm letters authored by a lady named Raylia. How did the courier get that so wrong? Apocrypha and Skyrim, not even the same postcode. Anyway, this is a collection of letters written in the second era by a woman who lived in Windhelm, addressed to her husband, who lived in solitude. And finally, we can find a copy of the book titled Words of Clan Mother Arnesi, or fully titled Words of Clan Mother Arnesi to her favoured daughter, authored by a Khajiit clan mother named Arnesi, who would have guessed. This tells of Khajiit's explanations of the origins of the world. But now that we've prodded the pod, we will walk on out into the inland lake presented before us, with a narrow ford that leads to an island, beyond which is an extremely menacing and fortified facade of scaled and filled stone arches, forming a stern bulwark of biblical proportions. But such impositions are backseat, as when we arrive at the raised island which swims within the lapping lethiferous lock of lichen pitch sludge, we'll notice that the stairway forward is fully retracted and not a single step up or down can be made. Yet another of Apocrypha's jaunt, halting obstacles for us to correct. So, spinning elegantly 180 degrees around and inspecting the strange structure we originated from, we'll notice there are actually lattice ramps leading upward on both sides to the rooftop of the layered library. A feature that birthed its name, Gore's sheets have been moulded and formed into a gambrel canopy, which one can walk upon. At the central edge, acting like a rostrum, there is a scryer placed with such symmetrical precision it stinks of a mantic mechanism. Activating it will initiate the needed stretching of the retracted steps, pushing four sets of stone stairs out from the base of the island in all directions. Now, we may climb up and inspect the enticing atoll, where we'll be suddenly met by a seeker, seemingly seeking 
to only do one thing, that being annoying us and our otherwise pleasant sojourn. While our personal endeavour and aspirations are blinding, in reality this daedra is just fulfilling its purpose. With that said, however, it will need to be dealt with for our best interests, as being subject to a bludgeoning of telepathic blasts is not currently on our to-do list. Now this ring of rock effuses a ghastly green fume, which appears to illume the area with that accursed toxic lime coloration. On the western side of the platform beneath the hollow stone spire rests two altars, split by an ichthyic totem and a plinth between them. The ancient table on the right is devoid of anything interesting, just three ruined books. Now the plinth in the middle bears some more scrappy and beaten books, but also has atop it a soul gem. This is a filled grand soul gem, handsomely valued at 500 septums. And the altar on the left bears two soul gems. One is an unfilled greater soul gem and the other an unfilled grand soul gem. Welcome additions to our soul harvesting repertoires. And with the scant treasures collected, we will trot on and through the opening in the ever foreboding edifice that we face. Once we pass through, we'll find ourselves in a room filled with stimulation. Mountains of manuscripts form visually malefic mounds, seeming to grow endlessly from the complex marbled stone substructures. Concourses, levels, fences and gateways smacked together to form a rat's maze of knowledge. This is the same area that we briefly spied through the lattice window previously after we successfully traversed the licking lattice tongues. But before we explore the ins and the outs of this busy arena, there is a secret room that we're going to discover. So as we walk into this area, we want to pass the gate by walking on the right side. Waiting here will be a lurker, a reoccurring theme I know. But deathly dangerous nonetheless and should be treated with great caution and wit and met with the sharpest of combat tactics. Behind this lurker to the left are two lamp posts, brightening a narrow passageway forged of jagged book corners, like barnacles clinging to a sea cave wall. Through here and around an occult bend to the right we'll find a tiny alcove, the secret room, which is lit alluringly with the pastoral perfume emitted from the font of stamina. Next to this however is a hidden chapter, a secret page in the story of Apocrypha, reserved for the curious explorer willing to probe the rarest recesses others dare not even contemplate. Touching this book will transport us to chapter 4, where we will find ourselves immured within a lean and shallow hallway, with a seeker awaiting our arrival, as so he may test some new spells. Now beyond the speaker is a lamp post, which would seem to produce no light. While the bulb is glowing, the area at the base is dim and unlit by its overarching lamp. Along with the lightlessness, also at the foot of the post is a scryer. Now backed up behind the two are several layers of lattice, two of which appear as gates. But the closest to us is nothing more than a wall. Now if we activate this scryer, the gateway on the right will unlock and be swung open, just as its mechanisms intended. But that doesn't do much for us here and now. It would seem this is a secret puzzle we will have to complete later on. And oh, we will. But given that we have done all we can for the time, we'll want to about face and use the black book chapter where we entered to exit back into chapter 3. We will now walk the same path as before, just backwards. Or more, we will walk forwards, just going back the way we came. Although you could literally walk backwards if such things interested you. Anyway, once we reach the very spot where the lurker is or was, depending on whether or not you have dealt with that particular danger already, above this very spot, if we tilt our heads back and gaze on up, we'll see there is a platform with a scryer on it. Luckily, there is a stunted series of short steps, followed by a steep serrated ramp providing access to this upper balcony. Now placing our hand on the strange mechanism and activating the fleshy scryer will trigger a low screech in the distance, as the locked gateway binding shut the fenced hexagonal narthex, which was blocking our way, is unlatched 
and the corroded doors swing open, through which we will wander onwards, conquering worn step after worn step. Once we reach the lattice-floored ballroom, the gate ahead is sealed shut. Hmm, someone needs to stop closing these doors. Now instead, we will have to veer to the right and pass under the raised platform. Shortly thereafter, yet another set of steps and ancient stairs will be revealed. Connected to the landing is a lattice ledge sticking to some stone like some organic membrane. Following this slightly inclined pathway around the Cyclopean Spire of Tome and Codex, we'll find ourselves on a poor excuse of a mezzanine. At the furthest edge is a lamp post, beneath which is a scryer. Activating this will unlock the Lich Gate that mitigated us from further exploration of the unknown. Now we may progress freely, climbing this final set of archaic chipped and time-tortured stairs will lead us into a small maze of corridors and passageways, laid out rather geometrically and symmetrically, but there are many dead ends, walls and fallen structures to hamstring our journey. Also be careful, as there is a seeker that lingers within these halls, waiting for a poor fellow to prey upon. Soon we will find the true path and see a book swollen aisle with a light bearer hovering above some objects of interest. But as we approach, a dizzying display of hypnotic architectural engineering will unravel before our eyes, creating an illusion that makes us question our depth perception and our very own sight, as a wall extends backwards like a cursed and colossal accordion. But shortly after completing its mystical performance, we'll see two open black book chapters at the finality of the Lattice Lock Labyrinth, but before we get to them, however, we must inspect the area which we originally thought was the terminal point of this passage. To be frank, there isn't much of a sight, with two plinths bearing nothing more than a handful of ruined books that serve no purpose at all to us mortals. But sitting against the stone corner is a pod. Within its wretched glowing golden jaws, we can find a copy of the book titled Feyfoken, Volume 3, authored by one Wagen Yath, a notable Breton writer having 25 publications under his belt. He must have one big belt to fit all those books under. Now this is a retelling of the great sage and immortal Breton wizard of legend, Gyron Varden Groet's tale of Arteum, Sigix and robotic enchanters. In here we can also find 13 gold pieces and also one common soul gem that is currently unfilled. There is also a copy of the ever-present Poison Song Volume 2, authored by our already good friend Briston Zell. Now this is of course part 2 in a 7 part series, which is an epic and historically inaccurate saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. And finally there is a copy of the book titled The Red Book of Riddles, which has no known author. As the name suggests, it is a red book and contains some riddles, and terrible ones at that. But now we can stroll on up to the end of the illusory vestibule, where we will face two choices, chapter 5 on the left and chapter 6 on the right. Chapter 6 will take us on our journey towards the end of this black book, but first we're going to explore chapter 5, as this will take us to somewhere we've seen before. It's the very same secret room as chapter 4, but on the other side of the abstract honeycomb partition. This is a small, walled, ceilingless cell, lit sharply with the cold blue light emitted from the font of magicka that is bolted to the wall. Through the chthonic, optotopic, sheetless pane that bolts the postern tight, we can see the Seeker and the Scryer that we interacted with earlier. Much like its prequel twin, this cramped cloister also has a Scryer just begging to be activated like Norton Security. Doing so will release the infernal latch of this locked gateway. As we pass through it and turn to the left, the second gate will already be opened. This is due to the aforementioned scryer we activated previously in Chapter 4. Funnily, as we turn into the whimsical reading room, we'll notice the seeker here has been pinned against the wall by the swinging half-gate. 
guess you could say when it comes to protecting forbidden knowledge, he's not doing such a gate job. Now in the corner nearest to the seeker at the back of the carved cubicle is a pod. Inside it we may find seven gold pieces, along with a copy of the book titled A Short History of Morrowinds, authored by one Jeanette City. This is comprised of several brief sections describing a broad overview of Morrowind, and a large section specifically detailing the island of Vardenfell. My home. We can also find in here a common soul gem, which is currently unfilled. There is also the spell term Oak Flesh. Using this will teach us the alteration spell of the same name, which when used will improve the caster's armor rating by 40 points for 60 seconds. The most basic of mage armor spells. We also have a copy, oh, look at this, the Poison Song Volume 4, authored by, oh, who knew, Briston Zell. Haven't heard that name before. Now this is of course part four in a series of seven, which is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. And finally, we have a copy of the Poison Song volume six, which I'm sure you can fill in the rest of the info for yourself. What's that, you can't? Okay, well, it was authored by Briston Zell and is part six in a seven part series, which is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. But now that we have all of that completely new information, definitely nothing in there we heard before, we can turn with our attention ablaze to the true hidden gem of this secret room, the Altar of Arcane Articulation, an enormous ingot of time-worn stone, atop which is five books, and not just any books, as here rests the most particularly peculiar pentological parchment platter of preternaturally perdued prestidigitations. We will return to the specific significance of this sorcerous selection after we learn exactly what we have laid before us. So firstly, on the left of the literary line is a copy of the illusion skill book titled Before the Ages of Man, or fully titled Timeless Series Volume 1, Before the Ages of Man, authored by one Akanta of Shimmerin, an Ultima active during the early Second Era, and Sapiarch of Indoctrination of the lilandral based College of Sapiarchs. This text chronicles the major events of the Dawn and Merific eras, and will naturally increase your illusion skill by one upon reading, provided of course that your eyes are virgin to its teachings. It also has a very nice value of 60 gold, which is a great contrast to the majority of books here which are ruined. To its right we have a copy of the Conjuration skill book titled 2920 Volume 9 Hearthfire, or fully titled Hearthfire Book 9 of 2920, The Last Year of the First Era, authored by one Kalavak Townway. This is part 9 of a series of 12 that relate the historical happenings of Vivek and the Empire at the end of the First Era. And although in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim there are 12 books in the series, known as a dodecology, within the Elder Scrolls Online an additional 15 books have been added, making the series 27 books, which is known as a heptaic osology, a technical phrase I doubt you'll ever hear again, for good reason. But back to this book. Of course, if you read it and you haven't read it before, it will increase your conjuration skill by one point which is lovely, and so is its value of 50 gold. To its right rests the alteration skill book titled Breathing Water, authored by Haliel Miram. This retells events of adventure through Morrowind and certain lessons on water breathing. Naturally, reading this book will increase your alteration skill by one point, provided you haven't read this book before. It also has a handsome value of 60 gold. Lying on top of this is a copy of the Restoration skill book titled Racial Phylogeny, or fully titled Notes on Racial Phylogeny and Biology 7th Edition, published by the Council of Healers from the Imperial University, of course located in Cyrodiil. This codex muses on the similarities and differences between the races of Tamriel. It has a rather unusual, but not alien, value of 55 gold, and reading it will increase your restoration skill by one point, unless of course you have read this before. And finally, on the very right side in this line of publications is a copy of the Destruction skill book, 
titled A Hypothetical Treachery, or fully titled A Hypothetical Treachery, a one-act play, authored by Anthil Morvir. This is a rather lengthy one-act play involving two battle mages, a healer, a barbarian, a ghost, and some bandits set in Eldenwood. It also sounds like the start to a weird Tamrielic joke. Now, picking up this book for the very first time will increase your destruction skill by one point, unless, of course, you have read this before. And it also has that strange value of 55. Anyway, now that our magical skills have been boosted, let's discuss the curious nature of this selection of tomes. Each five books are skill books for the five arcane arts that involve spell casting. Those being alteration, conjuration, destruction, illusion, and restoration. This is a hidden pocket of Apocrypha reserved for the most inquisitive explorers, housing a broad array of magical knowledge. Hence the name of the finds, the Altar of Arcane Articulation. Curious how such teachings have been selectively hidden, given the rest of the realm seems to be orderless, at least from a mortal perspective. I just wonder who locked these away with such secrecy, and why they did so. Very curious indeed, but a lovely find to satiate our spell-binding sojourn into the most occult corners of Hermaeus Mora's plane of oblivion, Apocrypha. But now that we're done here and have sapped the wizardry from these works, we may exit this secret hidden room the same way we came by entering the open black book that will return us to the end of chapter 3. Here we will have the same two options as before, but given that we have gone left and finished chapter 5, we will now delve into the dull doorway of chapter 6 on the right. This will transport our meager mortal selves to an area I can only describe as the uninteresting arcade. A small, crooked colonnade filled with debris and rubble as sections of the upper structures have collapsed due to some dire erosion native to this plane. Inert fonts gasp lifeless and useless and meaningless passages lead to sudden terminations. At the end of which, however, the walls will open up and enclose an outdoor and most magnificent Maksura, it would seem. Lit in contrast to the rest of the area by the vile green gleam from the font of stamina. Here on two plinths sit yet two more chapters for us to choose between. Chapter 7 on the right and chapter 8 on the left. We will first slipstream through the spinning script into Chapter 7, as is required for completion of this realm. This will take us to a tilted atoll at the edge of the greasy grime sea, a final bastion before an infinity of toxic drownings. Here, on the opposite side to which we entered the island, there is a font of magicka burning brightly. Standing at its base is a seeker, prepared to defend this rather important location as it holds the keystone to finalizing our journey through the apocryphal realm of hidden twilight. Be sure to be wary of this daedric foe as psychic sorcery shimmers in its clenched fist, ready to shatter the reality of any intruders. Next to this seek, however, is a plinth holding a handful of hard covers, next to which stands a scryer, which is paramount as it serves as the wheel cog for a drawbridge we need lowered. But first, the plinth. Atop it rests three ruined books, as useless as a ward spell. But there are two tomes here that actually serve a perceivable purpose. The edition that lies on top is a copy of the book titled Biography of Baron Zaya, Volume 2, authored by Stern Gamboge, an imperial scribe. This is naturally part two of a three-part series, which is a trilogy, as I'm sure you know, that is a factual biography of Queen Baron Zaya. Underneath this is our second paper, a copy of the book titled Nords Arise, which has an anonymous author. This is a Stormcloak's recruitment essay calling for rebellion against the Empire. But now we can turn our attention to the Scryer. Lowering the lever of this Daedric mechanism will unfurl two lattice drawbridges far in the distance. This completion of passage is required for our ultimate parade through this penumbral 
purgatory that we find ourselves within. To do so, however, we must turn around and exit this bent bastion through the back book chapter in which we arrived. Now we will find ourselves back at chapter 6 before the two books. This time, however, we will be sliding into the syllables of chapter 8 on the left, which will teleport us to a cramped chamber, the gloomy gatehouse, crammed with columns of crusted chronicles. Guarding the exit is the gate guard, a seeker, fists up and ready to dance. To his left is an altar wedged into the back corner, above which is a golden ichthyic bust, a font of stamina, which appears to emit no light, making this already grim gatehouse even more glum and gloomy than the name would suggest. Upon this altar are a smattering of ruined books, barely visible in this eye-straining dimness. But we can also find two soul gems. One is a black soul gem which is filled and ready for the dark arts. The second is a filled grand soul gem, also ready to be used in the arcanium of enchanting. Once these bewitching baubles have been collected, we may pass the gatekeeper and pass across the drawbridge that we recently extended, walking over the moot moat of mucilent morass. Ah, now, at the other side of which is the Courtyard of Conclusion, a rather spacey paved pavilion where several golden statues of ungodly creatures stand, like columns or tombstones in an otherworldly graveyard. Also be warned of the small, inky Icarus ponds on either side of the nave, as they contain those perpetually punishing tentacles. Also note that sometimes here there will be a lurker, but as it would appear, not today, thank the Nine. At the center of the back wall is a huge gate with a scryer placed before it. Activating this will cause a metallic thud and low screech as the cursed carbon-carved doors sway open, allowing us to proceed to our ultimate goal. Now, with fixed focus and determination of this extraterrestrial terrain within minutes of our grasp, we march sternly along this final stretch of lattice walkway, passing between two lamp posts at the mid and onward to the Shrine of Celestial Spoils. A circular stone structure seemingly supported by a monstrous and swollen tube of piled writings. Sharp and simple arches form bizarre balustrades along the outer edge. A tentacle column vines skyward, seething silently with viridian vitality. Pure knowledge courses upwards as venomous green vapor, above which writhes the vilely vivacious void, spewing and spawning seas of succulent and eternally searching tentacles of the golden eye Hermaeus Mora. At the base of it all is a plinth holding a beating black book, but we will return to this in a minute or two, as there is a ripe feast of curious random leveled loot to be plundered and plucked. Firstly, the altar to the right of the black book. This lays claim to a meagre smattering of items, including a few specks of ruined books, which are as useless as ruined books. Funny that. There is also a filled grand soul gem boasting a beautiful value of 500 gold, along with a scroll of ebon flesh, which is worth 250 gold. Not bad. Now using this will cast said spell, which will increase the caster's armor rating by 100 points for 60 seconds. Now the altar to the left of the black book bears a bit more of a bountiful selection. There are a few piles of ruined books to ruin our day, but at the leftmost edge of the slab is a scroll of grand healing, which has a value of 250 gold once again. Naturally using this will cast said spell, which will heal the dragonborn along with allies close by for 100 points of health. To the right of this scroll rests two 
black soul gems. One is unfilled and the other pulsates with anima of the soul trapped within. On the right side of the altar is a filled grand soul gem ready to be used to imbue an iron dagger for the purposes of power leveling enchanting. And on the rightmost edge of the stone is another papyrus. This is a scroll of paralyze which has a value of 250 gold. Using this will cast said spell and will paralyze foes who fail to resist for 10 seconds. Interestingly, this scroll of Paralyze can only be found in one other place within all of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim and all of its DLCs, that place being Mazulft. The second place it can be found right here, or now more accurately in my back pocket. But this rare scroll is rather reminiscent of the scroll of Stormthrall that we found within the Soul Cans Curating Curious Curiosities episode. Anyway, to the left of this altar there is a container known to contain copious booty. This is of course the ever-prized vessel. Within it we can find a pair of glass gauntlets, and as we know, people who wear glass gauntlets shouldn't throw stones. In here though, there is also a copy of the book titled Bone, Volume 2, authored by Tavio Dromio. This is the second and final volume in a duology explaining the invention of bone mold armor. In here we can also find a copy of the book titled Cleansing of of the Fane, or also known as the Chronicles of the Holy Brothers of Maruk, Volume 4, which has no known author. This is essentially fragments of a script written by a member of the Elysian Order. We can also find a copy of the book titled Flight from the Thalmor, authored by Ashad ibn Khaled, High Scribe of the House of Quills in Hammerfell. This is the written epitaph of a Nord Skald named Hadric Oakenheart. In here, there is also the sum of 185 gold pieces, some nice pennies to pinch. Now there is also a copy of the book titled History of Raven Rock, Volume 2, authored by one Lirin Teleno. As the name may have hinted, this is a historical documentation of the history of the once East Empire Company mining village on Solstheim known as Raven Rock. And finally, we can also find a petty soul gem that is unfilled, but I'm sure we can find some meddlesome fool to put within it. And now that our pockets are bursting at the seams with plunder, we may turn our attention to the nexus of knowledge that rests before us, the Black Book, Hidden Twilight. When we ever so daring peel back the heavy corroded cover and peer into the cacographical cacophony of coded calligraphy, three orbs will muster from within and rise up taking full blinding form, hovering ethereally inches above the cryptic pages of the black book. Three spheres of forbidden knowledge, three rewards for us to choose between, gifts from the guardian of the unseen Hermaeus Mora. On the left levitates Mora's agony, whose description reads, summons a field of writhing tentacles that last 30 seconds and poisons foes who enter it. This is definitely the most offensive ability of the three, having clear uses and damaging enemies with a rather nice AOE effect or area of effect effect, perfect for placing in a doorway or something of the like, for your enemies to come sprinting through to get you, but in reality they'll be the ones getting got. Now in the middle is Mora's Grasp, whose description reads targets are frozen between Oblivion and Tamriel for 30 seconds and immune to all damage. This ability is purely defensive and will immobilize and immunize everything around you for 30 seconds, giving yourself time to heal and recoup or run away. But a dragonborn who runs is, well, fit probably. The effects of this power are similar to the become ethereal shout, but of course, for your foes and not for you. And on the right rests Mora's boon, whose description reads, fully restores your health, magicka and stamina, which despite that description isn't actually true, although I'm certain it will fulfill the promise, as this actually restores 1000 points of health, stamina and magicka. 
but for a character to have such huge resource pools is unlikely let alone them being depleted beyond 1000 points. So as mentioned, Mora's Boon will most probably fulfill its promise unless you have colossal health, stamina, and magicka. With that said, this could be a very welcome power to possess for those playing on higher difficulties. So, make your choice, Dragonborn, as activating any of these orbs of Forbidden Knowledge will transport the Dragonborn back to Solstheim. So, with that, we have completed the exploration and curation of our third Pocket of Apocrypha, the Black Book, Hidden Twilight, the third of seven Black Books. Our next curious, cautious, and soon-to-be-shrouded steps on this journey begin within the ancient Nordic ruin of White Ridge Barrow, where, hidden deep within White Ridge Sanctum, we can find sealed away the Black Book, Sallow Regent. Upon touching this book, we will be transported to a section of Apocrypha with the same name, Sallow Regent. Before we take our first wandering gazes, however, if we look at the Black Book, Sallow Regent, within our inventory, we'll learn that this was written by someone called Horfip the Crafter, who has not been known to author any other manuscripts. Contained within is only one readable page of text, as with all black books. The passage accessible reads as follows. Act 1, Scene 1. Enter Philomena with broken scepter. Philomena, dash dash. Woe betired my fate-wrecked heart, which gives no tender shine to he, who gave his favours up to gods and brought this blood-struck mind to me. At which point we can read no further, sadly. But what forbidden knowledge does this black book's apocryphal realm have to teach? Well, let us find out. This crypt of apocrypha is located within an infandus abyss, hosting a depth of incalculable proportions, a catacomb of cosmic confusion, as we find ourselves once again in the shadowed chasm, with shade that eats mortals, a place one cannot comprehend beyond it simply being an infinite haze to darkness. An ashen shade of grey sets the fathomless backdrop of an unending cosmos, never filling, yet always being filled, a black hole for scriptures, novels, ideas, concepts, and prophecies alike. Minarets formed of cobbled manuscripts and scrolls sprout from the Abaddon like colossal fungi, sporing and spawning in endless reaching growth and from endless beginnings. Nurtured on knowledge, watered with esotericism, and enriched by Daedric powers beyond mere mortal synapses. Fear this realm as we might, we will conquer this space regardless of its sacrilegious scope and setting. For there are bountiful, hidden, and forbidden teachings to be pried from its crags, mortises, paragraphs, and punctuations. So, when we first arrive here in the Sallow Regent, we'll find ourselves at the beginning of a Vanta Black vestibule. Infinite volumes line the walls, or rather are the walls. Lost papers litter the ground, a pool of mucidic muck laps eerily. Yet, we are safe thanks to the hovering light bearer protecting us from the nightmarish void ahead. Above, a totem stands proud with a font of stamina at its crest, as torn pages whip and whirl around and around. It's the only sound we can hear, and while harmless, it is in no way a comforting one. Next to the pond of putridity rests a pod, ripe and ready for rummaging. In here, we can find a copy of the book titled 2920, Volume 11, Sun's Dusk, or fully titled Sun's Dusk, Book 11 of 2920, The Last Year of the First Era, authored by Kalovak Townway. This is part 11 of a series of 12 that relate the historical happenings of Vivek and the Empire at the end of the First Era. And although within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim there are 12 books in this series, within the Elder Scrolls Online an additional 15 were added, making the series 27 books in total. In here we will also find 16 gold, and a copy of the book titled Nerevar, Moon and Star, which while in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim has no named author, thanks to 
previous titles, such as The Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, we know this book was written by the very same Kalavak Townway. This is an imperial scholarly work on the legend of Indoril Nerevar, hero of the Dunmar, the Dark Elves. Interestingly, this book can only be found in one location as well as bought from Urag Groshub in the Arcanium at the College of Winterhold, making this find quite rare indeed. And finally, we also have a potion of Minor Magicka, which may just come in use within this hideous hall. Now we may press on. Above the way forward hangs a banner glowing in pulses with the dreaded sigil of the Prince of Fate, Homeus Mora. While a light bearer does scoot swiftly up and down this passage, it's hardly a safe journey, as there is no light here, only the deathly darkness. So be quick on your feet and track the hovering lifeline, or provide your own light through torch or spell. Once we emerge unharmed, we'll find ourselves in yet another room similar to the one we started in. A lamp post stands, bathing the surrounding area in supreme solace, casting its warm lambency onto our cold flesh. Several light bearers also dart and linger above our hair, helmets and hoods, brightening this pocket even more so, giving us respite in this maleficent maze. The petite puddle of toxic sludge is almost entirely filled with the ever-gazing eye of the master of the tides of fate, Daedric Prince Hermaeus Mora. Glaring, blinking glacially, observing every action within every distant corner of this wretched bibliotheca. Now behind this omnipresent peeper, cloaked in shadow tucked into a rayless ingle nook is yet another pod, only to be picked by the most daring adventurer, willing to risk with flirting on the edge of light and darkness, just to pry open the ghastly jaws of this pod within which we can find some random level loot, no doubt, such as a copy of the book titled Deathbrand, or fully titled Deathbrand, A Pirate's Tale, authored by Artis Dralin, a house redder and scribe. This tells the final times of a famous Nord pirate named Hackneer Deathbrand, who can be found in game, and I do have full guides for his unique armor set and his two blades, Soul Render and Blood Scythe find those on my channel if you're interested, but reading this book will also begin the quest titled Death Brands, provided of course you're not already on the quest or you have not already finished the quest. Now below this we can find a tiny sum of 11 gold pieces, along with a potion of illusion. Be sure to take it to a healer immediately as this illusion is ill. There is also a greater soul gem in here too, which is filled and ready to be used in the art of enchanting. We also have a copy of the book titled The Posting of the Hunt, which has no known author. This is a document announcing a ritualistic hunting of a mortal by Daedra. It is also a terrible book to collect as it loses value over time, as in The Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind it was worth 200 gold, then in The Elder Scrolls 4 Oblivion it was worth 85 gold, and now in The Elder Scrolls 5 Skyrim it's worth 25 gold. So if you've got one, sell it now. In here, we also have a copy of the book titled The Wolf Queen, Volume 8, authored by one, Wagon Yarth, a notable Breton writer whose works we've seen before here in Apocrypha. This particular text is Volume 8 in a series of eight, which is known as an Octology. But this series recounts the life of Queen Potamus Septim of Solitude, better known as the Wolf Queen. And finally in here we have a Novice Robes of Alteration, which would find use with a Novice Alteration favouring mage, but for me, and for most of us I think, it will serve as market fodder, and will be sold immediately upon returning to Mundus. Now, before we move on through this twisting ant's nest of narrow tunnels bricked of unread novels, we'll look up to the tortured canopy cast in dust and dusk. We'll notice light bearers zooming about their business, but you may have spotted something uniquely curious about one of them, as a gargantuan ship of honey light soars through the highest of altitudes, illuminating mountainous arms of forgotten ledges. This breed of light bearer is unique to the apocryphal pockets of the Sallow Regent, a massive, swollen, mega light bearer. 
its purpose is not quite known, nor why it's up so high, as it would be ever so useful down below, here where we tread. As, you know, nothing against its average sized brethren, but a light source of this scale would cast immensely more light, and would almost guarantee our safe passage through these sable streets. Next to the Dragonborn, a normal light bearer looks like this. It's about half or a third of the height of the Dragonborn across. Whereas this mega variant is possibly five times the size of its normal cousin, almost the same height as the Dragonborn, and even bigger in width than the mighty Dovakin is in height. Like some kind of deep sea jellyfish from another planet, or in this literal case, even more alien, as it is from a different dimension altogether, floating seemingly aimlessly, but with a distinct and set route, a path that it follows and circulates over and over, into infinity like all light bearers. And while this giant object or creature is unique to the Salo Regent, we will see a handful of others throughout our stay here, which I will point out when we come across them. For now though, we'll leave this colossal drone to go about its business, dancing high up in the steeples of scripture and scroll. Now though, it's time to push through the curtains of cold black death that cloak night chilled network. We'll move through a short hall before turning right up a steep ramp. An incline inked in a mort absence of visibility. There is a light bearer every now and then that races swiftly up the passage. Staying within its basking glow is difficult but life saving. You can of course use your own sources of light such as a torch or with a candlelight spell. Once we emerge from the darkness, well, we'll still be in darkness, just slightly less so, as we wander out into a reaching gallery of books piled so high they seem to fade into the chasm above or below, as we don't really know which direction is where. Just able to be made out is a huge void portal of tentacles slithering and searching for any new academic tokens to be gathered and stored in the never ending nexus of knowledge. Now as soon as we exit the rampway, if we turn to the left at the base of an ever so comforting lamp post, we'll see that there is a pod. Inside of it we can find a sum of 18 gold pieces, along with a copy of the book titled The Chunax Fire and Faith, which has no known author within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. But thanks to the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, we know this book to be written by an Achunak, who was a notable Dwemer believing in the teachings of Kagranak's theories. This text follows Nechunak's journey among the Dwemer and his attempts to understand the teachings of Kagranak. In here we also have a potion of minor healing, not that helpful to us, but great for healing children, or people that dig tunnels. In here we can also find a petty soul gem, sadly this is unfilled. But along with this there is also a lesser soul gem that is filled, and ready to be used to enchant a dagger, I mean what else do you do with soul gems? There is also two copies of the book titled The Poison Song Volume 1, just as I was beginning to miss these books. Here pops up two at once, what a lucky duck. These are of course authored by the most mentioned character after Hermes Mora in this video, the classic Bristin Zell. This is of course part one of a seven part series that is an epic and historically inaccurate saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth, as you may have suspected. And finally we can find a copy of the book titled The Real Baron Zaya, Volume 2, which has an anonymous author, but we know in lore that it was written by one Plitinius Mero, an imperial savant who can actually be encountered within the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind's expansion tribunal. Now this book is part two of a five book series, which is known as a pentalogy. Interestingly, within the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall, this series was originally a 10 book series, but has been condensed to 5 in later games. This book is an unauthorized biography of the famous Queen Mother of Morrowind, Baron Zaya, Kalaya's grandmother. Also curiously in the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall, there was a passage that described an explicit adult scene in which it is revealed that Khajiit men have barbed 
ding-dongs, and I'm not talking about their doorbells. This was removed in later games and replaced with the memo, this passage has been censored by the Order of the Temple. So I shan't go into detail as I would not want to lose good faith with the temple. But with Khajiit cactus dongers out of the way, we may proceed to inspect this vast and forlorn gallery of guile gilded gauntness. Now, while it is easy to become bewildered, bewitched, and entranced by the shadow sanctum of shrouded sorcery, with alien towers and brilliant dancing lights, we must focus now or perishes prey to the penumbral enemy, the darkness. So, in the northwestern corner of the room, directly across from the passage in which we entered it, we can spot in a dim light two hideous golden statues of unknown depiction, standing side by side as sentinels, at the base of which are two plinths bearing offerings, with waist-high piles of books cluttering the peripheral edges of the altar, now the stack of texts on the left bears a coloured and rather enticing tome. This here is the spellbook of the alteration spell Detect Dead. Reading this will teach you the spell of the same name, which when cast will allow you to see undead enemies and allies through walls. Next to this on the leftmost plinth, we can find some ruined books along with a copy of the speech skill book titled 2920, Volume 5, Second Seed or fully titled Second Seed Book 5 of 2920, The Last Year of the First Era, authored by Calavac Townway. This is part 5 of a series of 12 that relates the historical happenings of Ivec and the Empire at the end of the First Era, and although in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim there are 12 books in the series, as I'm sure you know now, there are an additional 15 books in the Elder Scrolls Online, making the series a whopping 27 books. Oh, and of course, reading this book for the first time will increase your speech skill by one point, provided you haven't read it before. This is a boost I definitely need to finish this script. Now, on the plinth on the right, we will find more ruined books, aka any book you lend my brother. Now, also here, we have a soul gem. This is a petty soul gem, and it is filled and ready to be used. There is also a scroll here. This is a scroll of Conjure Flame Atronarch. Using this, we'll cast said spell and summon a Flame Atronarch for 60 seconds to fight alongside the caster. Now, along with all of these presented goodies, there is actually a much more obscured gift between the two plinths in the form of a pod. It's not super hard to spot, but it would be easily missed by the speedy adventurer trying to get through this chthonic pocket with haste. Inside of it, we can find a blacksmith's potion, naturally increasing one's weapon and armor improving by 20% for 30 seconds upon consumption. In here, we can also find the tiny little amount of 12 golds. Not much to write home about, but you haven't spoken to your parents in a while, so you might as well anyway. There is also a petty soul gem in here that is currently unfilled. We can also find a copy of the book titled The Madness of Pelagius, authored by someone known as Sathenes. This text profiles the renowned Mad Emperor, Thoris Pelagius Septim, also known as Pelagius Septim III, and of course, Pelagius the Mad. And finally, within this, we can find a book titled The Real Baron Zaya, Volume 3, which has an anonymous author, but we know that in the lore it was written by one Plitinius Mero, an imperial savant who, as you already know, you can actually meet in the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind's Expansion Tribunal. Now this book is part 3 of a 5 book series, which in the Elder Scrolls 2 Daggerfall was originally a 10 book series, but has been condensed to 5 in later games. This book is an unauthorized biography of the famous Queen Mother of Morrowind, Baron Zaya, Kalia's grandmother. Now along with all of these bits and pieces, there is also something unseen, lurking in the shadows, only to be found by the boldest adventurer, willing to risk the consuming shadow. As behind the plinths and pillars, hiding out of sight like a shivering mouse in a cat owner's homestead, Lying on the ground next to the pod is another scroll. This is a scroll of candlelight, which upon use will create a hovering light above the player that lasts for 60 seconds. 
No need to mention that this will come in great use within these wicked halls of torturous tenebrosity, providing a life source for the Dragonborn to traverse unharmed. For a time, of course. It's also interesting to mention that the Scroll of Candlelight can only be found in two other places within the game, those being Calcemo's Library and in the Tower of Mazark. So rather curious that we can find one here, but then again, Apocrypha does contain all known knowledge. Well, most of it. At least that which Shomaeus Mora can get his ha mm, tentacles on, I should say. Finds like this just make me wonder what other curiosities are tucked away in occult alcoves and unreached recesses buried within this realm. Uh, now, if we gaze upward at the mesmerizing and measureless miasma muddled mausoleum of manuscripts, we'll notice a huge shaft of light that beams hastily across the onyx inked vaults. This is produced by the second Mega Lightbearer, which is located behind the most terrifyingly scaled bulwark of butchered books with a gap the width of a single codex column, which allows the monstrous rays cast to filter through and dance across the forlorn gallery. We already know of the oddity that this is, with its abnormally large size and all, so we shan't harp on it for too long, as we've already covered one of its larger kin. Regardless, the fact it exists at all is a curious notion nonetheless. Now, we may boondoggle cautiously through the forlorn gallery, straining our eyes in attempts to peer into the pierceless darkness before us, as misshapen swaths of decaying light canter across the void before us, revealing pugnacious problems amidst the knavery blackness, as through the bosks of books lay Octopian Daedra, seekers, meditating eternally, waiting for foreigners like ourselves, as so they may test their unorthodox arsenal of obscure occultism. So be sure to unsheath and display your largest lantern and longest sword to tread safely through this treacherous trench of total tonalless twilight. But before we slink into the safety of the lamppost on the far side of the gallery, there is something we must inspect. As in the southwestern corner of this moonless mortuary, we can see faint glows of light like fading stars at the edge of the universe, resting below a zephyrinely waggling banner bearing the hideous mark of old Thermomora. With the power of light, we will see that there is in fact an altar here, harboring rather predictable items as usual. But there are some strangenesses here to pique our purient probing of oblivion. A smattering of ruined books linger like receipts in a wallet. There are also two soul gems. One is an unfilled grand soul gem, which we'll be happy to fill with some foul hellspawn from this realm. Accompanying it is a filled black soul gem ready to be used. It's also important to note that if your character's conjuration skill is level 40 or higher, unlike my character, a copy of the spell tome Conjure Seeker will also be found here. Using this will teach you the appropriate spell, which will allow you to summon a seeker to fight for you for 60 seconds. As I have already noted before, it is important to note that this spell is not affected by the Twin Souls perk for whatever reason. Nonetheless, a welcome addition to our magic arsenal as it will be nice to put these annoyances, the Seekers, to use and not be battered by them for once. But before we go on, there is one more thing. As if we look behind the altar in a tiny gap between the stone block and the book-bound buttress, there is another soul gem, hidden and almost impossible to reach with our hands. This is an unfilled lesser soul gem, and almost certainly not worth the effort of collecting, but I'm sure that like me, you just can't help it. Curious that this would be here. Did a developer put this here, or perhaps it fell? Hmm, I'm not sure, but with that rather literal hidden gem, we can begin to make our exit from the forlorn gallery. 
as we move between the two lampposts like a portal to the greener grass on the other side we'll notice that there is actually a pod resting on the ground like pleasantly placed shrubbery in this wild wood of forbidden files inside of it we can find some random level loot consisting of 19 gold pieces there is also a copy of the book titled Nerevar, Moon and Star, which while in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim has no named author, thanks to previous titles, such as the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, we know this book was written by the very same Kalavak Townway. This is an imperial scholarly work on the legend of Indoral Nerevar, hero of the Dunma, the Dark Elves, and the person that our character in the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowinds, the Nerevarine, is the reincarnation of. Interestingly, this book can also only be found in one other location as well as bought from Urag Gro Shub in the Arcanium at the College of Winterholt, making this find quite rare indeed. And finally, in here we also have a copy of the book titled Romanada, scribed by an unknown author. This is a fragmented and mythical recount of the alleged conception of Riemann and the return of the Chim El Adabal with the people of Tamriel. But now that we've pilfered these goods, we may absquatulate and move forward. Now, passing between two lampposts, we begin our ascent up the ramp shadowed in a hungering darkness. Following a darting light bearer is the only provided way of surpassing such a hurting hurdle. Although of course we can use our own means of illumination such as the classic torch or an alteration spell such as candlelight. Once we exit this tunnel, however, we will emerge into the most fantastic and fractured fuliginous forest, an infinite chasm, populated with indefinably tall columns forged of nothing other than the building blocks of Apocrypha, books and scrolls, standing like the trunks of trees in a wilderness within a giant's world. Lamp posts dot the leather-bound bark like glowing mushrooms. Strings of ladders form walkways like spider's webs between branches. Totems of stamina sprout like vivid wilderflowers as poisoned pages tumble above like vernal pollens released to spread their sorcerous seed. From varied sources, both indefinable and unknown, luminous pockets of this abstract and abaddon abashed woodland glow in amber, emerald and indigo, painting an atmosphere rich with a chromatically enchanting and mystical prismatic palette. Light bearers dart between the megalithic masts like fireflies, illumined spectres gliding through the soupy air of the dense underworld underwood. Floating through the colossal fictional fingers are also three mega light bearers, the last we'll see here within the Black Book, and in all of Apocrypha for that matter. We know their special qualities at this point, but worth mentioning as they are ever so curious, unique to this area, and rare within this area. So, as we wander out into this willowy wonderland, we will be consumed by darkness. As we push forward, a lattice petal will unfurl like a night-blooming flower, creating a bridge for us to cross, where we will find a small platform that is normally entirely engulfed in shadow, but thanks to a torch, we can now see it fully. Over against the tremendous tendon of text, surrounded by littered pages, is the Altar of the Edge. Light bearers will occasionally patrol through here, but personal illumination is most certainly the way to go. And by way to go, I mean the way to avoid an agonizing, torturing death via darkness. Now placed upon the cracked marbled sheet is a variety of items for us to inspect. Firstly, a handful of ruined books clutter the corners. Who saw that coming? But most interestingly, there is a copy of the Restoration spell term, Fast Healing. Using this book, funnily enough, will teach the Dragonborn the Restoration spell, Fast Healing, which when used will heal the caster for 50 points. Which, now that I think about it, could in fact be another way to traverse the unlit passageways of this realm. You will just have to heal yourself faster than the void consumes you. 
Also here, we can find one filled Grand Soul Gem ripe for the picking. And finally, on the left of the altar, we can find a scroll of Dead Thrall with a handsome value of 500 gold. Of course, using this scroll will allow the caster to reanimate a dead body permanently to fight for you. This only works on people, by the way. Perhaps we can use this scroll on ourselves to help us get through this anathematized district. For now though, we'll push on through the final Gossamerian gauntlet. Now we move on up the next set of decrepit stairs, then passing through a stone arch, we'll be faced with a lurker, always truculent towards trespassers. Shame we can't just shout it off the edge due to its enormous stature. That would be so fun and so satisfying, sending it off to lurk below in whatever unimaginable black hole lies below. As always, and as you can probably imagine, this area is dusted in darkness. There are some light sources that linger in patches of respite, but come prepared to be nibbled by the nightfallen niggler that gnaws ad nauseum. Beyond the lurker is another retracted lattice petal. As we approach it, it will unfurl brilliantly and conveniently granting us passage to otherwise unreachable platforms. While resting in the lamp post circle of safety, we will turn and see the violent ascent before us shrouded in death. Light bearers do intermittently float nearby, but they are of no help. Only a mortal with a self-sustained light source or a very big health bar can pass through this penumbral portico. At the top of the ramp is a large lattice terrace encasing central pillars of piled papers and publications. Rather fittingly, lurking behind the small spire is a lurker, living up to its namesake. Naturally, be wary and ready to rend this wretched foe back into the void streams of oblivion. But now we climb the ultimate zygomorphic ziggurat, like Zwada zealots and zealotrixes zombified on the zestless zeal of zany zeitgeists as zeroized zemeroths zigzag on zawa swapped zephyrs we summit the zenithal nexus two tentacle columns burst from the floor surging with sardonic toxic green energy behind which rests a palatial treasury plump with piquant plunder a light bearer rocks to and fro above the patio providing phosphorescence allowing us to peer upon the two altars vessel and black book that await us in reward for completing this cheerless chapter. Firstly, we will inspect the altar at the back left, dotted with ruined books and a smattering of soul gems. Here we can find two black soul gems, one is filled and one is unfilled, and they are balanced out with two greater soul gems, one of which is filled and the other is unfilled. Now, the altar at the back right is stained by the presence of two ruined books, but there is also a scroll of Conjure Storm Atronarch, which has a value of 250. Of course, using this scroll, we'll cast that very spell and will summon a Storm Atronarch for 60 seconds to fight alongside the caster. But there is also a copy of the spell term Flame Thrall, a very rare and sought after book with a value of 1260 gold. Reading this will teach the Dragonborn the spell Flame Thrall and add it to your magical repertoire. Now this is a special spell as casting it will summon a Flame Atronarch to fight alongside the caster. However, it has no duration and will stay by your side until it is killed or turned. It is also incredibly rare and can only be found out in the world right here where we find it within Apocrypha. The only other way to learn this spell is to complete Phineas Gester's Conjuration Ritual spell at the College of Winterhold, which requires at least a Conjuration skill of 90 to acquire and complete. So finding this book right here for the taking, well it may seem easy now, but after what we have been through, this sporadic mystical manuscript is a most fitting 
reward. But adding to the wondrous windfall, we have a plump and bulging vessel between the black book and the altar on the left side. Inside of it, we can find a copy of the book titled Bone, Volume 1, authored by Tavi Dromeo. This is the first volume in a duology explaining the invention of bone mold armor. Below it is a copy of the book titled The Fall of the Snow Prince, authored by one Lockheim, chronicler to Chieftain Ingildir White Eye during the Morethic Era. This is an account of the Battle of Mosring, the final battle between Yskrimor's forces and the Snow Elves. <laughs> we know how that turned out. Along with these books, we can also find one garnet, which is a gleaming gem that has a value of 100 gold. In here, we can also find 59 gold pieces, which is 10 short of being pretty funny. There is also a copy of the book titled Songs of the Return, Volume 24, or fully titled Songs of the Return, Volume 24, the first tale of the Krillot Lock, written by an anonymous author. This tells parts of the traditional legend of Yskrimor and his 500 companions. And despite being Volume 24, there are only five volumes found within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, the highest number being Volume 56. So who knows how many volumes there actually are? Also worth noting that this is one of four locations within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim and all of its DLCs where this book can be found. But up next, look at this, it's our long lost friend, a copy of the book The Poison Song Volume 7, authored by one Bristin Zell. This is part 7 in a series of 7, which is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. In here we can also find a copy of the book titled The Seed, or fully titled The Seed Ancient Tales of the Dwemer Part 2, authored by one Marabar Sul. This is the second book of a seemingly incomplete series of fictional stories about the Dwemer. And in here we have something that I am interested in, an Amulet of Dibella, which increases speech by 15 points. So this is something we need to put on, so that we can venerate Dibella by performing scandalous acts. And finally in here we have a pair of elven gauntlets. But the true prize awaits us, the Black Book of the Sallow Regent. Now that we're fearless after passing through the hellish nightmare of this apocryphal pocket, we can tear open the thick, hideous covers and peer upon the paradoxical pages. When we do this, three orbs will muster from within and rise up like the Nords, taking position perched above the dancing dialect below. Three spheres of forbidden knowledge, three rewards presented to us brave champions. On the left is the Seeker of Might, whose description reads, 10% more effective combat skills, 10% improved smithing. This actually increases attack damage, block amount, tempering health, armor rating, and of course, the smithing skill. An obvious choice for those who deem themselves as mighty warriors or seasoned smiths. At the center is Seeker of Sorcery, whose description reads, all spells cost 10% less magicka, enchantments are 10% more powerful. This does exactly as the description reads, making it a wonderfully powerful choice for any spell chuckers or those who consider themselves skilled enchanters. And finally on the right we have Seeker of Shadows, whose description reads, stealth kills are 10% more effective which living up to its theme is the sneakiest of all, with the simplest description but the most complicated effect, as it actually modifies both selling and buying prices, armor rating, pickpocket chance, lock picking sweet spots, sneak skill and boosts alchemy effectiveness by 10% also. So with its sneakily hidden stats, it may not be so obvious, but with some research, it is a tantalizing addition to any sneaky folk or alchemist. So make your choice, Dragonborn, as activating any of these orbs of forbidden knowledge and booning oneself with the power will transport the Dragonborn back to Solstheim. 
So with that, we have completed the exploration and curation of our fourth pocket of Apocrypha, the Black Book, the Sallow Regent, the fourth of the seven Black Books. Our next scholarly steps on our forbidden pilgrimage begins within the ancient Nordic tomb of Bloodskull Barrow, within which is a secret chamber cut into its deepest recesses, where we can find locked away the Black Book, The Winds of Change. Upon touching this, we will be transported to a section of Apocrypha with the very same name, The Winds of Change. But before we take our first determined and curious steps, however, if we look at the Black Book, The Winds of Change, within our inventory, we will learn that it was written by someone known as Lysel Greyheart, thought to be a Nord and who has no other known publications. Contained within it is only one readable page of text, as with all Black Books. The passage accessible reads as follows. During the reign of El Greer, I took notice the various patterns of in the thoughts and behaviours of a troubled populace, and undertook a humble plan to comprehend and, in the end, affect them. Being of ordered mind, I began my taxonomy in the lower classes, which divided evenly into those who, at which point we can read no further, sadly. But what forbidden knowledge does this Black Book's apocryphal realm have to teach? Well, let us find out. The Winds of Change is one of the smaller fragments of Apocrypha, delivering us to a singular island lost in the Viridian venomous ocean that sloshes peacefully and haunting through the hollow air. A realm that, thank the Nine, is not situated in the infinite depths of oblivion, but instead on its surface. While still a completely alien setting, it is at least somewhat more terrenially reminiscent of home of Mundus when compared to the chthonic depths that we have endured so far. Before us is a large structure towering like a mutated monastery for manically mind-numbed monks to mull. It's a chantry of charred and unchanted verses and sermons, erected in a forgotten and forbidden corner of oblivion. But let us seize our wonder and phantasm of the mysteries of this citadel, and let us begin our quest for knowledge and conclusion of the winds of change. When we arrive here, we'll find ourselves on a rather ornate and neat pier, a narthex of prelude, a path to the mission before us. Lamp posts light our way along the lattice webbings, forged of an unknown and corroded alloy, as the mucilaginous muckmire undulates below. Torn pages pepper the promenade, some rustling gently in the soft breezes of the heavy, stale air. Huge, cephalopodic eyes rise in slow motion, blinking dawdlesomely harvesting observations for the Lord of Secrets, old Hermaeus Mora, as he is ever watching, ever knowing. Soon we will ascend up two tiers of ancient stone steps, passing plinths ripe with ruined books. After we mount the stairway, we'll arrive at the Hermit's Henge, an open area with five plinths, four in a ring and one offset in a corner. At the centre of the ring is a small pond of that meddlesome ooze, no doubt harbouring cruel tentacles waiting to whip and wallop any who venture too close. Now, the northern plinth bears nothing more than a librarian's sorrow, a scattering of ruined books. It's also important to note that if your character's conjuration skill is level 40 or higher, Unlike my character, a copy of the spell term Conjure Seeker will also be found here. Using this will teach you the appropriate spell, which will allow you to summon a Seeker to fight for you for 60 seconds. As I have already noted before, it is important to note that this spell is not affected by the Twin Souls perk for whatever reason. Nonetheless, a welcome addition to our magic arsenal. The Western Plinth presents similar besotten books, but there is also a soul gem that can be found here. This is a common soul gem, and it is filled too, ready to be utilized in the arts of enchanting. Now the Southern Plinth is stocked with, you won't believe it, ruined books, 
but thankfully also carries a soul gem, which is a lesser soul gem filled with a soul of the appropriate caliber, of course. Now the Eastern plinth displays, who knew, ruined books, but also has a much more useful pile of pages alongside the useless, mold-riddled manuscripts around it. This is a copy of the book titled Arcana Restored, or fully titled Arcana Restored, a handbook, authored by one Wapna Nustra, Preceptor Emotus, which I believe is a rank for the reasons we'll get onto in a second. This book is filled with cryptic instructions for the restoration of Arcana. Now, interestingly, this book was one of the few books within the Elder Scrolls series to be introduced in 1997's An Elder Scrolls Legend Battlespire, in which there is actually some additional text on the first page, and I quote, Arcana Restored, a handbook by Wapna Neustra, Preceptor Emeritus of the Imperial College. Which is what leads me to believe that Preceptor Emeritus is a rank or title within, of course, the Imperial College. No idea why that was removed in later iterations of the book. Anyway, just to the southeast of the Eastern Plinth is the fifth offset plinth. Guarding it is a seeker. Hands raised and clenched, seething with the forbidden magic of oblivion, as telekinetic waves of energy emit from the center of its head, suggesting this seeker is currently performing some form of scrying ritual, the likes of which are too esoterically obscured for my mortal understanding. But in front of this meditating monstrosity is the fifth plinth, upon which are two tomes of interest that call this surface home. On top, we can find a copy of the book titled Walking the World, Volume 11, or fully titled Walking the World, Volume 11, Solitude, authored by one Spatior Munius. As the title may have suggested, this book is a comprehensive description of the city of Solitude. Now, despite it being Volume 11 of the Walking the World series, there are no other volumes to be found within any of the Elder Scrolls games. So how many parts are there in this series? Well, that's just unknown. Now, underneath this book is a small green book, which is titled Rise and Fall of the Blades, written by an anonymous author. This tells of the history of the Blades, their origins, and their eventual fate and demise. But unlike the Blades, we will move forward. Ah yes, now just to the northeast, a coin's toss away, is a locked gateway. Before it stands a scryer. Naturally, activating this will lower the orb and unlock the barred slammer, allowing us to venture into the fretwork canopy twisting venel. As soon as we enter through the stone arch, to our left we will find an altar, atop which is a smattering of ruined books, which is ironic really given this place is meant to store knowledge and not destroy it. Anyway, there are also two soul gems resting peacefully here too. We have an unfilled lesser soul gem, which I am sure will put to good use later on, and the other is a filled grand soul gem. Quite a find. Now, as we follow the twisted passageway around to the right, we'll see that the next gate is sealed shut. So we'll need to find a way to pry this open and split that ghastly octopic sigil mockingly blazing on the upper quadrant of the tarnished metal. Now, if from this gate we turn to our left, we'll meet a lattice wall, beyond which is a celestially lit nook that we will no doubt be heading to. In fact, we will do that right now. We just need to retrace our steps a little and pass around the separated barrier. But as we do, we'll notice that there is a pod to our left. Inside of this, we can find a very small sum of eight gold pieces, below which is a copy of the book titled Nerevar at Red Mountain, which, while the title page is blank within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, we do know that it was written by the Tribunal Temple, thanks to the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind. This is a scholarly description of the events occurring before, during, and after the battle at Red Mountain. It is also worth noting that this can only be found in one other location in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim and all of its DLCs, which is within Telmithrin on Solstheim, the Telvanni Tower. 
In here, we also have a potion of Minor Magicka, which will restore 25 points of Magicka upon consumption. Not much. We also have a copy of the book titled The Cabin in the Woods, or fully titled The Cabin in the Woods, Volume 2, authored by one Mogan Son of Molag. This is a tale of a soldier and a sobbing ghost, and appears to be a sequel to the book titled The Woodcutter's Wife, as it is similar in theme and written by the same author. The Woodcutter's Wife is also called Volume 1, and The Cabin in the Woods is Volume 2, so you do the maths there. In here is also a copy of our long lost pal, The Poison Song Volume 6, authored by none other than Briston Zell. This is part six in a series of sevens, which, as you may suspect, is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. And finally, there is also a copy of the book titled The Song of Pelinal, Volume 6, or fully titled The Song of Pelinal, Volume 6, On His Madness, which has no known author. This codex describes the ponderings of Pelinal Whitestrake's madness. But now that we have plundered that pod, we may progress into the lattice-locked nook that we spied earlier by the gate, dug deep into the dunes and mounds of scrolls, ink and parchment is an archaic stone altar lit mystically by the pulsing, diseased effulgence of the font of stamina mounted on the wall. Atop this here grounded stone slab, we can find a handful of ruined books, and one soul gem. This is a filled grand soul gem, which is as good as they get. Well, that's not quite true. Black soul gems are better, but um, anyway. To the right of this altar, we can see there is a fleshy fount, which is, as we recognize instantly by this point, a scryer. Activating this will set back the rusted lock on the gateway that stopped us earlier, allowing us to access the further canals of the winds of change. So pressing deeper, we pass through the gate and will immediately be met by an abomination, a Daedra, a seeker, armed and ready to pry our knowledge by any means necessary. As is in their fashion, that method will likely consist of mind screeching, telekinetic blasts and manipulations. So naturally deal with this foul spawn in whichever way you see fit. But now we pass through a curved tunnel forged of a cracked stone floor and walls and roofs that bend into one, cobbled together with books, scrolls, diaries, manuscripts, novels, sealed messages, and no doubt mold. We gain a sense of being inside something much greater than ourselves, like the esophagus of a great beast as we travel upwards searching and clawing for the light of day once more. Just before the end of the passageway, we will see there is yet another scryer resting on the right in front of the masoned arch, a bit like a tonsil that we can tickle to open the gate ahead, which is like the mouth to cough us out into the open air, if one could even call it air. Only Hermaeus Mora knows what we're breathing, and he doesn't tell. And I don't think I actually want to know. Anyway, once that alloy sphincter has been dilated, we will exit out into a grand courtyard, stained a toxic green by the ever-raging maelstrom above. At its center stands proudly the more vile Daedra of this realm, the Lurker, on guard and ready to smite intruders with their ghastly arsenal of musific attacks and abilities. To the left of the Lurker is an eroded framework ramp, leading up to a higher platform. Up here we can spy and gather an assortment of curious goods. On the plinth to the left we can find a soul gem nestled between two scrolls, huddled between a wall of ruined books, resting like an egg in a bird's nest ripe for the plucking by any such predator with such a taste. And oh, we have a taste. This is a filled black soul gem, the most valuable and useful soul gem. Besides, of course, the Daedric artifact Azira Star, but that does not render this filled black soul gem anything to be snuffed at. Now, both of these scrolls are the same, as we have two scrolls of Frenzy. Of course, using them will cast the Frenzy spell, 
sadly, a very weak one at that, as creatures and people up to level 8 will attack anyone nearby for 60 seconds. These will naturally find no use to most players, especially those advanced enough to be treading through the Forbidden Plane of Apocrypha. However, they do have a value of 100 gold each, so they can make some use if we take them back to Mundus and deploy our silver tongues in the art of mercantilism with the shopkeeps of the land. Moving on to the plinth on the right, there is also a smattering of ruined books, with one scroll amongst the tattered pages and dog-eared covers. This is a scroll of fear, which much like the frenzy scrolls, won't be of much use to us, as using it will force creatures and people up to level 8 to flee from combat for 30 seconds. Not very impressive at all for seasoned adventurers like ourselves. Interestingly though, on the ground behind this plinth, resting up against the corner where the flooring meets the stone skirting, is yet another scroll of fear, just as unimpressive as the last. Magnifying this disappointment, these fear scrolls only have a value of 50, which much like 3.6 Ronken, it's not great, but it's not terrible. But it is still only half the value that those equally lackluster frenzy scrolls have, so the only thing to fear with these scrolls of fear is just how useless they are. Now, at the back against a bayview window crafted of lattice is a stone altar. Upon it are some ruined books, or as I now call them, yawn inducers. <sighs> But there are also two soul gems and a book. Both of these soul gems are black soul gems. One is unfilled, which is still incredibly useful, and the second is filled, which is even more useful and valuable for any who don't plan to utilize such an item with the enchanting skill. Now, between these magical gemstones is a copy of the book titled Words and Philosophy, or fully titled Lady Benock's Words and Philosophy authored by one Alina Benock, who was a Bosma Blade Mistress, master of Valenwood Fighters Guild, and a member of the Imperial Guard. Now this book is essentially a retelling of her life in the format of an interview. And while all this loot is well and good, let's get to the centre of it all. Literally, as at the centre of it all is a scryer just begging to be activated. Doing so will unbolt the gate, sealing the ornate gazebo that rests at the back middle of this conclusive courtyard. Finally, we near the end of this realm. But as we circle around like a reaper's scythe to a swathe of field crop, we'll see that the path ahead is blocked yet again. The stairs we must climb are attracted into the wall, forming an impassable bulwark. Luckily though, for the keen-eyed explorer, and honestly even toddlers could figure this one out, just beyond where the foot of the steps should be, there is, would you believe it, yet another scryer. And of course, much like an actual scryer in augury terms, we can soothsay what activating this will do. That's right, extend that beautiful stone causeway, so we may climb up into the surging cell above. An auspicious atrium, lined with crude yet intricate lattice arches. At its center is a tentacle totem, standing rigid, raging, a sluggish emerald emanation, in the form of vile virid vapor coursing into the nefarious firmament overhead. Surrounding it is not a vault of wondrous rewards, as we may have become accustomed to by exploring other pockets of Apocrypha. There is, of course, the Black Book that we will rend cabalistic boons from soon, and by its side is the only source of physical treasure here, a vessel, inside of which we can find a pair of orcish boots of dwindling frost, impressively increasing our frost resistance by 40%. We will also find a copy of the book titled Darkest Darkness, written by an anonymous author. It contains detailed descriptions of various daedra. We can also find a core bundle of 55 gold pieces, much less than we would expect from a vessel. Along with this is a copy of the book titled Songs of Skyrim, authored by one Gerard Germain, historian of the Bard's College, Solitude. 
This book, as you may have very inquisitively guessed, is a compilation of popular songs within the Nordic province of Skyrim. There is also a copy of the book titled Songs of the Return, Volume 24, or fully titled Songs of the Return, Volume 24, The First Tale of the Krillot Lock, written by an anonymous author. This tells part of the traditional legend of Yskrumor and his 500 companions. Stashed in here, there is also two petty soul gems, both of which are currently unfilled. That's the problem with these things, they just have no soul. Oh, but speaking of soul, we can also find a copy of the book titled The Poison Song Volume 1, authored by Briston Zell. This is part one in a seven book series, which is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. Who would have guessed? And finally, we can lay our hands on the bottom of the barrel where we'll find an iron armor of minor destruction. Nothing to write home about, but great for obliterating children. Ah, but now we may turn our attention to the true gift. A costly blessing from Hermaeus Mora. As our sanity wanes in this maddening hellscape, we find focus in reaping our reward. As we slowly approach the pulsing, rotten volume presented before us, the Black Book, The Winds of Change. As we grip the wood hard covers and force open the taboo tome, the arthritic spine creaks as cryptic ciphers and symbols shimmer across the pages. In the same instant, three magically mint orbs rise up before finding their place of rest, many inches above the open black book. Three spheres of forbidden knowledge, three rewards presented to us brave champions. Firstly, on the left is Scholar's Insight, whose description reads, reading skill books gives you an extra skill point. This is potentially a very powerful blessing to boon oneself with, although it will find most use to players who have not yet read most of the skill books throughout the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. So, to any seasoned dragonborn who has travelled the ends of the earth, this scholar's insight will fall on already skilled eyes and be mostly wasted I would imagine. Secondly, in the middle is the Champion's Insight, whose description reads, Your attacks, shouts, and destruction spells do no damage to your followers when in combat. I'm sure we've all killed Lydia once or twice by accident, or on purpose, or another cherished follower. This blessing will protect your followers, a fairly decent choice for all players, but not necessarily a must-have. Especially if, like me, you don't really ever use a follower. But if you are interested in such an effect, it is worth noting that followers will still be damaged by your area of effect skills and can still be damaged normally if you are not in combat. So this champion's insight is only effective when in combat. Also, thralls are not protected by this. And if you are unlucky enough to hit your follower with Mayrun's Razor and the instant kill effect triggers, your follower will still perish on the spots by your very hand. Which is interesting, because this protection to your followers is a blessing of Meus Mora, but the instant kill effect on Mayrun's Razor is a power from Mayrun's Dagon, which overrides Hermaeus Mora's power. Does this mean Mayrun's Dagon is more powerful than Hermaeus Mora? Hmm. Dunno, I'll be sure to think more on this. Uh, never, actually. So anyway, please keep all of that in mind when choosing this champion's insight. It's not quite as good as it sounds, but even then, it's pretty good. So thirdly and finally, on the right, we have Lover's Insight, whose description reads, do 10% more damage and get 10% better prices from people of the opposite sex. This is possibly the most widely useful and widely applicable choice for all Dragonborns, as throughout your entire gameplay this will constantly be helping you along the way, as you'll always be trading with people of the opposite sex, and you'll always be fighting people of the opposite sex 
from level 1 until you are a level 1 billion and become the godhead. And that is also the case for every single playthrough. Therefore, I definitely think is the safest bet. Now, interestingly, this effect is a combination of the speech skill tree perk called Allure, which gives 10% better prices with the opposite sex, and the active effect called Agent of Debella, which grants 10% more damage to members of the opposite sex, which is gained by completing the Heart of Debella quest for the Temple of Debella in Markarth. So overall, they are all decent options of varying gameplay styles, but if in doubt, I'd suggest choosing the Lover's Insight. And boy oh boy, do we all need a bit of Lover's Insight. So make your choice, Dragonborn. Activating any of these orbs of forbidden knowledge and booning oneself with their power will transport the Dragonborn back to Solstheim. So with that, we have completed the exploration and curation of our fifth pocket of Apocrypha, the Black Book, Winds of Change, the fifth of seven black books. Now our next chaos cinched exploratory revelations on this journey of ours begin within the ancient frozen cavern in the north, known as Ben Kongereich, I think, where buried deep within the hibernal crypts of the Ben Kongereich Great Hall, we can find sealed away the black book, Untold Legends, fully titled Untold Legends, The Other Lives of Ysgromor. Now, upon touching the book, we will be transported to a section of Apocrypha with the same name, Untold Legends. But before we take our first mesmerized steps, however, if we look at the black book, Untold Legends, within our inventory, we will learn that it has no known author. Contained within is only one readable page of text. As with all black books, the passage accessible reads as follows. As the great ships of men crawled the waves to their destinies, there were, after long years, a number of tales lost in the mists of mourning. Even after the forgetting though, wisps of story find ways to receptive ears as even the deepest of secrets never truly dies. When fires burn and the night grows soft in, at which point we can read no further, sadly. But what forbidden knowledge does this black book's apocryphal realm have to teach us? Well, let us find out. Untold Legends presents before us a stretching kingdom of accursed structures drenched in sullen Maya-like fog. This section of Apocrypha offers a vast and labyrinthine terrestrial catacomb of hallways and passages, rooms and tombs, horrors and wonders. A seemingly endless garden of obscure constructs littered confused and bemuddled, floating in the bubbling and blistering chartreuse sea that shimmers like gangrenous petroleum. Coruscations glitter across the corrosive concoction like fireflies through the mists at eve's fall in untrodden morasses as lashing tentacles whip and thrash from the oily ocean, making the previously formidable hedge maze of mesmerizing mezzanines and monuments appear as it truly is, which is the path of least resistance, despite being a daunting joint, no doubt. But we must cease our wondrous caution and transmute it into a brave perseverance, as so we may begin our quest for knowledge and curation of the apocryphal realm of untold legends. Once we arrive here, we will be at the end or start of a long hallway lined with books and caked in crumbling stone. As we pass between two hideous golden statues, beaming bright with fonts of magicka in their carved alien mouths, we'll begin a descent, loitering lower into the sallow aisle. Halfway down, the ramp takes a turn to the right and continues to linger lower and lower. At the base, the alley continues to the left, but to the right we can find our first altar. Dotting its shabby surface are a number of ruined books, five to be exact, but here also lie three soul gems of varying value, status and state. On the far left there is a filled grand soul gem, primed with the soul of an unfortunate foe ready to be turned into an iron dagger enchantment. In the middle is an unfilled greater soul gem, perfect for us to sap the sad soul of some soon to be sorrow filled sucker. And on the left is a filled common soul gem. Again, I am sure this will find great use in power leveling one's enchanting skill. I mean, 
What else is enchanting used for? But from this altar, we will push onwards, continuing to follow the vestibule that we have stayed true to thus far within this perilous place, where we'll find ourselves at the top of a steep stone stair, leading down to a well-walled lookout, which peers out onto a grand gangway just begging to be explored. At the center of the vista window between two ichthyic totems is an open black book. Touching this will transport us to chapter two of Untold Legends. After activating the chapter, we will find ourselves across the way and standing on that very grand gangway. A series of narrow book spires sprouting out of the murky and musific Moana, forming support beams for the stone architecture that grants us a passage to more hidden corners. After a short walk, we'll pass through this splendid and uncluttered archway, but be warned, Dragonborn, as rather fittingly, lurking around the corner is a lurker. Who could have guessed? Depending on your level, this could be one of the more foreboding variations, so be warned, this will be a battle whose tale may linger on in scratches and dents in your armor. While not an uncommon enemy, they are not to be taken lightly. The only fight you should take lightly is with a candle. Now, beyond this loka, the Grand Gangway will lead us to a crossroads, a T intersection of lattice ramps. For us, we will be heading firstly down to the right, where at the end of the Radiant Pier is two fonts of Magicka, scorching our eyes with their almost blinding emittance of cold ice light. Just a stone's throw away is an open black book. This will take us to Chapter 3 of Untold Legends. After touching the tome, we will be teleported onto the very aforementioned islet, a raised open-topped tower cornered by huge columns of cobbled compendiums. Golden statues stand hauntingly in abnormal profusion, glaring down into the ancient cracked cell. Against one of the walls levitates a seeker, who will be an immediate threat as soon as we translocate to this islet of isolation. So as always, be prepared to duel against this Daedra, as the only thing it's currently seeking is trouble. Against the wall, overlooking the location that we just came from, there are two lamp posts, standing sentinels on either side of the open black book that will take us back to chapter two once we're done here. But firstly, on the back wall of this petite stone room is an altar, the top of which is decorated with a mundane scattering of ruined books, one soul gem, and a pod. This is a filled greater soul gem, and will find great use back on Mundas, so be sure to pocket this precious gem. It's also important to note that if your character's conjuration skill is level 40 or higher, unlike my character. A copy of the spell tome Conjure Seeker will also be found here. Using this will teach you the appropriate spell, which will allow you to summon a seeker to fight for you for 60 seconds. As I have already noted before, it is important to note that this spell is not affected by the Twin Souls perk for whatever reason. Nonetheless, a welcome addition to our magic arsenal. But now to pry open the tight jaws of the pod within which we can find a diamond, which, unlike me, is flawless, granting it a massive value of 1,000. We can also find a very small sum of 17 gold pieces, below which is a copy of the book titled Herbane's Bestiary, Ice Wraiths, or fully titled Herbane's Bestiary, The Ice Wraiths, authored by one adventurer named Herbane. Unsurprisingly, this is an all-you-need-to-know guide about ice wraiths aimed to better educate other adventurers and curious zoologists. In here, we also have a scroll of mayhem, which, you know, sounds epic and all, it has a rather healthy value of 500, but when used, it will force creatures and people up to level 12 within 250 feet to attack anyone nearby for 60 seconds. A cool effect, but if we are being honest, which I rarely am, this most likely will never find use to anyone who is a high enough level to be delving the deepest depths of the forbidden and challenging plane of oblivion apocrypha. But I can assure you there are plenty of merchants back on Mondas who will happily pay a pretty penny for this roll of paper, so it might just cause some mayhem in the local economy. Apart from that, it won't be living much up to its name. And finally, just to brighten our day, here is nothing other than a copy of the book titled The Poison Song, Volume 1, written by the one, the only Bristin Zell. 
Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for Briston Zell. This is part one of a seven-part series that is an epic and historically inaccurate saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth, which is proving to be some maddening knowledge. But before we go bloody bonkers from too much mind-crushing knowledge from our old pal, Briston Zell, let's move on. We'll have to turn back to the open black book and teleport back to chapter two. Once we arrive, back from whence we came, we will travel over the hills and far away, as we have quite a trek before we reach something quite special. So up the ramp and down the other side we go, at the bottom of which between two lampposts is yet another open black book. Using this archaic edition will transport us to chapter four, the origin of which is high up on a magnificent dais, which yawns open and narrows into a single central tunnel that once again leads us to lower levels of this plane. Now, after quite some walk through the stockpiled halls of scripts and scrolls, we will emerge into a most wondrous courtyard known fittingly as the Lock Labyrinth. Great swaying shafts of unnatural book formations burst and grow from the stone foundations of the preternatural plaza. Like gargantuan grass blades stricken by plague that dance to a tectonic breeze too outer dimensionally xenophilic for any mortal like us to perceive. Intricate latticework structures, stairs, levels and gateways sit cemented into the forbidden stone loam. At the heart of our gravel grave garden stands eminent and erect an unholy presbytery, barred for the time, for it is our task to gain access to this restricted gatehouse, which is comprised of beautifully crafted, complex, latched mechanisms. The walls of this cloister are stamped with deep-rooted doors and gaping nooks of compendium-composed alcoves. Skittering servants litter the ground, daedric seekers that comb, tend, and study. But most of all protect the colossal, convoluted clockwork lock to which our intellect is the key. So let us begin pricking back the pins and pushing our probes delicately and deep into the sealed latches of the lock labyrinth. The first movements we must take after we enter the ambivalent arena is to go to the right where we will find a set of stairs that leads up into an open and welcoming crevice, at the back of which rests a pod bathing in moderate shadow, keeping to itself. Now while we haven't ever seen a locked pod with an apocrypha, well this one still isn't locked but that feature is unique to this pod when it comes to the Lock Labyrinth and the pods within it, as we will discover in the coming minutes. For now though, inside this pod, we can find a copy of the book titled Flight from the Thalmor, published by Ashad ibn Khaled. This is the written epitaph of a Nord Skald named Hadric Oakenshield. Below this, we can find a copy of the book titled Galerion the Mystic, authored by one Asgrim Kolsgreg. This is a biography of Vanus Galerion, an Ultima Sigic Order member who left Arteum and went on to found the Mages Guild. In here, we can also find rattling around inside a meager sum of 11 gold. We can also find a copy of the book titled Nerevar at Red Mountain, which while it has a blank title page within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, we know that it was written by the Tribunal Temple thanks to the Elder Scrolls III Morrowinds. This is a scholarly description of the events occurring before, during, and after the Battle of Red Mountain. Also worth noting, as I did earlier, that this can only be found in one other location within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim and all of its DLCs, which is within Tell Mithrin on Solstheim. In here, we also have a common soul gem that is currently empty and ready to be filled, along with a grand soul gem that is filled and ready to be used. And finally, to make us feel right at home, we have a copy of the book titled The Poison Song, Volume 3, written by someone I've, I've never heard of before. Briston Zell? Never heard of that guy before. Weird. Anyway, leave a comment if you have heard of him. He'd probably like that, wouldn't he? Bloody Briston. This is, of course, Volume 3 in a seven volume series that is an epic and historically inaccurate saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. Now from this pod, we are going to exit this little stone pocket and head straight ahead across the courtyard and up the opposite set of steps into the banner blazon corner 
brightly illuminated by the searing green ferocity sprayed forth from the front of stamina mounted on the back wall, underneath which is an altar, presenting various treasures and items of interest and value both monetary and educatory. The outer edges are caked with ruined books, in the middle rests two soul gems. Firstly is a filled greater soul gem, primed and ready for the arcane arts. Secondly is a filled black soul gem, pulsing vivaciously with the victim stirring soul of a sorcerer's spell. There are also four notable books here. Firstly is a copy of the Light Armor skill book titled The Rear Guard, authored by Tennis Morrill. This is a tale of how a lone man guards a besieged castle and the methods in which he obtains his food for survival. Naturally, reading this will increase your Light Armor skill by one point, provided you haven't read it before. Secondly is a copy of the archery skill book titled The Golden Ribbon of Merit, authored by one Empyrean Brum. This is a tale that tells of a man who tutors his old friend in marksmanship, or as it's simply known in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, archery. Of course, reading this will increase your archery skill by one point, provided that you have not read it before. Thirdly, we can find a copy of the lockpicking skill book titled Advances in Lockpicking, written by no known author. This tells of an experienced thief who summarizes the intricacies of lockpicking. Naturally, reading this will increase your lockpicking skill by one point, provided you haven't read it before. And fourthly and finally, underneath the big green book that we just flicked through, we can find a copy of the pickpocket skill book titled Beggar, authored by one Revin. This is the first in a fictional four-part quadrilogy known as the Adventures of Eslav Erol. Now, interestingly, the name Eslav Erol is false lore when spelled backwards, which seems appropriate for a fictional character. Nonetheless, reading this book will increase your pickpocket skill by one point, provided you have not read it before. Now, just across from this altar of curious manuscripts is a pod placed peacefully in the corner. This pod is particularly interesting as it is actually locked with an apprentice level lock. The first time in all of our travel through Apocrypha that we have seen a locked pod, the likes of which are unique to this lock labyrinth. Inside of it, we can find a copy of the book titled A Dance in Fire, Volume 5, authored by one Wagen Yath, a notable Breton writer, having 25 publications under his belt. This entry in particular retells a clerk's adventure through Valenwood, home of the Bosma, the Wood Elves, and is part of a seven book series known as the Heptology. In here, we can also find a laughable sum of 19 gold pieces, along with a potion of minor healing, great for fixing music that sounds very sad. We can also ever so luckily find a copy of the book titled The Poison Song Volume 2, authored by a star guest, Briston Zell. This is part two in a seven part series, which is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. But I'm sure you knew that already. Below this, we have a weak aversion to shock, which is an attribute that you'll have after watching this video. And finally, we have a pair of leather boots of waning shock providing a 30% increase to shock resistance, also something that you'll need to make it through this movie. Now, from this little crevice in which we have become so enriched in skills, we must make our way back into the courtyard and then travel to the opposite corner, all the way down and all the way across to the inverted edge of the plaza, weaving between withered pillars and dunes of books that have gathered in corners like sand blown astrew across a weathered and worn desert-dwelling ruin. Soon, on the right, we'll meet a set of stone steps that lead up into a little dim den. At the back, we can find another pod. This time, it will have a novice level lock. Within it, we can find a copy of the book titled Dwarves, Volume 3, or fully titled Dwarves, The Lost Race of Tamriel, Volume 3, Culture and History, authored by a man we can meet, Calcemo, the Scholar of Markarth. This is the third part in a trilogy of scholarly work on the Dwemer. This volume in particular, as the title may have spoiled, details the culture and history of the Dwemer. Below this, we can also find a rather eye-rolling sum of 17 gold pieces. And oh my word, what is this? I never thought we would see something like this. 
a copy of the book titled The Poison Song, Volume 6, authored by the mystical figure themselves, Bristin Zell. Wow, we are ever so lucky to find this, as it is part six in a seven part series, which is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. <laughs> I'm, I'm almost stunned, it's truly crazy that we found this here. And finally, within this pod, we have a copy of the book titled The True Nature of Orcs, which has no known author. This book details the Orzma race and their origins. Orzma are, of course, the Orcs. But now, from this little den that we've trod, we will now make our way to the gateway next door, where, up the stairs and in front of the sealed arch, we will find a scryer. Activating this fleshy mechanism will make those hinges sing and swing open the infernal alloy doors. Inside this little room, some hideous fish-like statues gather at the back, where at their base rests another scryer. Touching its glowing ball will make it sink down and close, but when one door closes, another opens, as directly across the courtyard, the opposite facing gateway will be unlocked. Naturally, of course, we must now leave this little room and travel to the other side, over and around the perverse presbytery that remains barred, and up this newly accessible collection of rock cobbled steps, where we will enter yet another dusky cell, where at the back is another scryer. But before we get to that, just beyond it, in a corner that we have just passed, there rests a pod the likes of which we will have to work to get open, as it has an adept level lock on it. Once we pry its deep sea jaws apart, inside we will find a scoffable sum of 19 gold pieces, below which is an unfilled grand soul gem, ready to be used by a sick soul-stealing sorcerer. And by the nine divines, is it our lucky day or what? Would you just look at this, a copy of the book titled The Poison Song Volume 5, authored by none other than the one and the only Bristin Zell. It's stunning to learn that this is part five in a seven part series, which is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. And by Azura, by Azura, by Azura, we have part seven as well. I won't bore you with the details of this one. Oh, oh, fine, if you insist. Well, this is a copy of a book titled The Poison Song Volume 7, authored by a personal hero of mine, Bristin Cell. And I can hardly believe that I get to tell you again that this is part seven in a seven part series, which is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. Isn't that just so fun? But anyway, below these two great strokes of luck, we can find a copy of the book titled The Song of Pel Pelinal, Volume 4, or fully titled The Song of Pelinal, Volume 4, On His Deeds, which has no known author. This gives a brief overview of some of Pelinal Whitestrake's greatest deeds. But now that we've had our song even more poisoned, we may turn our attention to the penultimate scryer that rests just behind us. Activating this little baby will set back the impenetrable bolts and unbar the accursed gateway that previously prevented us from entering the central chamber of the unholy presbytery at the center of the Loch Labyrinth. And now we may move amazed and enchanted into the heart of the Chthonic Shrine, bearing statues and golden figures of fishy-eyed motif, lit brilliantly with the cool lambency spilling from the magical orbs plastered in the mouths of these alien effigies. At the nexus of this forbidden shrine rests one simple device, one we all know well. That is of course a scryer. Daringly, as we push this organic lever down into its socket, the second gate will swing wide, and beyond which, atop a throne-like castle of stone steps, the final ultimate gateway will breach. A gateway that leads us to another gateway of sorts. In triumph, we have solved the Loch Labyrinth of Apocrypha, but our journey is far from over. Now, as we climb this final incline, we will enter an esoteric chamber, never intended for mortal minds or souls. 
we'll find it is a circular library, a study tower lined with the works that time has forgotten. There are only two things in here, an open black book, which will lead us to the final chapter of Untold Legends, and to its left we'll find a vessel. An end of dungeon reward, but it's not at the end, but a most fitting blessing after completing one of Hermaeus Mora's ancient and devilish puzzles. Within this vessel, we will find a steel helmet, but I think we've rightfully earned this. I wouldn't consider it stealing. Below is a copy of the book titled Confessions of a Dunma Skooma Eater, with no declared author in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. However, in the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, it is known to be authored by one Tilsi Sendis. This is a narrative recount of a cured skooma addict. You know, the most boring kind of skooma drinker. In here, we can also find a copy of the book titled Fall From Glory, authored by one Nethilis Lidari. This text contains various theories in regards to the weakening of the Skyrim Thieves Guild, and it is definitely weakening, as it used to be monthening. In here, we can also find an all right sum of gold with 113 pieces. Below this is a copy of the spell tome Flames. Using this will of course teach you the spell Flames, which when cast will spray a gout of fire that does 8 points of fire damage per second. Targets on fire will also take extra damage. But this spell tome is quite literally the most useless spell tome of all, as every single player begins their playthrough already knowing this spell, regardless of race chosen. So to be frank, I'm not even sure why this spell tome exists within the game. Oh, but do not fear, my good friends, as would you just look at this. My jaws dropped. How could it be? How have we become so blessed this day? My hands shake with excitement and my voice trembles, as we have here a copy of the book titled The Poison Song, Volume 7, written by someone with a name so holy that I feel unworthy to utter it. Bristin Zell. I am most honoured to inform you that this is Volume 7 of a seven-part series, which is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. In truth, nothing can ever match this wondrous discovery, but we must push on, as below this is the final piece of random leveled loot, a copy of the book titled Varieties of Daedra, authored by one Ariana Drethen. This is an analysis of Daedra forms, focusing primarily on the Dramora, which is a shame because I'm most interested in the seducers, but uh, that's neither here nor there. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, play the Elder Scrolls Legend Battlespire. Now, champions, we will turn to the open black book at the dead end of our travels, which we must embrace to be teleported onwards to unknown and unexplored solitudinous reaches of Apocrypha. Using this will transport us to Chapter 5 of Untold Legends. Ah yes, now Dragonborn, we will find ourselves at the summit of a long and descending hallway. The last viridescent verses of this chapter await. Vexing vestibules and perplexing passages are present and shall persist to hurdle our heroic odyssey. Once the downward march ceases and the crumbling stone floor levels flat, we will find ourselves within an arched gallery. On either side wall stand steadfast portcullises, proudly padlocked, preventing pesky prowlers like ourselves any form of pleasant navigation through these painted paragraphs. So, it would seem the only way forward is rather literally forward. It all feels a bit too simple as we can even see the black book inside just up ahead. But in an instant the ground shifts beneath us as the arrow straight aisle warps and writhes like a serpent swinging its mighty body to the left before coming to a rest. This will lead us into a gorge of forged and garnered writings from across various eons and planes of existence, perhaps even Kalpas. Soon as we tread exhausted of the trickery here, the noxiously wretched Natatorium sprays open, from which spawns a hulking terror, a demon amongst Daedra, a lurker. But not just any lurker either, a lurker sentinel, even more menacing and treacherous to dance bloody with. 
it will immediately begin an assault for the ages, so be prepared to land your most telling blows or become a lovely little snack for this Bactrician beast. Once the Lurker Sentinel has been slain and our hands throb bloody with its innards, the locked gate at the rear of the gorge will swing open, whereupon we realize the Lurker's life was the lock and its death was the key. A morbid way to ensure resounding servitude in protection of these passages. Now we may follow the revealed path curving around to the left, where soon another gate will rear its barred being. Resting on the floor to the right, however, is a scryer. Activating this mechanism will ease the gateway open, allowing us to wander on through, into a room that we have already been in, as this is the gallery from whence we came not too long ago. The side gate opposite remains sealed and inaccessible. So, the only way forward is once again quite literally forward, down the same chicanerous corridor. Time repeats itself, it would seem, as we jog towards the safety of completion, the whole haunted isle will shift and jolt beneath us once more, throwing us off balance and confusing our eyes for a moment. Soon the slithering slipway will come to a rest. Its open mouth spits us out into a chasm like before, mirrored in fact. And following suit from our previous encounter, the petite polluted pond at the sentinel will bubble and simmer with fury as yet another lurker sentinel is born from the blackened basin. Without hesitation, this barbarous brute will bear down a bludgeoning bombardment of brutal bone-bending bashes. Slay it. And as we know now, its death marks the unlocking of the back wall passage, only being held sealed by the beating heart of the lurker. Progressing through this hallway, we'll meet a similar sight to before as a scryer stands before the latched lattice lich gate. Activating this, as you would imagine, will force open the rotten hinges of this blockade. Well, now, let us hope that third time's a charm, eh? As the only way forward is thrice literally forward down the same deceivingly displayed delve, but now at our most cautious and most aware, this dead straight tunnel will hold true and allow us to carry ourselves to the final end of this accursed realm. Here, at this ultimate alcove, we will find only a black book and the searing tentacle totem behind it, spewing thick, glowing, gilded green gossamer wafts of some bizarre and taboo energy up through the lofty atrium ceiling. Unlike all other ends, there is no physical treasure here, only what is contained within the Black Book, Untold Legends, The Other Lives of Yskrimor. Touching the stale scripture will force it to bloom open, and from the enchanting script, three wondrous orbs of pure knowledge will spawn and hover, humming in unfamiliar frequencies that massage the mind. Three spheres of forbidden knowledge, three rewards presented to us cunning and persistent heroes for solving this cryptic chapter. Firstly, on the left is Black Market, whose description reads, A Dramora merchant spawns for 15 seconds. Now this power is great even at face value, but there are some more details that any Dragonborn given this option will want to learn. The summoned Daedra will purchase any type of item, although he will not purchase stolen items unless you have the relevant perks. He has a gold pool of 2000 septums that resets every 48 hours, and he can be summoned as many times as you like. As with other lesser powers, this is not restricted to a once a day use. He generally sells armor and weapons, most commonly being of Daedric make, providing an easy way for lower level characters to acquire such items. He is also immune to any and all banishment spells or effects. Overall, a great choice that will come in handy for all playstyles, especially if you like the idea of selling on the go. Secondly, in the middle, we have Secret Servant, whose description reads, summons a Dramora butler for 15 seconds to carry your excess items. This lesser power will summon a Dramora butler for 15 seconds who has a total carrying capacity of 148 points. Essentially, this Dramora butler acts as some extra storage. As this is a lesser power, he can be summoned at any time. Anything you give him, he will still be carrying the next time you summon him, and he is also immune to any and all banishment spells and abilities. In my personal opinion, this is a superior option to the black market, as you can give him items that you both wish to keep and wish to sell later on. 
whereas the black market you can only sell. So for me, the better of the two is this secret servant butler, as he is more versatile and will come in handy for every dragonborn. And thirdly and finally, on the right, we have the bardic knowledge, whose description reads, summons a spectral drum that plays for 300 seconds, improving stamina regen for you and nearby allies. When activated, a hovering spectral drum will be summoned that emits music and grants the following bonus. Fortify stamina regeneration rate by 50% for 300 seconds, which is 5 minutes with a 250 foot radius. Honestly, this is pretty powerful and could come in great use for the right playstyle. For example, vampires lack stamina regeneration in sunlight, this will help alleviate such a burden. It could also be used to maintain the steam blast ability called the Breath of Nuchuak, granted from wearing the visage of Bazund as this ability consumes stamina. If you've never heard of it, I do have a full in-depth guide for the Visage of Mazant, a unique dwarven artifact. But the point being that this is very powerful and can be very handy in the right situations. Overall, the best option in my eyes is the Secret Servant, closely followed by the Black Market, and then in last is Bardic Knowledge. So, Make your choice Dragonborn, as activating any of these orbs of forbidden knowledge and booning your blessed self with their power will transport you back to Solstheim. So with that, we have completed the exploration and curation of our sixth pocket of Apocrypha, the Black Book, Untold Legends, The Other Lives of Ysgrimor, the penultimate and sixth of the seven Black Books. And now, my friends, we are at the beginning of the end in our exploration of Apocrypha, the crowning quest in curating curious curiosities. This ultimate mission begins at the heart of Solstheim, within the Temple of Mirak, buried deeper than any mortal should ever tread, locked away in the darkest depths of the maze-like sanctum of Mirak's temple. We can find the Black Book, Waking Dreams, fully titled Waking Dreams of a Starless Sky, resting on a plinth surrounded by unholy flames licking violently around the shrine. Upon touching the book, we will be transported to a section of Apocrypha with the same name, Waking Dreams. But before we take our first steps on this final frontier, we'll inspect the black book, Waking Dreams of a Starless Sky itself within our inventory where we'll learn that this was written by one Bilius Felkrex, an otherwise unmentioned author throughout the Elder Scrolls. Contained within this is only one readable page of text, as with all black books. The passage accessible reads as follows. The eyes, once bleached by falling stars of utmost revelation, will forever see the faint insight, drawn by the overwhelming question, as only the true inquiry shapes the edge of thoughts. The rest is vulgar fiction, attempts to impose order on the consensus mantlings of an uncaring godhead. First, at which point we can read no further, sadly, as it was just getting juicy. It even brought up the godhead. I do believe that's the first time ever, actually in the lore, a godhead's been mentioned. But what forbidden knowledge does this black book's apocryphal realm have to teach? Well, let us find out. Waking Dreams of a Starless Sky is a monstrous segment of Hermaeus Mora's realm apocrypha. It could be considered the heart and mind of this plane of oblivion. It houses utterly unique and truly terrifying things of all mortally unimaginable and unspeakable ilk. The caustic ink oil ocean glistens like necrotic outer planetary blood, eternally disturbed by the lethiferous legions of ferocious, wriggling and writhing tentacles. They spew and squirm in ungodly profusion, like an orgiastic plague from beyond any realm which we wish to have knowledge of, blanketing the septic sea like the deepest horrors of fevered or neurodynic seizures. 
Their shadowed silhouettes dancing diabolically across the heinous horizon, like psychonautical visions of a frightful forest forming figures to be feared, a forlorn fantasy that we wish to soon forget. Gangs of swollen, bubbling eyes wake through the sappy sea. Pernicious and unfaltering stares hollow our soul as old Hermamora gazes into our anima and inspects his new inquisitive intruders, us. But the true bell that rings a note of wonder and galactic awe is the skeletal structures that populate the oozing ocean, an innominable number of fractured shards that represent a shattered fracture of what can only be described as a super city. Immeasurable myriads of soaring cyclopean spires form this mythical megalopolis, stretching beyond what the eyes can see and what the mind can dare to imagine, a vista that makes us question our own senses, forcibly stretching the limiter. Interestingly, here in Waking Dreams we see minarets that bear a motif more akin to what we would generally consider daedric with sharp, simple blade-like spikes and spines. The skies here are tempest-scarred and rage with mindful maelstroms, scorching a green almost too vibrant for mortal eyes. Void pockets tear open in the heavens above, from which more of those loathsome tentacles pierce through the veil of physical reality, prodding and probing tirelessly through the musty atmosphere. But now it is our time to probe and prod these deepest and most forbidden recesses and bravely browse fully the astounding quantity of brimming books in this astrally audacious pocket of Apocrypha, waking dreams of a starless sky. When we arrive here, we'll find ourselves standing on the very same spot as when we first met Mirak. But this time we are unbound by the suppressing spells of seekers and can roam freely. But before we move forward an inch, we'll want to turn around completely as behind us rests an altar, sunken into a small nook in the back wall, atop which we can spy an interesting assortment of seemingly random leveled loots. But of course we have a bundle of ruined books, along with two rolls of paper, two quills rest ready to scribe, and to help with this process at the back edge stand two inkwells but there are also a handful of useful and educational tomes. Firstly, we can find a copy of the book titled Bone, Volume 1, authored by Tavi Dromio. This is the first volume in a duology explaining the invention of bone mold armor. Secondly, in here is a copy of the book titled Thursk, A Revised History, which has no known author in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, but thanks to the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, we know it was written by one Beredit Gestal, who was a Breton bookseller who lived in Thursk and can actually be encountered within the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind's Blood Moon expansion. Anywho, this tome chronicles the Nord Mead Hall of Thursk and focuses primarily on its chieftains. Thirdly and finally, we can find a copy of the book titled The Changed Ones, which also has no known author. This tells the story of how Boethia refuted Trinimac. And if you don't know the story, Boethia ate Trinimac, and uh, when Boethia went to the bathroom next, out came Malakath. That's why that guy never looks happy. And with that, we may now press on into the greeting garden to see what other offerings can be discovered. As we move forward, we'll see to our left a rotund and rather short flat-topped column, behind which, blending ever so well into the cliff of codices, is a pod. Within it, we can find a copy of the book titled Children of the Allmaker, authored by one Tharstan of Solitude, an elderly historian who can actually be encountered within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim's Dragonborn DLC as he resides within the Skull village. This is a book telling of an outsider's accounts of the Skull people. Below this, we can find the chuckle-inducing sum of 14 gold pieces, along with a potion of vigorous stamina, the Viagra of Skyrim. We can also get our hands on this lovely greater soul gem, which has ever so handily been filled for us. But even more lovely is the grand soul gem, that once again is already filled, primed and ready for use. 
In here, there is also the spell tome Oak Flesh. Using it will teach us the alteration spell of the same name, which will improve the caster's armor rating by 40 points for 60 seconds, the most basic of mage armor spells. And finally, in here, we can find a copy of the book titled The Dowry, or fully titled The Dowry, Ancient Tales of the Dwemer. Part 10, authored by Marabar Sul. This is part 10 of a seemingly incomplete series exploring various theories and histories of the Dwemer. But from this pod, we will now travel directly across the courtyard, pushing aside a susurrating whirlwind of stained and vagrant pages, wandering over all the way to the lattice viewing window, where at its pane's base rests in solitude another pod. Inside of it, we can find a frown-forming sum of 19 gold pieces. Below this is a copy of the spell tome Flames. Using this will of course teach you the spell Flames, which when cast will spray a gout of fire that does 8 points of fire damage per second. Targets on fire will also take extra damage. But as we know, every single player starts with this spell, already knowing it. So using this spell tome is impossible and makes it completely useless. So I guess the best thing to do with it is to make it live up to its name and throw it onto a fire. In here, we can also find a copy of the book titled The Adabala, which has no known author, although it is commonly believed that this was written by the demigod Morehouse, the winged bull, as it describes the memories of Morehouse, consort to Elysia and taker of the citadel. Interestingly, the Adabala is one of the oldest written accounts from the first era. Oh, <laughs> but hold yourself, boys, as we have finally found what we all truly came to Apocrypha looking for. A copy of the book, The Lusty Argonian Maid, Volume 1, authored by our hero and saviour, Carassius Curio, who we can actually meet in the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind within Vivek City, as he is an Imperial nobleman and counsellor to the Great House Lalu. If you do go and meet him, be sure to shake his hand for all of us. Now, without getting too much into detail, this book contains short excerpts from Carassius Curio's risque play, which is comprised of many innuendos and euphemisms. Let's just say this not safe for work. Definitely give it a read when you're alone. But oh, by the nine divines and 16 Daedra, would you just look at this? An even more amazing find, a copy of the book titled The Poison Song, Volume 6, authored by the most famous person in this video, Bristin Zell. Incredibly, against all preconceptions, this is part 6 in a series of 7, which is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. And finally in here, we have a Master Robes of Destruction. That's some pretty hot stuff with a price tag hotter than Almalexia herself. But uh, don't tell her I said that. Oh wait, she's dead. I killed her in Morrowind. Ha, <laughs> never mind. But now from this pod, we will turn fully around once more and head back towards those short, stumpy, cylindrical posts where facing the stairs is an altar bearing gifts for us. We have a few ruined books, as you may have expected. There is also a soul gem and a scroll. The soul gem here, true to common belief, is a common soul gem, filled and ready to be drained into a dagger enchantment. The scroll that we have here is a scroll of healing, which doesn't bear much practical or monetary value, especially to highly seasoned explorers of the outer realms like ourselves. Although I might use it to heal my eyes after seeing so many copies of the Poison Song. Now from this altar, we'll turn our gaze across the stinking sea and to the monolithic citadel that is known as the Lacuna Library. Heading up the time-tattooed stone stairs, we will begin our approach to the archway of books, where, centred and presented at the end of the concourse, is an open black book. This will take us to Chapter 2 of Waking Dreams of a Starless Sky. However, before we push on into the foreboding fortification that is the Lacuna Library, we have two curiosities to inspect. Far off and distant into that damning sea of peril from which none can honestly expect to return, but I assure you we will. 
Horizon sets like a seasoned sailor knowing he may not return, we cast ourselves into the remote miasome wet wastelands. The Viridian Tide offers only trepidation in its treacherous vastitude. But out here where none even think to dare travel, there is something monstrous. Beyond any scale we have witnessed or will, this is the titanic tentacle, a leviathan limb, macedonically megaphonic in its mutational magnitude, reaching skyward in proud, unchallenged flails, whipping and waving in directions of all angles, seeking prey to deliver unto its tectonic, supersonic, ship-shattering slams. Although, given there is no viable way to reach this area, and none dare or are even capable of traversing such distant chthonic corners, its purpose or motivations are unknown. While one of a limitless legion of tentacles within Apocrypha, this titanic tentacle does stand as king amongst them all, being the largest of the lot. Even soaring above surrounding scripture scribbled sculptures that sprout from the rotting Icarus Ocean. This kraken proportioned arm of antipathy casts a diminutive figure onto the average tentacles that populate the loathsome lock. We will leave this octopusian anomalous aberration to its titanic tasks and move to our next far flung curiosity. This is something you may have spied with your little eyes. Something beginning with F. Fun. No, <laughs> there's none of that here. Fog. Random fog. For whatever reason, out here in the middle of nowhere, we can find this post, this tiny tower planted into the rippling ooze. And that's fine and all and good, but what is most curious is the patches of hazy blue fog that seem to linger around the base. While we do see this same mist through Apocrypha, we do not see it anywhere else out in this ocean, just here, at the bottom of this random structure. Despite the currents moving beneath, the cloud of vapor is unmoving and clings desperately to the foundations. If we inspect this little post closer, we will see that it hasn't even been finished properly by the developers, with gaps in textures and model. Which is all well and good as no one can even come close to this thing, but then that raises the question, why did they add a bunch of blue fog to its base? Why make a uniquely decorated post all the way out on the edges of the observable plane? That, my friends, is a question cloaked in nothing other than fog. Now that we have thoroughly inspected the oddities located at the furthest edges of this plane, we will make our way back to that ever enticing arch, holding this oh so tantalizing open black book. Touching this abstruse album will transport us into the monumental megalith across the ocean, the Lacuna Library. A hollow super tower beyond structural comprehension, a library of ludicrous and loquacious lengths and longitudes, an arcane Athenaeum of abnormally arranged attributes as archaic and abhuman architecture is anomalously amalgamated into an archive of astral proportions. We stand within a bustling bibliotheca, a cosmic and colossal colosseum of archways form a stone skeleton, while the flesh is filled with scriptures both borrowed and stolen. Beguiling bulwarks of books are bricked in barbaric beauty. As manuals and scrolls are wedged and crammed to create prodigious palisades, chronicles and documents form foreboding fortifications fit only for those filled with fortitude, as the Aeonian arrangements are mind-shattering in their maddened meta-methodology. A crazed and bemuddled mess of the mightiest magnitudes, Forbidden folios of fiction and fantastic fantasy, neighbored with scientific scribbles decrypting reality. A dizzying repository, didactic in intent, yet deadly in mortal practice. Walkways are carved into precarious positions, allowing servitudinous seekers to scurry and slink through the catatonic catacomb of chthonic creation. Lingering lattice webbings are spun like spider's silk, strung and clinging to 
through crumbling corners, forming spindly layers and levels, conjuncting pathways which serve as synapses for zealots to scuttle and lug secrets like cells, moving minerals through a greater being. Platoons of Daedric Seekers hover through the mazed manuscript menagerie, eternally draining and gaining knowledge for their master. Flocks of fleeting, time-worn terms float freely from the shelves and organize themselves into occult orders, then softly slotting back into settled seats, roosting in reticulation. Sedated cyclones of encrypted pages swirl and rustle, waking in and out of existence, coming from and going to unknowable locations of chaotic classification and confused categorization. The ceiling is cathedral-like in motif, as from the framework atrium spills through the sick green light of the surging maelstrom skyward. In truth, this lacuna library is a conduit for transcribing, translating, and transferring material to mental, channeling knowledge through an unpolished firmament to he who sits above. Stored here is scribbled knowledge lost and forbidden, more knowledge than is even known, than can be known by any and all, all but he. He who rules here, the demon of knowledge, the Daedric Prince Hermaeus Mora. So, dearest friends, we will attempt to conquer this lacuna library and be done with our quest with an apocrypha. So, let us begin our arcanely accursed ascent. When we first arrive here, we will find ourselves standing in a waterlogged basement, the inner foot of the fortress. That meddlesome ooze slips and slops with gentle ripples as tentacles wriggle beneath the smooth virid surface. A single light bearer bobs welcoming us with its warm light, a courtesy that will not be continued throughout our journey here. From this spawn point, we will make our weary way up the first few sets of cold, molded stone steps, where on our right, we will find our first point of interest, an altar. Laid upon it is a small handful of items prime for scribing. On the left edge, there is an inkwell full to the brim with black, unwritten words. To pair perfectly with it is a fine feathered quill, next to which is a scroll of fireball. Using this will of course cast a fiery explosion that will deal 50 points of fire damage in a 15 foot radius. Also, targets already on fire will take extra damage. It might find some use or you can do as I would do and sell it later on, or even if you chose the black market power from our last jaunt through Apocrypha. Finally, on the right of the altar we can find a copy of the book titled The Guardian and the Traitor, authored by Lucius Gallus, Fellow of the Imperial Library, year 376 of the Third Era. This tells of a skull legend describing a dragon priest's corruption by Hermaeus Mora, a path we almost seem to be replicating, but hey, who can resist those tentacles? Now from this altar, we will trot up the next set of stairs. But before we continue forward to the left, we are going to head to the right of the stairs, where there is a thin and withered ledge that leads back into the darkness. If we follow this, we will soon discover that at the end rests a pod hidden in shadow. Within it, we can find an unimpressive sum of 19 gold pieces, below which is a potion of minor stamina. Great for when you get tired of chipping away at rocks, it really helps get that energy back for miners. We can also find in here a petty soul gem, which is filled with a petty soul. In here is also a copy of the book titled The Red Book of Riddles, which has no known author, as no one wants to fess up to it because it's terrible. As the name suggests, it is a red book and contains some riddles, really, really bad ones. Below this is a copy of the book titled The Wisp Mother, or fully titled The Wisp Mother, Two Theories, authored by one Matthias Atin. This text essentially explores the various legends regarding the Wisp Mothers. Penultimately, inside this pod, we can find a copy of the book titled Troll Slaying, authored by one Finn, which is actually an easter egg in reference to the band Finn Troll. 
Anyway, as you may have surmised, this is a guide to identifying, fighting, slaying, and collecting fat from trolls. A good read for anyone who wishes to explore the internet. You can never have enough tips for combating trolls. And finally, we can find a Novice Robes of Restoration. A fairly average effect, but a very nice price tag of 513 gold, especially considering its feathery weight of one. But now that we're done with this pod, we may move onwards as the main walkway tempted us to originally. Soon enough, after a short hop and skip, we'll run across an altar and a seeker, one of the many Daedric servants of Hermaeus Mora. Its hideous form hovers mystically, as its writhing mass of tentacle appendages sway wickedly through the tattered linen cloth. Next to this foul sight is an altar with nothing more than one book upon it. But this is no ordinary tome. This is a copy of the smithing skill book titled Heavy Armor Forging, authored by one Sven Two Hammers. This is rather unsurprisingly a text that acts as a guide to creating heavy armor. Naturally, reading this will increase your smithing skill by one point provided that you have not read it before. Fair warning though, this isn't a light read pretty heavy. From here, however, we will slink on past the Seeker and climb up a mere quartet of steps, but our victory will be swiftly halted as we realize the passage forward is blocked, as the next set of stairs is retracted into the wall, preventing us from passing. Well, it would seem that we must find a way to rectify this situation. So, to the left of this receded stairway is a latter strand that stretches across to more cobbled stairs and confused crossroads. At the end of which, to the left, is a most pernicious pulpit, drawing us in as we imagine what unholy text could possibly require such a putrid perch. But before we go in search of forbidden tomes, we will turn to the right, where we'll see a diminishing ledge that slowly winds tighter and tighter in, making this passage quite precarious, as one slip on an ancient loose page or a wrong step on a crumbling lattice webbing and we will plunge downward into the noxious pool of seething chartreuse ooze and hungering tentacles. As this sneak's path funnels smaller and smaller, we will notice that there is in fact yet another pod, hidden similarly to the last. Within it, we will find a copy of the book titled Fae Foken, Volume 3, authored by one Wagen Yarth, a notable Breton writer having 25 publications under his very, very big belt. This is a retelling of the Great Sage, an immortal Breton wizard of legend, Gyron Vardengroat's tale of Arteum, Sigix, and robotic enchanters. We will also stumble upon a petty sum of 14 gold pieces. We also have a potent aversion to fire, aka my pale skin in the Australian summer. Below this, we will find a copy of the book titled The Ruins of Kemel Z, authored by one Rollard Nordson. This is the retelling of an archaeologist's adventure through the ancient Dwemer ruins of Kemel Z. Surprise, surprise. We can also find here a copy of the spell tome, Steadfast Ward, which when used will teach you that said spell. Casting it will increase your armor rating by 60 points and negates up to 60 points of spell damage or effects. So a handy spell to have when facing a battle mage. And finally, do my eyes deceive me? Could it truly be a copy of the Poison Song Volume 7? written by the legendary Briston Zell. Could it possibly be that we have found Volume 7 in a series of seven of a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of a war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth? Surely not. What a blessed day. But then again, where else would we find such a treasured tome other than the Lacuna Library? Well, now that we've been gifted with this poisonous book, we will turn our attention to another genuinely ancient and forbidden tome. As from this pod, we will make our way back over to the pernicious pulpit as we track up the stairs. We will smell a heavy 
and musty odour that grows in strength as we approach the plinth positioned at the edge of the lattice landing. This is one of four cryptic key codices of Apocrypha and is required in unlocking a portal within the Lacuna Library. This is an esoteric volume titled Boneless Limbs, referencing, I would imagine, Hermaeus Mora and his myriad of tentacles. When we take this book, the retracted stairs across the way will extend out, granting us passage further into the hellscape of this plane. Before we push on though, if we look at boneless limbs within our inventory, we will see that it is actually fully titled On Apocrypha Boneless Limbs, and it has no known author. It reads, A writhing mass of heaped appendage, slipping grasp the squirming slick, extend the reach to touch the face, burn the mind, reveal the quick. Truly haunting, but entirely familiar at this point in our travels through Apocrypha, as we've seen a lot of uh, tentacles, you know? Well, we will need this for later on, so be sure to hang on to it. For now though, we will continue on our travels, up the stairs and through the vestibule beyond. After we pass through the unlocked gateway, we will find ourselves on a veranda overlooking the vile Viridian Ocean, from which writhe legions of boneless limbs and rise hideous statues in strange formations lit like exhibition pieces in a ghastly and godless gallery. But on the right side of this overlook rests an open black book. This will take us to chapter 3 of Waking Dreams of a Starless Sky, and the book faces the very location it will take us to, that being the secret spire, a lean fungus-like growth sprouting from the rotten waters beneath. Touching this folio will teleport us into the portentous priory of the secret spire. Inside is a cluttered and claustrophobic chapel criminal to the cardinal laws. Short and stout archways pressed down forming sturdy tunnels and prohibited passageways. Seekers linger in lamentatious rumination, cultivating chthonic considerings, massaging and wearing their minds beyond comprehensive thoughts. Corners are booby-trapped with small ponds of the black ooze with tentacles stirring beneath the oily surface, ready to lash out at any intruders. A truly curious crypt, both provocative and profane. So as we rematerialize after being linearly shifted by the black book, we will find ourselves next to a window, peering back out over the paths that we have trodden. With each step, our minds are sharp and cautious and curious. Almost immediately, we will pass a locked gateway on our right. We'll have to find a way to unlock this, surely. But first, at the end of the short and sunken hallway, we will meet a latticework wall, crowned with a primal rose window. The path to the left terminates shortly after the corner, so we must take the right passage where we will meet a congregation of seekers meditating on mundane murmurations of mystic maunderings. We will pass the Daedra and swoop around the spoiling partition. Upon complete rotation, we will meet a steep set of steps that lead up to the reticent rostrum. Here, we will find ourselves in a small chantless chantry. Placed at the center of the rostrum is an infernal lexicon that we will inspect in due course. But first, we must pillage this treasury of its soon-to-be-stolen goods. Opposite the plinth, we will see nestled back in a nook an altar rests beneath the most strange conjunction of grotesque golden ichthyic figures. Passing through a humming harmattan of time-tanned pages will reveal the specificity of what this altar has to offer. A clutter of miscellany sprinkled across the stone slab before us. Here we can find a common soul gem, which has been filled and currently has more soul than I do. Next to this is a scroll of fast healing. Using this, we'll cast said spell, which heals the caster for 50 points. In the back right corner of the tabletop, we can find three inkwells, ripe and ready for writing. 
Fittingly, accompanying them are two blank rolls of paper and two quills, suggesting that someone or something has been scribbling scrolls here. And finally, we can also find a copy of the alchemy skill book titled Song of the Alchemists, or fully titled The Song of the Alchemists Ancient Tales of the Duema, Part 5, authored by a very familiar Maraba Sul. This is of course book 5 of an incomplete series of fictional stories about the Dwemer. Reading this will increase your alchemy skill by one point, provided of course that you have not read this before. Now before we leave this shrine, we will want to take a peek next to the altar, where we will discover a little pod hiding silently in the darkness. Within it we can find a copy of the book titled Dwarves, Volume 2, or fully titled Dwarves, The Lost Race of Tamriel, Volume 2, Weapons, Armor, and Machines, authored by Kelsemo, Scholar of Markarth, the character that we can in fact go and visit. Now this manuscript is a detailed work on the war, equipment, and machinery of the Dwemer. Below this is a sigh, inducing sum of 18 gold pieces. <sighs> We also have here a potion of plentiful magicka, which if I were in Skyrim I would probably drink accidentally, thinking it was a bottle of water. In here is also a scroll of firestorm. Using it will cast the aforementioned spell, which will release a 75 point fiery explosion centered on the caster that does more damage to the closer targets. And if you do not wish to use such wizardry, it does have a very handsome value of 500 gold. In here is also a copy of My Next Holiday, a book titled The Cabin in the Woods, or fully titled The Cabin in the Woods Volume 2, authored by one Morgan, son of Molag. This is a tale of a soldier and a sobbing ghost and appears to be a sequel to the book The Woodcutter's Wife, as it is similar in theme and written by the same author. Also, The Woodcutter's Wife is called Volume 1 and The Cabin in the Woods is called Volume 2, so wrap your head around that. And oh my oh my, I now understand why this vile vault exists to protect the next two tomes, as we have both a copy of the Poison Song Volume 1 and Volume 7, authored by the now deity, Bristin Zell. These are the sacred texts that are a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagov, holy tomes to be sure. What more could this cloister possibly offer after a find like this? Well, from the left of the altar is a set of stone steps that descend down to a barriered corner, at the bottom of which rests yet another pod. My hands shake at the prospect of what could be hidden within. In here, we will find the sum of 14 gold pieces. Below this is a greater soul gem that is currently unoccupied, but I'm sure that we can rectify that situation later on. Now, as we peer downwards, our eyes swell with tears as we're swallowed by a lachrymose phenomenon. Could it be? Could we be so imbued with unholy luck? Is it truly true that we have here before us both copies of the Poison Song Volume 2 and the Poison Song Volume 6, authored by he who is so exalted I hesitate to utter the name Bristin Zell? We feel that our eyes are deceiving us, as we appear to have found both Volumes 2 and Volume 6 that is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. But now, as we did before, we must turn our attention to an even more spiritually scorching scroll-bound sacrament, the tattered text that sits so sacrilegiously on the plinth perched, scented on the reticent rostrum. This is one of four cryptic key codices of Apocrypha and is required in unlocking a portal within the Lacuna Library. This is an esoteric volume titled Delving Pincers, referencing, I would imagine, Hermaeus Mora and his crab-like appendages, often depicted in mortal carved effigies of the Daedric Prince. When we take this book, the previously locked gate located at the beginning of the Secret Spire will swing open, granting us the freedom to press on with our quest. Before we push on though, if we look at Delving Pincers within our inventory, we will see it is fully titled On Apocrypha Delving Pincers, and it has no known author. It reads, 
Crushing razors, hollow shells, that snap, that twitch, that cinch and rend, to hold the subject bodily, till mind blows soft and life meets end. A truly gruesome work, poetically painting all too familiar aspects of old Hermamora. Well, we will need this for later on, so be sure to hang on to it. From here, we will retrace our steps all the way back to our spawn point within these halls, where we will reunite with the before sealed Lich Gate. Behind it, we will be met by a dead end, although there is a scryer here which clearly indicates that there is something more than meets the eye. Upon activating this trickster lever, the back wall of the alcove will burst forth, evolving with a new spatial dimension, depth. Visually representing how my mind felt creating this video, stretching and warping in unnatural ways. Now we can move on through the newly born but rather lustreless lobby. Soon the flat yet surprisingly firm floor will seize and veer upwards forming a ramped continuation, at the top of which is a foully lit nook, sopping and besotten in a gangrenous and glaring green ghost light gushing from the grotesque lurker-like fetish that is the font of stamina mounted on the back wall, below which is an altar scattered in various scribing tools and their end goals, aka books. Oh, and there's also a soldier. Starting on the left and moving right, firstly we can find a scroll of stone flesh. Using this we'll cast the spell of the same name, which will improve the caster's armor by a rating of 25 points for 60 seconds. Next to this is a flashing soul gem, a lesser soul gem to be precise, filled to the brim with a lively soul, ready to be arcanely enchanted onto a dagger for power leveling. Towards the front edge of the altar we can find a copy of the enchanting skill book titled Catalogue of Weapon Enchantments, or fully titled Complete Catalogue of Enchantments for Weapons, authored by one Yvonne Bien, researcher of the Cyrodiilic magical order, the Synod. This details an actually incomplete list of all enchantments that go on weapons, so in fact, it's not a complete list at all, it's an incomplete list. Of course, reading this book will increase your enchanting skill by one point, unless of course you have read this educational manuscript before. At the center of the table is a piece of charcoal, for putting into toothpaste or whatever people do with that stuff. Given its location, I would imagine that this particular piece is to be used in rubbings or writings. To the right of this is a scroll of fast healing. Using this will cast said spell, which heals the caster for 50 points. Or it's great to use when dancing. Get those heals going nice and fast. And on the rightermost edge of the tabletop are two stacked books. Firstly, on top is a real pleasure to lay our hands on, the embodiment of joy, as we have a copy of The Poison Song Volume 4, authored by a person whose name you will never forget, Briston Zell. I know you won't believe it when I tell you that this is in fact part 4 of a 7 volume series that is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. But trust me, it's true, you can even check for yourself. And finally, below it, much like us being weighed down by the poison song, is a copy of the book titled History of Raven Rock, Volume 2, authored by one, Liren Tileno. As the name may have hinted, this is a historical documentation of the history of the once East Empire Company mining village on Solstheim, known as Raven Rock. But now that we are done inspecting this insipid nook of foul lambency, we can skip on along through the short passageway to the right of the altar. As we osmose through the opening, we will be birthed back out into the rotund rotunda that is the legendary Lacuna Library, but this time into the central chamber, the heart of the bibliothetic beast. Above head, swarms of spellbound scriptures migrate mindfully through the mustily redolent and crushingly humid oblivion air, like spores of existential mold spreading through a mind, 
Cults of Daedric seekers linger in mundane meditation and subdued psychotic cerebration. Heteroclitic honeycomb formations of lattice webbings form extraterrestrially tessellated terraces, lending conceivable and traversable passage to mortal bodies like ours, which is exactly what we will now use them for. So once we enter the Lacuna Library, firstly we're going to make our way out and to the left and follow the lattice ledge all the way to its point of cessation, where plonked perfectly in the furthest back corner is a pod. Within this we can find a flawless diamond, which has a price tag that suggests it contains more carrots than a rabbit god's garden. We will then stumble upon a petty sum of 24 gold pieces that force a meh to slip from our lips. Below this is a potion of ultimate healing. For those of you who really want to dance or completely restore your health, in here is also a grand soul gem, which much like my bank account at this time is currently unfilled. Then we will find a copy of the book titled The Legend of Red Eagle, authored by one Tredane Dren, archivist of Winterhold. This tells of an ancient tale about the invasion of the Reach by the First Empire, starring of course the famous Reachman hero of legend Red Eagle, or Theolan as he is known in the tongue of the Reach. Reading this book for the first time will also begin the quest of the same name, The Legend of Red Eagle. And finally, at the bottom of the barrel, or pod in this case, we can find a copy of the book titled Trap, which has no known author. This tells of a starving man who steals money for food, but pays a high price for his action. And no, he doesn't pay in skooma. This is actually quite a rare book, and can only be found in two other places within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim and all of its DLCs. Also, interestingly, in the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, Trap was a sneak skill book, but it mustn't have had any good tips if it's been stripped of its skill-bearing properties. Now, next to this pod, leaning almost over the edge, is a scryer, which at first glance seems like some kind of booby trap, given there seems to be nothing around but a big drop below. Luckily, that is not the case, but it has highlighted my suspicion of my own constant curious paranoia. When we do activate the scryer, we will see that on a distant wall, there is a sealed gateway that will now screech open, granting us access to whatever hides inside. So naturally, as the booty-hungry, loot-grabbing thieves that we are, I mean, uh, brave heroes that we are, we will stroll on over, utilizing these very precarious, yet very handy, lattice walkways that stretch between curved corners, like a spider's web inside a hollow stump to catch creepy crawlies. And well, this alloy framework web has caught a pest within Apocrypha, us. Although unlike me writing this script, we are not stuck and we will move on into the welcoming alcove, where we will find a rich and ripe reliquary. Two golden statues of unknown material stand proud against the back wall, with stairs leading the way up. Between them rests a vessel lit brightly by the light bearer who hovers above, rendering this reliquary the most luminous of treasuries. Within this vessel we can find ebony armor, which interestingly bears no enchantment, dark days indeed, or ebony days in this case. Below is a copy of the book titled Alduin is Real, or fully titled and fully misspelt, Alduin is Real and he ent Akatosh, authored by one Thromgar Ironhead, a proud Nord. This is a poorly spelled essay from a proud Nord that being P-R-O-W-D, on the difference between Alduin and Akatosh. In here, we will also find a copy of the book titled Confessions of a Dunma Skooma Eater, with no declared author within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. However, in the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, it is known to be authored by one Tilsi Sanders. This is a narrative recount of a cured Skooma addict, something I definitely cannot relate to. Oh, this one's empty too. Hey, Maik, do you have any? Oh, cheers, Maik. Oh, that's better. 
Next, we will find two copies of the book titled Death of a Wanderer, which has no known author. This is a tale of an Argonian's unfortunate venture into a crypt filled with Draugr. Oh, and looky here, a vegetarian's dream, as we have another flawless diamond, which will provide carrots for days. And we will also find a sum of 190 gold pieces, which, you know, feels nice to find an amount of gold that isn't in its teens for once. Also, in here, we can find a copy of the book titled Nerevar, Moon and Star, which, while in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim has no named author, thanks to previous titles such as the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, the best game ever, we know that this book was written by the very same Kalavak Townaway. This is an imperial scholarly work on the legend of Indoral Nerevar, hero of the Dunmar, the Dark Elves. Interestingly, this book can only be found in one other location as well as bought from Urag Groshub in the Arcanian at the College of Winterhold, which makes it about as rare as how I like my steak. Below this we have a grand soul gem, which is currently unfilled, but I am sure that we can rectify this situation in the coming encounters. And finally we can find a copy of the book titled The Oblivion Crisis, authored by one Praxis Secorum, Imperial Historian. This is a summary of events stemming from the assassination of Emperor Uriel Septim VII, leading into, of course, the Oblivion Crisis. But speaking of crisis, let's move on before we suffer an existential one. From this luminous treasury, we will carve our way across the central bridge to the opposite wall, where we will find some more menial treasure before we get our hands on a truly recondite reed. Here rests yet another pod, the calm before the brewing, exploratory storm to come. Inside this pod, we can find a copy of the book titled Amongst the Draugr, authored by Bernadette Bantian, a Breton mage and scholar at the College of Winterhold. A book which details the behaviour of Draugr, drawn from several months spent observing them, their hostility, language and worship of the venerated dragon priests. Below this is a deadly magical poison, perfect for disarming those pesky mages or for selling at market, as it will fetch quite a pretty penny. We can also find 21 gold pieces, along with a potion of extreme magicka, which is fine as I don't like my magicka any other way. Now we will discover a copy of the book titled Songs of Skyrim, authored by one Gerard Germain, historian of the Bard's College, Solitude. This book, as you may have very inquisitively guessed, is a compilation of popular songs within the Nordic province of Skyrim. Beneath this is a petty soul gem, unfilled and ready for the soul of a chicken or something. We also have a grand soul gem, it is also unfilled filled and ready for the soul of an even bigger chicken. In here is also a copy of the book titled The Door of the Spirits, which has no known author. This is an ancestral mantra of the Dunma spirits. Interestingly, while in the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind this book is more common than Skyrim being released on a new platform, within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim and all of its DLCs there are only two other copies of this book, making it as rare as an Elder Scrolls release. And finally, in this petite pod, we can find a copy of the book titled The Tale of Drozira, authored by one Sonia Vett. This tells of a Khajiit father in the grips of Moon Sugar, who gives his child, or cub I guess, a history lesson. But now it is time to write our own history, as from this pod, we will cling tightly to the wall, being sure not to misstep on this lofty lattice leanway, as we crawl along the ledge to the font of Magicka, which spews its attractively Antarctic glow onto a stunted plinth, which bears a wearied and weathered work, the likes of which we've seen before, here in the apocryphal plain of waking dreams of a starless sky. This is one of four cryptic key codices of Apocrypha and is required in unlocking a portal within the Lacuna Library. 
This is an esoteric volume titled Prying Orbs, referencing, I would imagine, Hermaeus Mora and his infinite congregies of protoplasmic eyes that temporarily form and underform, always watching, prying, and piercing the mind and soul. When we take this book, a gate on the further side of the Lacuna Library's central chamber will open up, allowing us to access deeper, more abstruse areas of Apocrypha. Before we push on though, if we look at prying orbs within our inventory, we will see that it is fully titled On Apocrypha, Prying Orbs. It has no known author. It reads, what takes the world enlightened sense can also seek the outward gleam. They rob the all of essence too, report the nothing they have seen. Truly a haunting work, poetically painting all too familiar aspects of old Hermamora. We will need this for later on, so be sure to hang on to it. Now, with three of four key tomes, we must delve deeper into this madness. Zigzagging our way across the latticework webbing, we will soon meet the recently unlocked gateway, funneling us into a shallow tunnel forged from cobbled compendiums and warped writings. Like a parasite, we burrow into the fuliginous flesh of our heterodox host, squirming our way through the mold-gilded sinew of secrets. As the shadowy shaft sweeps incontestably left, a bright, venomous light at the end of the tunnel will come into focus. A zesty zephyr blows on our approach, kicking up a dust devil of detritus damaged pages, torn and lost. As we swap these papers aside, we will see a lattice vista view window, looking out upon the infiniteness of the ostentatious Icarus and Musific mire that is the oozing ocean, but placed purposefully at the centre of it all is a plinth bearing an open black book, with forbidden scripts and alphabets unnaturally skittering and scattering across the stained sallow pages. Touching this black book will transport us to chapter 4 of Waking Dreams of a Starless Sky. We will now find ourselves within a large urban wilderness within this apocryphal pocket, consisting of one single sprawling superstructure, cabalistic in concept and perplexing in design. Or, in short, a consternatiously calamitous clustered castle compiled of complicated, crisscrossed, convoluted and confused congregations of contumaciously craze-carved causeways and chaotically conjuncted corridors, crammed with crooked cloisters and capacious courtyards, coalesced chthonically in cantankerous conception, crepuscular conjuration and complex copacetic construction. A frightful fortress as confusing and unfriendly as that previous colossally circumloquacious sentence. When we first arrive here, we will find ourselves in a ghastly greenhouse of sorts, as trickling tears form nefarious terraces that babble into an oozing, odious and odorous oneroscopic oasis. This is a terrible place filled with tribulations and trickery, so we must be wary. Firstly, we will descend down the cascade of ancient stone steps to our right until we reach the first level of lattice that continues on in the same direction, where at the end of which juts a petite protuberance, at the tip of which rests a pod soaking in the honeyed glow of the lamp post below. Inside of this, we will find an iron mace of draining not particularly useful in either melee or magical mitigation. In here we will also find a copy of the book titled Carwitch Conyinge Letters Volume 1 authored by Carwitch. This is part one of a four-part series known as a quadrilogy. These writings are letters sent between Carwitch and Connie Inge about their search for Azura Star. This can only be found in three other places within the entirety of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim and all of its DLCs, making it quite a rare find. Below this is a copy of a book titled Darkest Days, written by an anonymous author. 
It contains detailed descriptions of various data. In here is also a minor sum of 18 gold pieces. We can also find a copy of the book titled Last King of the Aliens or fully titled The Last King of the Aliens, authored by one Hermenia Sinna. An imperial sorceress you can actually meet within the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion as she resides within the Imperial City. This book of hers chronicles the downfall of the alien empire in the first era, but rather interestingly never actually mentions the last king of the aliens, Laloriaran Dinar. And finally, what pod would be complete without a copy of our favourite series, as here we can find a copy of the book titled The Poison Song, Volume 1, authored by our best mate, Bristin Zell. This is Volume 1 in a divinely sequenced series of seven that delivers a historically inaccurate epic saga in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth, which I'm sure that you are very happy to learn again. Now, from from this pod we shall cast ourselves far and downward across the actually rather aesthete walkway paved throughout the gloomy garden all the way to the lowest well technically second lowest by four steps all the way across the way and over the tar like tarn of iniquitous ink that shines virid like the blood of an unknown and ancient deity on our way over we will run across several seekers who guard their garden and are ready to pummel unwelcome guests with their psychonautic psyche spells of telekinetic and daedric witchcraft so be sure to remain steadfast at all times now when we finalize our sojourn here we will find an altar pushed up against a tremendous stockade of stockpiled tomes and scrolls this slate sheet presents a healthy handful of items. Firstly, there is a few ruined books knocking about, which interestingly we have seen few of within Waking Dreams of a Starless Sky. Hmm. Seems they take better care of their wares in this part of town. There are also three rolls of fresh and bare paper here, ready to be used in the arts of writing. To accommodate this, there is also a small yet rather ornate inkwell filled with unscribed stories yet to be materialized. On this altar, we can also find a copy of the book titled Killing Before You're Killed, authored by one Eduardo Corvus, which unsurprisingly consists of tips on effective combat methods to be used to kill before you are killed. To the right of this is a stack of two tomes, Firstly on top, we can find a copy of the book titled 2920 Volume 11, Sun's Dusk, or fully titled Sun's Dusk Book 11 of 2920, The Last Year of the First Era, authored by Kalavak Townway. This is part 11 of a series of 12 that relates the historical happenings of Vivek and the Empire at the end of the First Era. Beneath it is a copy of the book titled The Anticipations, which has no known author. This is an overview of the members of and the relationships between the Tribunal and the Daedra. Now interestingly, in the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, the item ID for this book is BK for book underscore then Vivek Murders. Strange and something to ponder over as you try to sleep. But even more curiously, this here copy of The Anticipations is the single and only copy of this item in the entirety of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim and all of its DLCs. So this book here is actually a unique item. So be sure to take it and store it somewhere nice and safe. And to the right of this unique item, we can find a copy of the book titled Hawker Attacks authored by one, Eidmir Starcard. Amazingly, this tells the tale of a hawker attack. Now from here, we will continue onward, or at least attempt to, as you'll soon see how difficult such a simple notion is within this hellish convolution of corridors. At the lowest landing of the tiered terrace, we will run across a seeker in front of an opening. We will enter this gaping passage and follow it around as it warps to the left. Soon we will come across a crossroads of sorts. One path leads to the right, and one leads straight ahead. But before we get hoaxed by these hallways, to our left we will see an altar 
with just one item atop it. This is a potion of ultimate healing, which is great and all, but curiously, I do believe this is the single and only potion within all of Apocrypha that rests outside of a container. Sure, we have found many as the result of the famous random leveled loots with pods and vessels and such, but if my memory and investigation serves me and us correctly, this is the only one placed out in the world, or out in the outer world would seem more apt. Now from this altar, we're going to progress forwards through the passage ahead, but as we scurry through, we will notice the walls begin to seem to move too quickly. But before we know what's happening, the back wall will smash into us as we realize that the tunnel is in fact telescopic and is retracting completely, landing us where we were before. So, hmm, okay, we'll take the other aisle. But in a flurry of deja vu, the same hocus pocus hallway magic will trick us once again. Now, defeated and dazed, we will have to retrace our steps and go from whence we came, but we'll notice that the passage has shifted to the left now, creating a new path, funneling us into a new and secret section of the frightful fortress. We will emerge out into this lattice-lined plaza that at first glance does not have much to offer a mere mortal like ourselves, other than a sneaky seeker who skulks in the shadowed corner of the furthest lattice pier. But besides this Daedric Zealot, there is one point of interest in here, and that is a raised area cinched by two long sets of slippery stone steps. Once we mount them on the first landing, our eyes will be drawn to the well-illuminated wall, where a lamp post spills a brilliant and welcoming light onto an altar beneath it. Upon this tabletop is a smattering of seemingly random items. Firstly, there is a collection of ruined books. There is also two rolls of paper just waiting to be turned into scrolls, along with three pieces of charcoal to accommodate with this task. And then on the front right corner of the altar are four scrolls, neatly lined up like they have just been created, especially when paired with the surrounding scribing tools. This is a likely scenario. From left to right, we have a scroll of muffle. Using this will cast said spell, which will allow you to move more quietly for 180 seconds. Next to it, we have a scroll of fury. Using this will cast said spell, making creatures and people up to level four. Pfft, four. Anyway, it will make them attack anything nearby for 30 seconds. Next to this, we have a scroll of oak flesh. Using this will cast said spell, which will improve the caster's armor rating by 20 points for 60 seconds. And finally, next to this, we have a scroll of firebolt. Using this will cast said spell, creating a blast of fire that does 15 points of damage. Targets on fire will take extra damage. But as we inspect this rightermost scroll, we'll notice that plonked unexpectedly on the ground next to the altar is in fact a pod, just begging to be rummaged through. Within this, we will find a copy of the book titled Darkest Darkness, written by an anonymous author. This contains details and descriptions of various Daedra. Below this, we will find yet another flawless diamond, which will bring in that beautiful moolah. We will also find a now completely shadowed sum of gold of 16 pieces. In here is also a copy of the book titled The Last King of the Aliens, or fully titled The Last King of the Aliens, authored by one Herminia Cena. An Imperial Sorceress that, as you know, we can actually meet within the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion as she resides within the Imperial City. This book of hers chronicles the downfall of the Aeliad Empire in the First Era, but doesn't mention the man in the title, the Loriaran Dinar, the last king of the aliens. In here, there's also a potion of plentiful stamina, much needed right about now, as I'm 44,000 words deep into a 50,000 word script, and my throat feels like I've been gargling Daedric daggers. Below this, we will find a copy of the book titled The Apprentice's Assistant, authored by one Aramarel. This is essentially advice from Valenwood's most prestigious spellcaster. Curiously, this can only be found in three other places within the Elder Scrolls V and all of its DLCs, making it a pretty rare thing to find. 
And finally, we can find a copy of the book titled The War of the First Council, authored by one Agrippa Fundilius, an imperial scholar. This text is a brief account shedding light on the first era religious conflict based on various imperial and Dunmer sources, although it has been written for a Western Tamrielic audience. But now we will head up the second set of steps, where against the back wall is a rather curious altar, which holds all the information about the Elder Scroll VI, as there is nothing atop here at all. But directly across from this blank tabletop is a mezzanine of mystical potential, as resting on a plinth at the edge's center, beneath a pleasantly pulsing lamppost is a truly opprobrious opus. This is one of four cryptic key codices of Apocrypha, and is required in unlocking a portal within the Lacuna Library. This is an esoteric tome titled Gnashing Blades, referencing, I would imagine, Hermaeus Mora and his infernal beak of razor fangs for consuming both the material and conceptual. When we take this book, the rightmost wall down below will begin to shift and sway, landing its lethargic moor open and onto the lower levels, creating a new passage for us. Before we push on though, if we look at Gnashing Blades within our inventory, we will see that it is fully titled On Apocrypha Gnashing Blades. It also has no known author. It reads, Bone extrusions gnash and grind in moistened depths of smacking heat while tearing flesh from adverse bone. The body whole prepares to eat. Truly haunting and not a familiar experience thus far and I plan on keeping it that way. Daddy Mora can do many things to me, but being eaten alive is not amongst them. I draw the line there. And we will also need this tome for later on, so be sure to hang on to it. Now we have four of four key terms, so we must march forward. As we wander through this bending hallway, we will see soon what lies ahead, a room that I consider a tomb of tomes, and perhaps our minds. This is a small nookish room with several altars and many, many, many books. In the alcove to the left is a small pond of that accursed ooze. Beware of a tentacle that lives within. Before we get to the mammoth and mundane task of inspecting this cornucopia of collected novels and works, when we walk towards what seems like a dead end, the back wall will propel forward at great speed, stretching from confused bookcase to lanky causeway. We will come this way later, but first we must conquer the study of voluminous volumes. Firstly, we will thoroughly scan through the offshoot cranny and start with the overflowing altar on the left, which houses a very impressive collection of tomes of all shapes, sizes, colors, and from all ages. Firstly, we have a copy of the book titled The House of Troubles, which has no known author. This is a chronicle of the Daedra who decided not to submit to the tribunal. Who could say no to Almalexia? I mean, come on. Next, we will find a copy of the book titled Walking the World, Volume 11, or fully titled Walking the World, Volume 11, Solitude, authored by one Spatior Munius. As the title may have suggested, this book is a comprehensive description of the city of Solitude. Now, despite it being Volume 11 of the Walking World series, there are no other volumes to be found within the Elder Scrolls games, so how many parts there are in this series is actually unknown. Next, we have a copy of the book titled Carwich Coninge Letters, Volume 2, authored by Carwich. This is part two of a four-part series known as a quadrilogy. These writings are letters sent between Carwich and Coninge about their search for Azura's star. This can only be found in three other places within the entirety of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim and all of its DLCs, making this find once again quite a special one. Under this is a copy of the book titled The Hope of the Redoran, authored by one Turiel Nurith. This tells of a tale of a child blessed by a prophecy and the interpretation of such a tale. Beneath this is a copy of the book titled The Life of Uriel Septim the Seventh, or fully titled A Short Life of Uriel Septim the Seventh, authored by one Rufus Hain. This is a short biography of Uriel Septim the Seventh's accomplishments, mainly getting captured constantly and killed. 
On the bottom of this pile, we have a copy of the book titled The Wolf Queen, Volume 2, authored by Wagen Yarth. This particular text is Volume 2 in a series of eight that recounts the life of Queen Potema Septim of Solitude, better known as the Wolf Queen. Behind this is a copy of the book titled The Pig Children, authored by Tiston Bain. This is a rather xenophobically titled discussion on the history of the orcish threat in the Iliac Bay. Interestingly, this is one of a few books within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim that were first introduced in the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall. Next, we will find a copy of the book titled The Song of Pelennal, Volume 3, or fully titled The Song of Pelennal, Volume 3, On His Enemy, which has no known author. So I'll claim it. Yeah, I wrote it. This contains a description of Pelennal Whitestrake's mortal enemy, the half-elf, half-divine demigod, Umarel the Unfeathered. And finally, on this altar, we can find a copy of the book titled Spirit of the Daedra, which has no known author. This provides a look into the Daedric mindset, and this book was first introduced in the Elder Scrolls Legend Battlespire. And look at that, we're a quarter of the way through this inconceivable congregation of tomes. Now we will inspect and flick through the offerings of the altar on the other side of the mundane alcove, atop which is a chromatic collection of tales and recounts. Firstly, we will come across a copy of the book titled The Wolf Queen Volume 5, authored by one of our old chums, Wagen Yarth. This particular text is Volume 5 in a series of eight that recounts the life of Queen Potema Septim of Solitude, better known as the Wolf Queen, as you may have suspected. Underneath it, we can find a copy of the book titled Thirsk, A Revised History, which has no known author within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, but thanks to the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, we know it was written by one Beredit Jastal, who was a Breton bookseller who lived in Thirsk and can actually be encountered within the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind's Bloodmoon expansion. But you already knew that. Anyway, this tome chronicles the Nord Mead Hall of Thirsk and focuses primarily on its chieftains. Besides this, we can find a copy of the book titled The Red Book of Riddles, which has no known author. As the name suggests, it is still a red book and contains some riddles, and some damn awful ones at that. Oh, and look, wedged between it, we can find a copy of the book titled Walking the World, Volume 11, or fully titled Walking the World, Volume 11, Solitude, authored by one Spatio Munius. Walking the world, more like walking in circles, am I right? As you well know, if you were paying attention, this book is a comprehensive description of the City of Solitude. And at the bottom of the stack, we can find a copy of the book titled Antisee Dance of Dwemelor, which has no known author as no one wants to confess to the spelling mistake in the title, as Antisee Dance should be Antisee Dance. Anyway, this is a historical account of the development of Dwemer lore and custom from its roots in High Elf culture, allegedly, as as far as I know, the Dwemer don't actually have any known connection to the Ultima, at least not observable and traceable through history. Now at the top of the next pile, we can find a copy of the book titled Fragment on Arteum, authored by one Tros Il Anselma, who sadly has a name that sounds like a disease. This is a work explaining some of the history of the Sigic island of Arteum, and curiously is one of few books in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim that was first introduced with the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall. Beneath this, we can find a copy of the book titled Opus Cullus Le May Bal, or fully titled Opus Cullus Le May Bal Tar Mesamorite. A brief account of Le May Bal and the Restless Death, authored by one Maybe Awinil, scribe. Translation by University of Gwilym Press, 3rd Era, Year 105. It's worth noting that the author's name is Maybe Awinil, and not it's Maybe authored by Awinil, if you catch my confusing drift. Not my fault they have a weird name. Yeah, let's call our kid Maybe, that won't confuse everyone they ever meet. Anyway, this is a brief account of Le May Bal, the first vampire and the restless death. Below this is a copy of the book titled Songs of the Return, Volume 24, or fully titled Songs of the Return, Volume 24, The First Tale of the Krillop Lock, 
written by an anonymous author. This tells parts of the traditional legend of Yskramor and his 500 companions. And despite being volume 24, there are only 5 volumes found within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, the highest number being volume 56, so who knows how many volumes there actually are in this series. Underneath this we can find a copy of the book titled Shadow Marks, authored by Delvin Mallory, the Breton sneak master of the Thieves Guild who we encounter during the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. This is simply a list of the symbols that the members of the Thieves Guild leave behind for each other, known as Shadow Marks. And finally, on the bottom we will find a copy of the book titled Magic from the Sky authored by one, Olav Jarol, Master Wizard of the Arcane University, who we can actually meet within the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. This is a treatise regarding Aeliad Wells, Welkin Stones and Vala Stones. Umbacano's dream. Now from this alcove we will turn back around and make our way into the main passage, where we have two more altars to inspect. Firstly, the altar on the left bears an assortment of hermetic miscellany. From left to right we will gaze upon three rolls of paper, a strangely common item in this part of Apocrypha, suggesting knowledge isn't just being stored here but created here. Beside these is a scroll of Detect Life. Using this will cast said spell, allowing the Dragonborn to see living creatures through walls. Next to this is a scroll of Fast Healing. Using this will cast said spell, which will heal the caster for 50 points. To the right of this is a greater soul gem that is currently unoccupied, just begging for a tenant which I'm sure we can organise. Then we have two beautiful and well conditioned quills, ready to dance across the surface of plain paper. And finally we have a scroll of fury, using this will cast said spell, which will force creatures and people up to level 4 to attack anything nearby for 30 seconds. So naturally that will find little use here, but will make us furious in its pathetic effect. Now across from this arcane altar is, you guessed it, another altar. Luckily this will be much faster and easier to catalogue. Firstly, the outliers here are two inkwells perched towards the back right hand corner. But laid out in some kind of lazy order are seven books from two different series. The blue books are copies of the Wolf Queen volumes 2, 3, 4, 5 and 7, written all by Wagen Yarth, all of which recount the life of Queen Potema Septim of Solitude, better known as the Wolf Queen, as you may have suspected, and the two apricot toned books are volumes 1 and 3 of the biography of Baron Zaya, both of which are authored by Stern Gamboge, an imperial scribe. Both of these volumes are part of a series that is a factual biography of Queen Baron Zaya, Kalaya's grandmother. But now we have proudly conquered the study of voluminous volumes, and we can now push on deeper into the unknown twisting terrors of this frightful fortress. Once we meet the right angled bend in this long trot, there will be a font of stamina set into a shallow recess. Huddled beneath it is a pod. Within this we can find a copy of the book titled Chronicles of Nachuleft, authored by an anonymous Ultima. This is a historical chronicle of events in the Dwemer Freehold colony of Nachuleft, just on the other side of Nachu Right. <laughs> there is also a petty sum of 21 gold pieces. Beneath this we can find a copy of the spell term Magelight. Reading this will teach us the Magelight spell, which when cast throws a ball of light that lasts for 60 seconds and sticks where it strikes. And finally, oh where would we be without it, a copy of the Poison Song Volume 5, authored by a person with a name none of us will ever forget, Bristin Zell. This is, you will not believe, a Volume 5 in a series of 7 books which are a, I'm sure you can say it along with me at this point, they are a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. 10 points to House Telvanni if you said that word for word. 
From here, we can continue following this long and laborious passage until we see a light at the end of the tunnel as the enclosed causeway terminates and opens out into a moderate playground of par proportions decorated with mucific chartreuse pools and is littered with lattice segments confusingly stretching between stunted stone terraces accessible by steep slate steps fusing into a strange and rather long-winded wind to reach the highest level. Given there is only one way up, we will approach it from such a direction and make our way towards the back wall where the stairs begin. After a few effort-filled steps of our own, we will be met immediately by a seeker, silently shambling in thought, and well, quite frankly, soon to be killed. Just next to this Daedra peon is an altar as we may have come to expect. Presented atop it is a not-so-humble assortment of writings. It would seem the random leveled loot of Apocrypha is having a hard time randomizing, as firstly, we can find a copy of a book we've seen recently titled Hawker Attacks, authored by one Hydemir Starcard. Amazingly, this still tells the tale of a Hawker attack. Next to this is something I have been hoping to find for many years. It is a copy of The Poison Song, Volume 4, authored by someone you've probably never heard of, Bristin Zell. This is part four in a series consisting of seven volumes. That is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. Beneath this is yet another slice of repeating fever dream, as we have a copy of the book titled Shadow Marks, authored by Delvin Mallory. The only thing Delvin around here is us into the depths of an apocryphal madness. This is simply a list of the symbols that members of the Thieves Guild use and leave behind for each other, simply known as Shadow Marks. Next to this, we can find a copy of the book titled The Five Songs of King Wolfharth with no known author. This is a summary of five epic songs of King Wolfharth, plus an additional and rather fittingly apocryphal song of the Tribunal, Dagothur, and Indoral Nerevar. Next in line is a break from the boredom of books for a moment, as we have a filled common soul gem that's going straight into my pocket for later. And finally, on the end, we can find a copy of the book titled Myths of Sheogorath, authored by one Mimophonus. This is a compilation of magical myths about the mad god himself, the Daedric Prince Sheogorath. Now, from this altar, we will progress forward, up the next set of steps where there is actually a seeker lying in wait and cloaked with some form of invisibility spell. Its location, however, is betrayed by the vile haze being emitted from its wretched being. From this landing, we will now wander across the lattice bridge to the other side, where more curling rungs of thigh-screeching stairs will carry us up to the highest platform here, where between two lampposts is a scryer, something we haven't seen for quite some time. Its purpose is unclear currently, but there is one sure way to find out what it does. And that is, of course, to activate it. Upon doing so, we will witness the slender tunnel that brought us here shift like a sluggish serpent in a hibernal state, carving a new way for us to travel even deeper yet into the mysterious acumens of Apocrypha. Now we will hop on down from this top tier and begin our journey through yet another corridor. And while we need to follow this all the way through to see the end of this plane, there is something very special and secret that I must first share. The inner wall of this curved passageway masks a great hidden area. In fact, it is inaccessible. Which, you know, isn't common, that's what walls are for, to keep the players in the bits we're meant to be in. But if we peek on over into the spaces that we are not meant to explore, we will find something very curious indeed. In this weird wedge between barriers is a lagoon that is primarily rippling ooze, but in the corner there is a small spit of lattice, generating a tiny little area where we can stand and where two vessels do stand. 
In total, there are about 10 vessels scattered infrequently throughout Apocrypha, two of which rest right here side by side in a location that cannot be accessed by the player. Well, not through normal gameplay means, of course. Nevertheless, this raises a most curious question. Why? They serve no purpose and seem like a very strange decision for a dev to make. To place two of the most valuable containers in the game next to each other in a place where no one will ever find them. Nor can they find them as you need console commands or some very game-breaking trickery to access them. It is reminiscent of the hidden and inaccessible chests found on some roofs within the Soul Can. Very odd indeed, but most interesting to know nonetheless. Now, considering we went to all that trouble of discovering the undiscoverable, let's bathe in the glory of their random leveled loot. Within the left vessel, we can find a mighty sum of 207 gold pieces, beneath which is a filled common soul gem, along with an unfilled greater soul gem. Also here is a copy of the book titled The Dowry, or fully titled The Dowry, Ancient Tales of the Dwemer Part 10, authored by Marabar Sul. This is part 10 of a seemingly incomplete series, exploring the various theories and histories of the Dwemer. Along with this is two copies of the ever-famous book titled The Poison Song Volume 4, authored by Briston Zell. This is part 4 in a series consisting of 7 volumes, which tells a historically inaccurate saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. Below these we can find a copy of the book titled Thief of Virtue, which has no known author. This is a bawdy tale of a thief's quest for copious coin and the capture of a lady's virtue. Penultimately, we can find a copy of the book titled Trap, which has no known author. This tells of a starving man who steals money for food, but pays a high price for his action. And no, he doesn't pay with a cliff. And ultimately, we can find a pair of elven boots of major stamina, which when worn will increase your stamina majorly or numerically by 40 points. Now, oh, I wonder what glorious loot of the random persuasion we will find in the hidden vessel on the right. Well, firstly, within it is a stash of 113 gold pieces. We also have a copy of the book titled The Life of Uriel Septim the Seventh, or fully titled A Short Life of Uriel Septim the Seventh, authored by one Rufus Hain. This is a short biography of Uriel Septim the Seventh's accomplishments. Below this, we can find a copy of the book titled Natunak's Fire and Faith, which has no known author within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. But thanks to the Elder Scrolls III Morrowinds, we know that this book was written by Natunak, a notable Dwemer believing and teaching Kagranak's theories. This text follows Nuchunak's journey among the Dwemer and his attempts to understand the teachings of Kagranak. Haha, <laughs> good luck with that one, buddy. In here, we will also find a scroll of Call to Arms, which, come to think of it, will go quite nicely with my scroll of Call to Legs. Anyway, using this will cast the spell of the same name, Call to Arms, which improves the target's combat skills, health, and stamina for 10 minutes. It's actually pretty good. Well, that is to be expected after all, as it is a master level illusion spell. Also interesting to note that this scroll can only be found in one other place in the game, that being Fort Sunguard. Along with this, we can find a lesser soul gem that sadly, much like my Beerstein, is not currently filled. Beneath this, we can find a copy of the book titled The Old Ways, or fully titled, and it is one full title, The Old Ways, The Customs and Philosophy of Grave and Faithful Counsel authored by Lawmaster Solaris of the Sigic Order, who you can actually meet in the Elder Scrolls Online. Also, weirdly, this book has two title pages. Anyway, it is essentially a guide to the Sigic Order and their beliefs. Interesting to note, too, that this was first introduced in the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall. Oh, and I thought this vessel couldn't get any more interesting, but here we have a copy of the book titled The Poison Song Volume 6, 
authored by some ancient hero named Bristin Zell. Amazingly, this is part six in a series consisting of seven that tells a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. Also in here, we can find a copy of the book titled The Wolf Queen, Volume 6, authored by Wagen Yarth. This particular text is Volume 6 in a series of eight that recounts the life of Queen Potema Septim of Solitude, better known as the Wolf Queen, as you may have suspected. Who knew? And finally in here, we will find an elven helmet. All in all, a very curious and secluded secret that I'm happy to have discovered and been able to share with you. Things like this I love and they always make me wonder what other curious secrets are hidden away within the Elder Scrolls games. In fact, I enjoy it so much, it's literally my job. But for now, we must return to the Traversal Track and continue with our seemingly ceaseless mission in exploring, curating, and documenting Apocrypha. So, as before, we will follow this aisle where it will soon begin ascending upwards. Once it levels out, we will see to our left that there is a partitioning wall comprised of latticework sheets, allowing us to glimpse into the next stage of our pursuit. And while our imaginations wander for a brief moment, before our vivid visions can get too carried away, we will meet the end of this arcade and turn right out into the Twin Totem Arena. A most impressive sight to be sure, the paved quadrangle is of average aptitude. However, the unknown and most esoterically esoteric construct that stands mighty at its center is undoubtedly one of the most curious monuments that we have come across. Sharp and jagged, simple arms of unpolished soapstone stretch and meet in the air, like two fossilized pincers of Hermaeus Mora, reaching and grasping an infernal mechanism of outstanding sorcerous magnificence. While, even at first glance, the glued and mirrored tentacled totems that protrude heaven-bound and hell-driven is most fantastic to witness, there is an undeniable air of greater significance. This ithyphallic obelisk of ostentatiously octopean origination hums in a warm resonance with a raw energy specifically unfamiliar to our mortal understandings. The lower spire points down at a pond of ooze while the upper spire points to the skies, to he who sits above. As a whole, it has striking similarity to an hourglass in some strange way, or perhaps some other crude hermetic device. I suspect that this is much more than an interesting design feature, and instead a receptacle a mechanism of some ununderstandable magical mechanics, undoubtedly aiding Hermaeus Mora in his endless reaping harvest of all knowledge. But we haven't time to ponder the incomprehensible. As we move closer to this twin totem obelisk, from the previously placid pool of Ica will burst forth the most menacing of Daedric servants, a lurker vindicator, a truly challenging foe, but one we are fit to defeat in glorious combat. And now we have a chance to more closely inspect the arena. We will notice a locked gateway and soon be drawn to the left of it, where there appears to be more curious points of interest. Pressed up against a lattice wall is a scryer, but ever so curiously leading up to it, there is a trail of three books sprinkled on the ground like breadcrumbs to draw us into the scryer. First in line is a copy of the book titled Thirsk, A Revised History, which has no known author within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, but thanks to the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, we know it was written by one, Beredit Jastal, who was a Breton bookseller who lived in Thirsk and can actually be encountered within the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind's Bloodborne expansion, but you already knew that. Anyway, this tome chronicles the Nord Mead Hall of Thirsk and focuses primarily on its chieftains. And I wish it would get updated because the current chieftain is a reekling. Secondly, in a pile of toxic paper, we have a copy of The Poison Song, Volume 3. Say it with me. Authored by Bristin Zell. Amazingly, this is part three in a series consisting of seven volumes that is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. And thirdly and finally, we have a copy of the book titled 
the five far stars, which has no known author within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. But thanks to the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, we know that this book was written by Joshishi Musmanul. This is a volume of Ashlander poetry verses collected from wise women of the Urshilaku Ashlanders. Now this leads us like a duck to a pond, or like a nosy mortal to a scryer, and when we activate it, we will witness the gate sealing away the cloister in front of us swing open. We can now trudge down to the end of the prolonged portico and make our way inside to rifle through the concealed cache within. As we near the illuminated end room, we will notice that there is yet another scryer just to the right of the opening. If we are ever so curious as to touch it, it will close away but the pernicious portcullis at the back of the courtyard will unlock and allow us to migrate towards the completion of our quest. But first, the little closet that we've come here to raid, within which is actually an unexpected reserve of goods as firstly on the floor in the back is actually a vessel, as we know a very rare and prestigious coffer, holding bountiful and the most valuable melange of random leveled loot. Within it we may find an elven warhammer of dread, which to be honest lives up to its namesake as its enchantment is dreadful, but that price tag ain't. But much like speaking to Hermaeus Mora, that weight is massive. Below this we have a dragon scale helmet with no enchantment, but it is a blank slate that we can build upon, and also has a fairly nice value of 750. In here we can also find a copy of the book titled 16 Accords of Madness Volume 12, which has no known author, and while this is Volume 12, there are only three known volumes in total. But I would imagine that there are 15 volumes that exist within the unwritten lore, as these are part of a series which recount the meetings between Sheogorath and the other Daedric Princes, of which there are 16, Sheogorath being one of them, means that there is 15 others to meet. 16 if you count Jigalag, but Jigalag is also the same thing as Sheogorath, but let's not get into the weirdness now. This particular volume is 12, and is in regards to Malakath's tale. This book was also first introduced in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion's DLC, The Shivering Isles. And this is a very rare book, as the only other location that this can be found within the Elder Scrolls V and all of its DLCs is within Castle Volkia. Below this, we can find a copy of the book titled A Dance in Fire, Volume 5, authored by one very prestigious Wagen Yath a notable Breton writer having 25 publications under his very cluttered belt. This particular entry retells a clerk's adventures through Valenwood, home of the Bosma, the Wood Elves, and is of course volume 5 of a seven part series known as a Heptology, and that's Heptology and not Heptology, Heptology, not Heptology. Just so you know, if you ever use that word, which you never will. Anyway, in here is also a rather mediocre sum of 80 gold pieces. We can also find an empty black soul gem, which I'll gladly use on myself at this point, just as a quick way to the soul can and, you know, change of scenery. Along with these is a copy of the book titled The Apprentice's Assistant, authored by one, Aramarel. This is essentially advice from Valenwood's most prestigious spellcaster. In here is also a copy of the book titled The Cabin in the Woods, or fully titled The Cabin in the Woods, Volume 2, authored by one, Mogan, son of Molag. This is a tale of a soldier and a sobbing ghost and appears to be a sequel to the book The Woodcutter's Wife, as it is similar in theme and written by the same author, and The Woodcutter's Wife is also called Volume 1 and The Cabin in the Woods is Volume 2. So once again, wrap your head around that and once again, you do the maths there. And finally, at the bottom, we can find a copper and moonstone circlet, which bears no enchantment. Now, before we leave this little room, pushed up against the side wall is an altar, littered with various bits and pieces. From left to right, we can find a filled petty soul gem, next to which is a scroll of frost thrall. Using this, we'll cast said spell, which will summon a frost atronarch permanently to fight alongside the dragonborn. Interestingly, this is the only place in the entire game that this scroll can be found, making it a uniquely unique find. Next to this scroll are linen wraps, which are a 
fairly uninteresting item, but rather curiously within the context of Apocrypha, this is the only place within all of Apocrypha where we can find linen wraps. So that's something. To the right of these is a lesser soul gem, which is currently unfilled. And right at the end of the table is a scroll of mage light. Using this will cast said spell, which will cast a ball of light that lasts for 60 seconds and sticks to wherever it strikes. Also important to note that if your character's conjuration skill is level 40 or higher, unlike my character, a copy of the spell tome Conjure Seeker will also be found here. Using this will teach you the appropriate spell which will allow you to summon a seeker to fight for 60 seconds. It's also important to note that this spell is not affected by the Twin Souls perk. Nonetheless, a welcoming addition to your magical arsenal. And now that we have plundered this cache, we will move across the Twin Totem Arena and onward through the gateway which we unlocked minutes ago, where we will face a leg-shattering flight of stairs that narrow as they rise, funneling us up and up into a secluded nook where it will flatten out and we'll spy a lattice view window with a font of magicka lighting the small snuggery where resting open and primed for teleportation is an open black book touching this will take us to chapter 5 of waking dreams of a starless sky once we arrive here, we'll find ourselves in yet another gaunt and tome-littered passage. Immediately, it will take us left, and after a short journey through the collapsing corridor, we will see a great sight awaiting us, as we will emerge back into the highest lofts of the Lacuna Library, a vivacious and most intimidatingly impressive vault, with a great central tentacle totem at its center, above which is a tornado of forbidden pages cyclonically raging through the heavy buzzing air. Interestingly, these pages are actually massive and seem to grow in size the higher and closer to Hermaeus Mora who sits above they get. As we can see here when compared to the Dragonborn, these lost papers are several times the height of a normally proportioned mortal. A very curious oddity indeed, and one whose meaning I am unsure of. But back down below is a circular gangway clinging to the inner edge of the colossal colosseum of kvetching clandestine codices. Crafted with mathematical precision are four lattice bridges that congregate at the heart which houses and holds the auspiciously astral tentacle totem. At the base of which is a single plinth bearing nothing at all, yet its purpose and positioning is far too intentional and ominous to merely disregard. God. Once again with a suspiciously perfect planning, there are four more plinths of a unique and mystical essence planted 90 degrees apart from a circular perspective. They face inwards towards that nefarious nexus erected in the eye of this esoteric edifice, appearing to be metaphorical cogs in a greater malefic mechanism. Blazon on these four plinths are unnaturally pulsing effigies. Firstly is what appears to be an eye, second is what appears to be a mass of tentacles, thirdly is what appears to be a pair of pinching pincers, and fourthly is what appears to be a gaping maw filled with jagged fangs. A perplexing puzzle that we shall return to shortly, but before we step into the hands of fate, we will take this lacuna loft for everything it is worth. We must be wary, however, as hordes of seekers hover and linger on these thin and precarious upper reaches. One wrong step and we will plummet down to a rather untimely death. We will soon notice that planted around the northern edge against the inner wall are three pods. Firstly, the first pod. Within it we can find a sum of 14 gold pieces, along with a copy of the book titled Herbane's Bestiary, Ice Wraiths, or fully titled Herbane's Bestiary, The Ice Wraiths, authored by one adventurer named Herbane. Unsurprisingly, this is an all-you-need-to-know guide about Ice Wraiths, aimed to better educate 
educate other adventurers and curious zoologists. Below this is a potion of vigorous magicka. In here we can also find a book that we now have every single copy in existence of, The Poison Song, Volume 3, authored by Briston Zell. If you are unfamiliar with it, this is part three in a series consisting of seven volumes that is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. And finally is a copy of the book titled The Whisper Mother, or fully titled The Whisper Mother, two theories authored by one Matthias Atin. This text essentially explores the various legends regarding the Wisp Mothers. Secondly, within the second pod, we can find a copy of the book titled Argonian Account Book 4, or fully titled The Argonian Account Book 4, authored by Wagen Yarth. This is Volume 4 in a series of four following Decimus Scotty's continued adventures in Black Marsh. Also in here, we can find a copy of the book titled Confessions of a Dunmar Skooma Eater, with no declared author within The Elder Scrolls V. However, in The Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, it is known to be authored by one Tilsey Senders. This is a narrative recount of a cured skooma addict. We will now come across a petty sum of 12 god pieces. Beneath this is a copy of the book titled Magic from the Sky, authored by one Urlav Jaral. Master Wizard of the Arcane University, who we can actually meet within the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. This is a treatise regarding Aeliad Wells, Welkenstones, and Vala Stones. Also in here is a copy of the book titled The Chunax, Fire and Faith, which has no known author within the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. But once again, thanks to the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, we know this book to be written by Nechunak, a notable Dwemer believing and teaching Kagranak's theories. This text follows Nechunak's journey among the Dwemer and his attempts to understand the teachings of Kagranak. In here, we also have a potion of ultimate healing, along with a greater soul gem, which at this time is currently unfilled. And finally, at the bottom, we have an Adept Robes of Destruction, which has a very lovely price tag of 1,700 gold. And thirdly, we have the third pod, within which we can find a steel war axe, something that I wouldn't steal even if it was stealing, along with 13 gold pieces, beneath which is a copy of the spell tome Oak Flesh. Reading this will teach one the alteration spell of the same name, which will improve the caster's armor rating by 40 points for 60 seconds the most basic of mage armor spells. Oh, and look here, a beautiful and never before seen copy of a book titled The Poison Song, Volume 4, authored by Briston Zell. This is part four in a series that is a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth, which is actually something not many people know. And at the bottom of the barrel or pod, we can find a copy of the book titled The Real Baron Zaya, Volume 2, which has an anonymous author, but we know in lore that it was written by one Plinitius Mero, an imperial savant who we can actually encounter within the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind's expansion Tribunal. Now this book is part two in a series of five, which in the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall was originally a ten book series but has been condensed to five in later games. This is an unauthorized biography of the famous queen mother of Morrowind, Baron Zaya. Again, and still, Kalaya's grandmother. But now we will turn our attention back to those infernal plinths that stink of prophecy. Firstly, the one with the eye. When we activate it, an option will appear in which we choose one of our four key tomes that we have collected in Waking Dreams of a Starless Sky. It would seem we have to match the symbol on the plinth with the appropriate book. So, on this eye plinth, we must place the book Prying Orbs. On the plinth blazon bashfully with a writhing mass of tentacles, we must place the book Boneless Limbs. Then, on the plinth marked with a pair of pinching claws, we must place the book Delving Pincers. And finally, on the plinth with the fang-bearing jaw on it, 
we must place the book Gnashing Blades. As soon as we correctly align all four books onto their designated plinths, upon the central plinth will be instantly conjured an open black book. It would seem that we have successfully unlocked and summoned a secret and final chapter of the apocryphal realm waking dreams of a starless sky. Now it is time to complete our mission here. We must march with certainty and face this wicked work. Placing our hands upon it, we will be teleported to an unknown and unreachable locale. Still alive and breathing, we will arrive standing upon a brilliantly lit shrine in what appears to be a chapel of swords. With the now all too familiar cracked stonework architecture and walls of piled papers, there are two passages that lead to the same place. So if we take the path to the right, we will turn into a dark corner where there will be an altar wedged into the angle in which the walls meet. Atop this we will find a now quotidian array of items. On the left we can find a scroll of stone flesh. Using this we'll cast the spell of the same name which will improve the caster's armor rating by 60 points for 60 seconds. Next to this is a quill suggesting that these scrolls have recently been written. To the right of this is a filled greater soul gem, which can also be used for shredding cheese. You know, it's always handy to have a greater. Next to this, we have a scroll of grand healing. Using this, we'll cast that very spell, which will heal everyone close to the caster for 100 points. And finally, on the far right edge, we can find a copy of the Destruction skill book titled The Art of War Magic, authored by one Zirin Arctus, Imperial Battle Mage and Grand Vizier of the Septim Empire with commentary by other learned masters. Interestingly, Zirin Arctus is possibly one of the mortals behind the god Talos, depending on what you want to believe and how you interpret certain events and tales. This book covers the mastering of the art of winning war. Naturally, reading this will increase your destruction skill by one point, provided that you have not read it before, of course. Now, from this altar, we will head across the small room, where we will find a pod resting on the floor, underneath an unlit font on the wall. This is our final encounter with random leveled loot, so it is a bitter sweet moment. Inside this pod we can find a gem which, much like the Thieves Guild member, is a flawless sapphire. In here we can also find a measly sum of 21 gold pieces. <laughs> classic. In here is also a copy of the book titled Great Harbingers, or fully titled Great Harbingers The Companions, authored by one Swick the Long-Sighted. This book tells of some of the leaders of the Companions, but we're not in there. Along with this we can find a common soul gem filled with nothing other than a common soul. There is also a greater soul gem that is currently unoccupied. We also have a copy of the book titled The Dragon War, authored by one Torhol Bjorik. This is a religious text that describes the primordial war between men and dragons during the Morethic era. And oh, for the very last time, we have here a copy of the ever famous and ever reappearing, our good friend that followed us all the way through Apocrypha, The Poison Song Volume 7 authored by the mighty Briston Zell. I think at this point, I should confess to you something about these books that I've kept to myself, and that is that this series, if I'm being honest, you know, these Poison Song books are in fact a, uh, a historically inaccurate epic saga set in the aftermath of the war with the Dwemer and House Dagoth. I really hope you appreciate that, that piece of heart to heart there. Below this we can find a copy of the book titled The Posting of the Hunt, which has no known author. This is a document announcing a ritualistic hunting of a mortal by Daedra. And our final piece of random level loot for Apocrypha is a weak aversion to frost, which seems unfitting, but such is the nipple twisting gamble of random level loot. 
And now that we are done with this homely cloister, we may push forward and walk up the central ramped hallway and out into a squabber square at the cusp of oblivion. As we wander on out bravely into the untouched deeps of this hellscape, the small oozing puddle at the center will ripple and from which will burst a lurker vindicator, a welcoming party to be expected in such a sacred, concealed corner of Apocrypha. Joining it are two seekers guarding an unknown and unseen monument of unfamiliar motif. So be prepared to fight these foul Daedric spawn and smite them back to oblivion. Well, not to oblivion as we're already here. Just, you know, smash them somewhere else. I don't know, Aetherius, the Void, something like that. Eh, you know what, let's send them to League. Yeah, that'll teach them a lesson. Once that is done, we may inspect this most fantastic and diabolic semi-cylindrical shrine of chthonic cacographical dialect carved with cabalistic calligraphy. This here, my friends, is actually a word wall formed of a super scroll that is many times larger than even the Elder Scrolls themselves. At the center, we will see the transition of dancing divine script to the much simpler and crude runes of Dovazul, the dragon tongue. From this, we will learn the final word of the dragon aspect shout, that being div, as a whole, mal quadiv. Interestingly, this Dovazul on the wall translates to this stone commemorates Great Mirak, dragon priest of great wisdom, servant of the worm, and enemy of mankind. A lovely piece of knowledge to take away from Apocrypha and given to us from such a cool and unique word wall. Forged and designed, written even in a way that we know exactly who made it, Homeus Mora. But from this scroll word wall, the tides of your own fate will need to breach these shores. From here, on your own journey, you will mount a dragon and soar through the skies over littered atolls, and swoop upwards to the most colossal column of Apocrypha, a super tower known as the Summit of Apocrypha. In truth, this is a throne and arena. The usual suspects of Apocrypha linger here, but also here waits Mirak, the first dragonborn, champion of Hermaeus Mora. And this, my friends, is where the curious curiosities of Apocrypha sees and your own personal prophecy takes place. It is now up to you to decide the fate of Tamriel in a battle that shall be sung about in the coming ages. And with this final professorial paragraph that you must write, we have now fully explored and curated the curious curiosities of the Plane of Oblivion Apocrypha. I do hope that you have enjoyed this utterly unique area with its mundane maunderings and arcane grandiloquence, where many obscure and unexplainable oddities lay in wait for the keen-eyed explorer to discover and ponder. So whether they were new finds or old friends, I do hope that you have enjoyed the curious curiosities of Apocrypha. Thank you very much for watching. I have been Camel, and I do hope you thoroughly enjoyed this epic episode of Curating Curious Curiosities for the esoteric and abstruse plane of oblivion Apocrypha. If you did enjoy this video and you would like to see more of these types of videos, please consider subscribing. It helps me know people are interested in this kind of content and will result in more of it in the long run. And if you do enjoy these Curating Curious Curiosities videos, please feel free to check out the links in the description. These, of course, will lead you directly to the Curating Curious Curiosities videos that I have already done for Skyrim. And in future, who knows, maybe some other games. If you did learn something new in this video, please leave a like, I'd appreciate that greatly. And if you have any theories, backstories, imaginings, or explanations for any or all of these Curious Curiosities, please leave a detailed explanation of what your thoughts are in the form of a comment down below. I am very interested in hearing your thoughts and conclusions for some of these ever so strange and curious finds, 
with an Apocrypha. The community's collective mind power will be much greater than my own, I hope. So hopefully together we can come up with all of the backstories for these curious curiosities and weird goings-ons. Now down there in the description you can also find links to all of my social media, be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter, along with of course my brand new and aforementioned merch store with a ton of widely ranged pieces. And if you would like to become one of my heroic patrons or sponsor the channel right here on YouTube, you can of course sponsor what I do that way. As I'm sure you know, all of my time and energy goes into making these videos that I create for you to enjoy, so your support is most genuinely appreciated and welcomed in any and all forms. So thank you very much for watching, thank you very much for supporting the channel, I've been Camel, and I will see you shortly in the next video. I'll see you there soon.